Initial evaluation of a patient starts with a proper history and physical examination to assess various risk factors for malignancies, medical renal disease, gynecological and non-malignant genitourinary causes. Especially like the blood pressure measurement is important. Many a times the clinician miss, misses the measurement of the blood pressure that actually in many patients may lead to the diagnosis of microscopic hematuria because of medical renal disease like IgA nephropathy or nephritis. As well as the examination of external genitalia, especially in female centroitus and periurethral tissue uh, is important because uh, many times it may lead to the diagnosis of the exact cause of microscopic hematuria and that may obviate the need of exhaustive uh, evaluation uh, for uh, a small thing. So, to start with malignancy, there are various uh, risk factors which have been laid down by the AU and told uh, the primary risk factors for the development of malignancy or finding a malignancy in a patient with microscopic hematuria is advanced age, male gender, smoking history, uh, degree of hematuria especially in the range of 10 or more than 10 RBCs per high power field, persistent of hematuria and history of gross hematuria. Apart from that, irritative lower urinary tract symptoms, prior pelvic radiation therapy or cyclophosphamide therapy, occupational exposure and chronic indelling foreign body in the urinary tract, they add on to the risk factor for the development of malignancy. And apart from them, many genetic uh, syndromes like von Apel lindau syndrome, burdock dupe, they also increase the chances of uh, the diagnosis of malignancy. Now one important thing to mention is that if a patient comes to you with a history of anticoagulation of antiplatelets, the patient should be evaluated for malignancy risk assessment as the patient is evaluated who is not on anticoagulant or antiplatelets because it is a common mistake patient comes to you that with the anticoagulation history and we don't go for any further evaluation and we miss significant amount of patient of malignancy, especially the bladder cancers. Because the risk of malignancy is same for all. So, coming on to the uh, importance of the physical examination, measurement of the blood pressure, a patient with the medical renal disease, with, it is found on a microscopic uh, examination with proteinuria, dysmorphic RBCs, cellular cast and renal insufficiency, a proper nephrology evaluation should be done and simultaneously risk-based urological evaluation should be done in all patients who even who are detected with medical renal disease. The so risk stratification, the second part of my presentation is risk stratification. So AVA has classified or categorized the patient in three major categories that is low, intermediate and high based on age of the presentation, smoking history, uh, number of RBCs per high power field on a single urinary analysis and additional risk factors. So based on these, the patients have been uh, categorized on uh, based on this uh, table in low, intermediate and high risk groups and it is found that patients with the low risk, uh, they have the chances of development of malignancy in less than 1% and intermediate risk group and high risk group uh, with a range of 1-2% to and more than 10% respectively. So it is quite clear that risk stratification allows us to differentiate uh, the patients who need to undergo exhaustive evaluation or not. So to start with, in, uh, how to evaluate the urinary tract evaluation in low-risk patient? So that the likelihood of diagnosing a malignancy in low-risk patient is quite low, less than 1%. So there are options between urinary analysis, follow-up urinary analysis versus cystoscopy and renal ultrasound. It is uh, recommended that the, the, way sh uh, the it should be balanced between a low diagnostic yield versus invasiveness discomfort, anxiety and risk of UTI and cost associated with cystoscopy and false positive detection with the ultrasound. So it should be weighed. So AUA panel has recommended a repeat urinary analysis after 6 months in a patient with low risk group to avoid unnecessary evaluation. When we uh, come to a patient that was initially low risk but uh, on repeat urinary analysis the uh, patient presents with hematuria. It is recommended that patient should be reclassified uh, as intermediate and high risk group and the patient should be evaluated with the cystoscopy or, or upper tract imaging in that as per the that as per that category so coming on to the intermediate risk group patient 
cystoscopy is uh, should be done as per the uh, consensus consensus statement because cystoscopy is 98% sensitive in CAUV and the most frequent cancer found is uh, bladder cancer. Uh, renal ultrasound is quite sensitive as compared to the axial imaging. Coming on to the high risk patient, cystoscopy and axial uh, upper tract imaging in form of multiphasic CT uh, urogram is uh, mandatory and if the patient is uh, allergic, MR urogram can be done or retrograde pyelogram, pyelogram can be done. There are two special categories like persistent or recurrent microscopic hematuria with prior evaluation on renal ultrasound, the patient may undergo uh, axial imaging. But a patient with a microscopic hematuria with a family history of RCC or any known genetic renal syndrome, patient should undergo upper tract imaging without uh, irrespective of risk category. A brief uh, count on cystoscopy, white light cystoscopy is recommended. Blue light cystoscopy has a no role, current, uh, currently has no role and its role is, it, it is uncertain. Urinary biomarkers will be covered by Dr. Vijay in, in, an, in brief. It should not be used in the initial evaluation except for the patient who are having negative workup with irritative lower urinary symptom with a high risk of carcinoma in C2. So follow up I have already told. This is a this is algorithm suggested by the AUA panel. Uh, that is the crux of uh, the presentation. This is these are the various selected guidelines, American, Canadian. So the uh, most of the my, most of my part is taken from the American Urology Association, and these are the references I would like to quote. And my presentation would never be complete without acknowledging my alma mater, Savai Mansing Medical College, followed by AIM Jodhpur, and now my present institution, that is the TMH Varanasi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Himanshu. Just one question. Uh, what do you think is the role uh, of uh, uh, evaluating urine routine microscopy for screening purposes? Uh, Sir, actually the, for screening purposes, uh, microscopy app per se is not uh, recommended and in fact, AUA itself says uh, it, it actually needs to be validated uh, again in further studies. So, uh, per se, ma microscopy for screening purposes is not indicated. Whenever a patient comes to you with a symptom or somehow patient have de uh, been detected having a microscopic hematuria, that patient needs to be stratified and needs to be evaluated. For screening purposes, in an asymptomatic patient, uh, means just keep patient aata hai and patient is asymptomatic and we go for a urinary analysis to detect whether he is having a microscopic hematuria is or not is not recommended presently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll uh, proceed with the next talk uh, by Dr. Vijay Madhuri. He is another person who is... Uh, uh, I would say still a native from this place only. Uh, and he is going to present on uh, the urinary cytology and uh, role of urinary biomarkers. Very good morning to all of you, the chairpersons, the organizing team, especially Dr. Gautam and Dr. Sandhu sir, and NSUSI uh, council. Uh, it's very pleasant to be back again where I worked and I see many familiar faces. <laughs> Uh, so my topic uh, is uh, urinary cytology, urinary biomarkers, current role and uh, I'll be mainly concentrating on the test characteristics uh, so that uh, the role may be understood better and not necessarily go into too much details about how the test is going to be performed as such. So <clears throat> the urothelial cancer is unique in the sense that uh, the fluid that is urine is in contact with the urothelial tissue and hence it can be tested for the presence of malignant cells or their cellular products. So this is unlike any other cancer where a uh, easily obtainable uh, body sample uh, can be evaluated rapidly. Uh, again, it's non-invasive, easy collection and uh, there is definitely a role in prognosis and management, but how far and how important uh, that I'm going to uh, discuss. First, coming on to the urine cytology, which is the most important test uh, which can be performed in urine. Uh, basically, it is uh, detecting the exfoliated tumor cells in uh, urine using their uh, microscopic characteristics which differentiate them from the normal cells. The sensitivity is 48% and the specificity is 86%. So, what this means is that it, the test has got a good uh, uh, negative predictive value. And uh, the drawbacks are 
that it's a very poor sensitivity for detecting low grade urothelial carcinoma the sensitivity of 48% basically applies to high grade uh, urothelial carcinoma or cis and plus there is a lot of interobserver variation in places where there is not a regular uh, uropathology uh, division so many uh, uh, positives can be missed and false negatives may be obtained now uh, going on to the markers biomarkers as such the first one is the bta stat and the bta track so BTA is actually bladder tumor antigen and uh, the STAT is uh, so named because it's a bedside test, uh, a qualitative test which can be performed rapidly and then uh, this is the track which is quantitative. So they detect basically human complement factor H related proteins and the sensitivity now you will see in almost all biomarkers the sensitivity is now better than the cytology. Uh, the STAT has a sensitivity of 57 to 83 percent and the track has uh, even better that is 73 to 77 percent because of quantitation uh, but then it means a reciprocal uh, decrease in the specificity which means uh, you will get uh, quite a few false positives. <coughs> So the main role of BTA strat and BTA track is in uh, surveillance. Uh, like I said, it's more sensitive in cytology. Then the NMP22 kit and the bladder check. So this is a nuclear matrix protein number 22 which is detected. And uh, this is again present in higher uh, uh, concentration in uh, urothelial cancer. The kit is uh, recommended for uh, surveillance and the bladder check uh, can be used even as an initial uh, diagnostic tool. Uh, the sensitivity of the uh, quit uh, is uh, almost uh, similar to cytology that is 52 to 59 percent. The check has a slightly better sensitivity and again the specificity since the sensitivity is not that good specificity rises highly. Uh, the kit is 87 percent specific and the check uh, is 70 to 83 percent specific. So uh, as compared to cytology this may be uh, better in detecting low grade uh, urothelial carcinomas. Uh, but again low specificity is a problem uh, then the immunocyte or the eucyte plus so this is a combination of cytology with immunohistochemical uh, staining so it uh, detects CEA and uh, two types of mucins and that is the LDQ10 and M344 the sensitivity is quite high 67 to 100 percent in uh, some uh, cohorts specificity reciprocally decreases a little 62 to 84 percent and uh, the disadvantage is that it needs a specialized lab equipment and again because of high sensitivity false positives are high. Then the Eurovision. Uh, Eurovision is an important test. Uh, uh, it's also recommended in UA guidelines. I'll discuss it uh, in more detail slightly later. It uses uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization to detect anucleidy of uh, 3717 chromosomes, 9p21 locus and loss of uh, p16 locus. The sensitivity is 57 to 84 percent and the specificity is uh, reaching up to 92 percent. So again uh, the same uh, problems, costly equipment is needed and high false positives due to high sensitivity. Then ADS bladder, uh, this detects the MCM5 gene using ELISA and uh, these are the test characteristics. And uh, <coughs> the advantage of ADS bladder is that it is not influenced by uh, benign conditions. Then the UBC rapid and the UBC ELISA kit. This is a uh, point of care ELISA test which detects uh, cytoproteins, cytokeratin 8 and 18, and the sensitivity is approaching 75% and the specificity is uh, 82 to 93.8%. Uh, the advantage, or rather the disadvantage, is that uh, it uh, mainly detects high grade uh, urothelial carcinoma because this uh, cytokeratins are more associated with high grade variants. Then uh, these all tests uh, are detecting either uh, the tests which I discussed, uh, cytoproteins or different gene mutations and deletions. Uh, now there are some gene amplification tests, DNA amplification, RNA amplification tests. So DNA based tests are the two, Euromonitor and Euroseq. So Euromonitor is a real time PCR to detect TRTP and FGFR3 mutations. The sensitivity is 100%, highly sensitive but specificity is 83% and it is independent of inflammation or benign diseases. The Euroseq is again a DNA test and it detects 11 genes. This is the uh, test of genes uh, which are performed. The sensitivity uh, now decreases a little bit as compared to Euromonitor. Uh, it's 74 to 96% and the specificity is 88%.
Hence, there are some mRNA based assays that is a CX bladder assay and expert VC monitor. So the CX bladder assay is an mRNA assay which detects uh, these uh, mRNAs related to these genes, these five genes and the sensitivity is 82% and the uh, specificity is uh, currently um, uh, correspondingly lower. Expert BC monitor is an mRNA test which uh, again detects the gene products of these uh, genes, mRNA related to these genes and the sensitivity is 73% and the specificity is uh, 91%. And then there are uh, epigenetic tests also, DNA and mRNA tests I have discussed, then there are epigenetic tests, that is they detect uh, DNA methylation or histone acetylation. So uh, DNA methylation is a way to, uh, by the body to silence or repress the genes and uh, this is detected by these tests. Uh, first is the epi check uh, and it targets 15 altered DNA methylation biomarkers. Uh, and it's mainly used, uh, the role is to identify recurrence in cases of NMIBC, that is the main role is in uh, surveillance. <clears throat> then uh, there is a probability algorithm called EPI-score, uh, which is uh, uh, available along with this EPI-check test, which tells us the probability of recurrence of NMIBC. Sensitivity is 68% and the specificity is 88%. Then there is the BC Euro mark. Uh, which has a high sensitivity of 98% and a specificity of 97%. Then there is this Assure MDX uh, which uh, detects the methylation of these genes. The sensitivity is 93%, specificity is 83%. Then there are TACMAN arrays uh, which detect uh, genes, various genes, 12 plus 2 gene set panel is uh, detected. Sensitivity is 98 and specificity is 99%. There are some investigational, I'll just uh, go in brief. Uh, biomarkers which are on the horizon but have not yet been uh, fully validated. The CIFRA 121 detects the proteolytic region of cytokeratin. It's a generalized marker like LDH. So this uh, cytokeratin uh, proteolytic uh, uh, fragment is found in serum plus broad fluids like urine. So the sensitivity is 70% and the sensitive uh, uh, specificity is 86%. Then there is this uh, BLCA4 mutation which detects only the early stages of bladder cancer and then the SFAS. SFAS is an anti-apoptotic protein which prevents the apoptosis of uh, cancer cells and the concentration in urine can be measured as a biomarker. It's associated with increasing tumor growth. And then the hyaluronic acid which is involved in cell addition and proliferation. Uh, again, uh, the levels are increased in uh, urothelial CA. The sensitivity is approaching 100%, specificity is 98%. Okay. Then there are uh, uh, telomeres, uh, the uh, telomeres have a protective role in cancer cell chromosomes and confer sort of uh, immortality. Mm. Uh, the end products of these uh, genes uh, can be detected and uh, the sensitivity is 87%, and specificity is uh, around 90%. This bladder tumor fibronectin is another uh, new test and then the IGF-2 and the mage. So I will just go into the role, there are quite a few other uh, uh, new tests also. The limitations of all these uh, biomarkers are that uh, they are time dependent, degradation happens during storage. So there is a very strict manufacturer specific uh, conditions and uh, containers uh, which have to be used. Then there is a lot of uh, turnaround processing time, then specialized detecting tools, they are quite uh, uh, expensive uh, to process and there is a rate of high false positives. So the current status, so what is the current status now? Uh, whether they should be used or no. The EAU mentions that urinary cytology has high sensitivity in high grade tumors including CIS. So this is a uh, level of evidence 2B, that means good. So uh, you can use urine voided cytology as an adjunct to cystoscopy to detect high grade tumor, a strong recommendation. And uh, this is how you have to go about it, 25 ml of fresh urine and first morning, morning sample is not suitable. Then <coughs> biomarkers are not accepted as a routine. And these four tests may replace cystoscopy but still are not recommended as per EAU. This is the CX bladder, ADX bladder, expert check and AP check. Then the AUA, again uh, there is no recommendation, you may use but uh, they say that it should not be used in place of cystoscopic evaluation. That is you cannot replace cystoscopy with these biomarkers. So this is the current status. So the summary is that the urinary cytology and biomarkers, they cannot replace cystoscopy, they are only adjuncts. Cytology has a high sensitivity to detect high-grade tumors only 
and other biomarkers have a higher sensitivity than cytology but then they suffer from high false positives and they are not a standard practice but can be used as adjuncts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. If these uh, biomarkers are available in India? We have not uh, used any till now, personally. Uh, this is not. a theoretical basis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, now I invite Dr. Sri, uh, Sri Rak K.S., additional professor in hand, Jipmet Pancheri, to deliver and talk on molecular classification, utility and acceptance.
prognosis also so if you see here the luminal papillary the luminal papillary had around a four year survival rate but at the same time if you see neuroendocrine they had given a survival rate of one one year median survival rate this is like this is from the same uh, article so here ultimately if you see that the the worst prognosis was for the neuroendocrine like and they had the like oncogenic mechanism like tp53 and rb1 the last one the last thing you can see here and tp53 94 percent had a mutation in that so the uh, the this uh, this uh, this association of molecular classes with clinical implication progress and therapeutic possibility using age change and stage of the tumor so basal and squamous cell carcinoma mostly had poor prognosis you see the basal and cell squamous tumor had the so uh, if you look at the if you look at the percentage of muscle invasive bladder carcinoma 35% of the basal cell carcinoma and neuroendocrine patient progressed into muscle invasive and they had the worst prognosis so how do we use it in our th therapy it's like chemotherapy immunotherapy or fgfr transgenic therapy so initially we were giving all this th therapy immunotherapy and fgfr through the metastatic but nowadays the treatment is started as some people have started immunotherapy for as a new adjunct in a new adjuvant therapy setting also. So uh, this is what I was wanted to tell that when it is neuroendocrine, they may they have more susceptibility for chemotherapy or immunotherapy. At the same time basal cell, basal as well as squamous cell differentiation is that chemotherapy is more involved, trauma rich, we can immunotherapy is tried to uh, is has got a role. like all these are not proved. Only various studies have come to have uh, various studies have suggested these are. But if you look at EAU guidelines, there is no role for this. So if it is luminal unstable, they say that radiotherapy may have a. And if it is only lumpy, it is FGFR target therapy. Uh, so if you go if you look at PDL1, basal and squamous cell and luminal benefit from neurogenic chemotherapy, but at the same time. In neuron uh, LUMNS and LUMU and neuron ductrin benefit from anti PDL1 targeted therapy. So, this was a study done, this is a Coxen study where they tried to find out why the neurogen chemotherapy why it benefits some and it doesn't benefit some. Uh, the Coxen study clearly showed that if you see a gemcytopin suspected study, it was associated with downstaging in the GC arm, but at the same time, it was not like MVAC arm did not have any downstaging. So, uh, this uh, this was the conclusion of the study that uh, GC arm had a better prognosis, better uh, downstaging than the MBAC arm. Uh, can you please quickly wind up? Yeah, just last two slides. So the this another study done like if you, uh, done in uh, MD Anderson. Here the prognostic gene expression signature in the molecular classification of chemotherapy naive urothelial is predictive of clinical outcome from neurogenic chemotherapy. The conclusion was that basal subtype was associated with better survival. And the P53-like subtype was associated with bone metastasis and chemoresistant disease. So this is an apacus trial for which atizolimab in operable urothelial carcinoma was done. So here they said the stroma factors such as the, the last, last time, the stroma factors such as transomic growth factor P, beta and fibroblast activation protein were linked to resistance as was high expression of cell cycle gene signatures for treatment. So this is the study which I showed at Afrilib which is used for metastatic urothelial carcinoma, here is found that FGFR alterations were seen. So in this group of patients, a definitive may, of, may be of benefit, but this is not recommended, but solely a uh, study finding. So why, what are the limitations we are facing? Intertumor hemorrhogenicity and some bladder tumors show histological and molecular intertumor heterogeneity. The so EAE guidelines say not yet suitable for routine application. So I will, this, my concluding statement is the last statement, we can no longer think of urothelial cancer as a single disease. Gene expression profiling identifies subtypes of urothelial cancer that differ in their natural history and sensitivity to therapy. Uh, thank you Dr. Shrihar for giving an extensive overview of the current status of this molecular classification. And perhaps uh, we don't have a prospective validated validation of all these markers and that is why they have not yet come in the guidelines. 
so uh, what is their current role in should we ask our pathologist to uh, no i said no we, we I, first thing is that we do not have enough infrastructure, infrastructure to do and eai also do not recommend that we should uh, do that until unless uh, studies clearly only thing is we can we can try to understand why we can at least try to learn the why some of these malignancies do not respond the way we do not and maybe some areas where we should okay insist on chemotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitors okay any other questions thank you thank you thank you dr srirag so ultimately it seems that uh, to be more cost effective we boil it down to non muscle invasive versus invasive versus a metastatic disease so for that now i would like to call dr taruna who is associate professor in radiology at aim jodhpur to deliver her lecture on imaging in urothelial carcinoma challenges and updates good morning everyone thank you sir for the introduction at first i would like to thank the organizing committee dr gautam and dr sandhu for inviting me and giving me this opportunity so it's a very vast topic but i'll try to give you an overview uh, based on a case based scenario so for the next few minutes we'll see what are the challenges and updates in urothelial carcinoma so the outline of my talk is going to be it's going to be a predominantly a case based review we'll see a few easy to challenging cases on ct urography which is the workhorse imaging modality for uh, urothelial cancers and what is the additional and advantage of para multi parametric mri in the upper tract as well as bladder urothelial carcinomas and we'll just have an overview of the wirads which is the vesical imaging reporting and data system for multi parametric mri of bladder dccs so as we know transitional cell carcinomas can occur from anywhere from intrarenal pelvic ileal system to bilateral ureters and the urinary bladder so this is the uh, classic case of bladder transitional cell carcinoma you can see a polyboidal mass in the right posterior wall of the urinary bladder with a nice enhancing stalk and uh, we all can diagnose that this is a uh, it's good for the patient if it is unifocal uh, and it can be easily uh, managed by TURPT classical TCC this was another case so 44 year old male who presented with hematuria so when we do a ct urography protocol uh, what we found was that there was a small tumor in the right uh, lateral wall of the urinary bladder posteriorly and it was seen on both nephrographic as well as the excretory phase images what else do we see here so the tumor is seen here we have found the cause for hematuria but don't just stop with if you have found one tumor because these transitional cell or urothelial carcinomas have a tendency to become to uh, you know have multifocal presentation also so you we see something here also so there is a cystic lesion in the upper pole of the left kidney and when we evaluate that further it can be you know misdiagnosed as a uh, renal cyst if we are not uh, paying a lot of attention so the so when you look at the images in the <coughs> nephrographic phase you see there is an enhancing lesion at the origin of this calyx upper pole calyx so you here you can see this is the upper pole calyx which shows an enhancing tumor and because of the tumor obstruction the entire calyx has distended and is looking like a uh, cyst So here on the sagittal also you can see this is the normal middle uh, interpolar calyx which is uh, does not show any enhancement and this is the enhancement in the upper pole calyx with a tumor lying at the calyx so this patient had actually two tumors <coughs> one in the urinary bladder and simultaneously a tcc in the left upper pole calyx and these images are these are map images of the excretory phase in ct urography and these are volume rendered images these are very essential to diagnose other uh, multifocal tumors and uh, you can see the entire upper pole calyx is not excreting here and is obstructed leading to loss of calyx in the upper pole so uh, synchronous renal and bladder transitional cell carcinoma this was an interesting case this was a 61 year old lady who had gross hematuria intermittently from last 8 months she was evaluated outside at jaipur her hemoglobin at the time of presentation to aims uh, was 7 grams she had undergone few blood transfusions also outside she already had a ct angiography which was performed and read as normal followed by dsa to look for any arteriovenous malformations or other causes of hematuria which was also normal she even took att with a clinical diagnosis of uh, 
uh, genitourinary tuberculosis for six months, but she was not improving. So then she uh, came to Jodhpur. And here on the non-contrast images, you can see there is blood in the left upper pole initial system. So the cause or localization of the bleed was uh, localized to the left upper pole of the kidney. And this is the DSA which was performed at uh, Jaipur and was that is normal. Uh, when I saw this DSA, I felt there was some tumor blush in the upper pole of the uh, left kidney. Uh, kidney. We performed again imaging in the hopes that we will be able to find the tumor or the cause of immaturia. So on the non-contrast, you can see blood fill uh, the entire uh, renal pelvis and the upper pole calyx is filled with blood. On arterial phase images, we could not identify any enhancing tumor and the angiography, CT angiography was also normal. On the venous phase images, you can see the kidney is enlarged. It's very heterogeneous as compared to the right uh, kidney. It, is, it shows delayed persistent nephrogram and is not exactly excreting. So this is almost uh, uh, 25 minutes delayed excretory phase in which you can see the kid lower pole and the interpolar calyx has started to excrete. But there are few, uh, still few filling defects and the, the entire left upper pole calyx is not uh, exactly excreting. So there is something going on there. Patient underwent a ureteroscopy and there was blood pouring in from the left upper pole calyx but they also could not because of the ongoing hematuria and the bleeding, they could not exactly see a tumour. Patient was planned for a nephroureterectomy uh, and before that uh, we said well let's do a multi-parametric MRI. So here you can see these are the titubated images. Uh, you can see the blood fluid levels in the renal pelvis and the upper pole calyx and there are few non-dependent T2 hypointense areas which you can see here. On the T1 weighted images, blood appears in the particular phase. In the subacute phase, it appears hyperintense. So here you can see the lower pole calyx and the pelvis was filled with completely with blood and there were few non-dependent areas. So and some of these areas were restricting and some of them were not restricting. So sometimes even blood can restrict. contrast and has MRI. So in the arterial phase nothing was enhancing in the left kidney but as we go on to the late venous and the arter late arterial and the venous phase images we can see some enhancement of the uterium along the upper pole calyx which is progressively increasing. And when we take further images in the two phase and five phase uh, delayed images you can see the there are uh, there is a flat and little bit of papillary kind of lesion uh, with urothelial thickening along the upper pole and you can see better here the sagittal and coronal images, this urothelium is enhancing and the rest of the uh, blood filled uh, calyx is not enhancing and we also found that the ureter was also enhancing abnormally. So this, we thought this was an upper pole TCC with ureteric involvement and patient under, underwent a left nephroureterectomy and the ureter was also abnormal and here, here you can see the entire pelvic initial system was filled with blood and in the upper pole there was a uh, uh, tumor and the lower pole was normal and in the magnified images you can see the tumor is beautifully seen in the upper pole calyx as it was seen on the MR images exactly. So MRI does help. A uh, little bit of overview about bladder transitional cell carcinomas. So we, have, we know that uh, it's important to differentiate MIBC from NMIBC. So the moment it becomes muscle invasive it becomes uh, T2 <coughs> for us sorry. So multi-parametric MRI appearance, what do we do? We do T2 weighted images, we do dynamic contrast enhanced MRI and we do a diffusion weighted imaging and we classify every lesion in a patient with multifocal tumors to one of these categories, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if it is less than 1 cm, usually virex 1, virex 2 if it is more than, two cent more than 1 cm and if the inner layer enhancement is maintained and is thickened. 3 is intermediate between 2 and 4, so 4 is interruption of uh, the uh, low signal intensity line of the muscular layer and 5 is extension into the uh, perivesical fat which is T3 and then uh, so what happens in 3? 3 is somewhere in between so what happens is thickened inner layer disappears but there is no clear disruption of the low signal intensity muscular layer so virus 3 has to be correlated with the TURPT <coughs> for better staging and these are the, this uh, document is available freely on the on, uh, internet and we can study it if you want to really learn the virant scoring. We'll just see a few examples. So this is a classic example, polypoid mass in the left uh, lateral wall with a nice top diffusion restriction and the maintained inner layer. So classic virants one. Another lesion, so uh, this is called as typically an inchworm appearance. It looks like a caterpillar on a, a tree branch. So you have a T2, uh, T2 hyperintense and diffusion hypointense talk 
with no restriction in the muscle layer and maintained enhancement of the inner layer, so classic virates too. In virates 3, this case we thought uh, this was uh, virates 4 on T2 but then on diffusion it looked like virates 3. So we downgraded uh, it too, but uh, virates 3, but it turned out to be a high grade muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. So it was a false negative of uh, our cases. Here you can see there is a mass lesion, another case, a uh, mass lesion along the left uh, side with involvement of the VU junction. But you can see this muscle layer is along the ureter is maintained, but along the left lateral wall is not maintained. And you can see diffusion restriction also with speculations going into the muscle layer. Okay and uh, early arterial enhancement along the wall. So look, the rest of the bladder wall is not enhancing, but the tumor is enhancing early. So this is why it's four. And the uh, last case is, you can see here, there is a mass lesion. It's kind of like flat. So it has an intraluminal component and within the, um, within the wall also it's going in. And uh, here on the diffusion, you can see there are speculations going into the extra vesicle fat, which is also seen on T1 weighted images here. Even also helps to evaluate the blood clots which are present in patients with uh, hematuria. So all this black intensity is blood clots. So don't get confused by them. So this was a virex 5. The take home message is multiparametric MRI improves the diagnostic accuracy in both upper urothelial cancers and in urinary bladder TCCs. And we should use virex to improve the communication in the diagnosis, staging and surveillance of patients with bladder cancer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Taruna. Uh, which is better, uh, MR urography or CT urography in diagnosis of the CA bladder or staging? So, MR urography is a different technique. Multiparametric MRI Multi is a different thing. So, uh, for the diagnosis, it's uh, the workhorse mainly is CT urography. First, we detect it on that, and if we uh, have any problem or any uh, confusion, if there is any clinical radiological mismatch, if there is any clinical pathological mismatch, if the something is post EURBT also we can use. So for problem solving mainly we use multiparametric MRI. It, if the patient is affording, I would say directly go for multiparametric MRI because mainly the issue in our country is the cost, uh, recurring cost also. So the work, mainly the work for CT urography, but if the patient is affording, but diagnosis, it is CT urography because multifocal involvement is better seen. The uh, spatial resolution is better in MRI for a particular area. But evaluating the whole tract is different thing. So for evaluating the whole tract, you have to do a CT urography. Once you have localized the tumor, you can do a multiparametric MRI. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tarun, a nice presentation with uh, several cases. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, clinical cases. So how far we have actually moved uh, with this validation of uh, uniform reporting of the virate system in MRI bladder? So we have moved oh, into uh, uh, virates reporting uh, because we uh, last year we finished the project on it and now whenever we do a, a MR, multiparametric MR for bladder cancers, the urologist okay. will call what virates it is. So yeah, okay, so in terms of it. the inter-observer variability, uh, is now uh, a standardized reporting everywhere from so all inter, No, inter-observer variability is definitely there, but when we follow the protocol, how to report it, and there is definitely a learning curve to it. So uh, the same happens with the pathology reporting, same happens in TURBT staging. So inter-observer variation is there everywhere. If the same urologist is not doing the TURBT, if the same pathologist is not reporting the, the uh, specimen. So inter-observer variability is there, but in the, the published studies, the inter-observer, uh, you know, uh, correlation is excellent. In fact, it's around more than 0.8. So okay. it's not bad, actually. Okay. So <clears throat> I would like to answer your question, sir. Sir, regarding the reporting of virides, it depends <coughs> on the clinician what they want from the radiologist. Like we have for liver lesion, we have lyrides. For prostate, we have pyrides. Pyrides is a standardized, I think. We don't have any confusion in that. Virides, definitely, radiologists all over the country, they are not following it while reporting. But it depends on the institute and the clinician. How they are treating, how they are managing. And it is just the communication. It is more of a communication that it is muscle invasive, non-muscle invasive. So it is not a standardized form of reporting. But yes, 
definitely Viroids has improved the communication and the patient management. And soon I hope it will come into guidelines. The work is in progress. Thank you. Uh, so we will move on to the next presentation by Dr. Samir Taiwade. Uh, he is going to present on another aspect which is very important in the management of uh, TCC uh, of uh, the urinary tract which is the use of nuclear medicine in evaluation of neurothelial carcinoma. Dr. Samir. Good morning one and all. Uh, at the outset I would like to thank uh, Sandhu sir and Gautam sir for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> So I will be discussing about the role of nuclear medicine in evaluation of urothelial cancer. So uh, we will be discussing this under this sets, we will uh, see uh, guidelines, then uh, different nuclear medicine studies that can be performed, when to use these studies, how to use these studies, advances and innovation in the studies and finally our take. So uh, firstly I would like to show two images, these are the whole body scans of two different patients on left side. Uh, this is the patient with the lung cancer. Uh, here you can see multiple these dark spots and uh, it is clearly seen that uh, there is a lesion in the lung then uh, there are multiple metastases. But on the right side there is a patient uh, where you don't see such black spots. So this was a case of bladder carcinoma and here you can see there is an intense activity uh, in the bladder region but this is the physiological activity. So this is how the PET CT uh, on PET CT other cancers and the uh, bladder cancer or urothelial cancers are different. So we'll discuss how to deal with this then. So uh, recommendations are very clear for non-invasive cancers, PET CT is not recommended. And for uh, invasive cancer, whenever we have a doubt that uh, clinically or radiologi uh, radiologically there is a suspicion for metastasis, we can go ahead with the PET CT. Uh, recently, this EAU and ISTRO guidelines, they have suggested PET CT can be useful for even lymph nodal staging. Then what are the studies that can be performed for urothelial cancer? We know, uh, we all know FDG PET CT and bone scan. Uh, bone scan, it can be a technician bone scan or the uh, sodium fluoride PET CT bone scan. Uh, obviously, they have uh, limitations because they can only tell about the skeletal lesions. Extra osseous metastasis cannot be picked up on these uh, modalities. But there are other two modalities which are not commonly used but they can be very useful like technetium uh, DDPA renogram. So uh, it can give uh, idea about the functional uh, uh, characteristics of the tumor. Also the ipsilateral kidney functionality can be seen on the renogram. Then tumor, uh, if there is a tumor which is causing obstru uh, obstructive uropathy, that can be evaluated on the DTPA renogram. And finally, GFR estimation and differential renal function, these are important before starting the chemotherapy. And another important modality that is MUGA scan, which can be used for assessment of left ventricular rejection faction post chemotherapy. Then uh, we will focus mainly on the FDG PET CT. So uh, whenever we talk about the PET CT as we discussed earlier, uh, we talk about the limitation in urothelial cancer. So uh, we, it is because of the urinary excretion of the uh, FDG into the uh, urinary tract. So we have developed certain methods to overcome this, the list is there. But the most important one is the oral hydration and forced diuresis. So how does this help? So, uh, if you remember, this is the same patient uh, which I showed in the first slide. Here, uh, it was referred for staging. In the initial images, we have uh, this cross-sectional uh, images. Here, we cannot make out the tumor. But post uh, forced diuresis and hydration, here we can see nicely there, uh, there was a tumor in the posterior wall. So, this is how the limitation can be overcome with the modification of protocol. Then uh, can we use this in the T and N staging? So obviously uh, just now Dr. Taruna has shown nice beautiful images. So it is not superior to CT and MRI. But uh, recently some meta-analysis has shown good sensitivity and specificity for detection of primary tumor as well uh, on PET CT. And uh, the SUV max has been correlated well with the muscle invasiveness, histological grade and the pathological tumor size. And the uh, end staging, again there is a wide range of results on FDG PET CT and mainly this is because of the staging, uh, different study designs and the interpretation criteria. But when we combine the morphology and the uh, metabolic uh, parameters together, it can give a better result uh, than other modalities. 
Then uh, coming to the M staging. For M staging, this is the mainstay of FDG PET CT because uh, being a whole body imaging, it can detect metastasis at usual and unusual sites both. So common sites like bone, lung, liver and peritoneum uh, metastasis can be easily detected on PET CT. So and that too with a good sensitivity. And uh, believe me, this FDG PET CT has shown up to 68% of change in the management if we plan uh, management based on PET CT. So this is a significant number. Then coming to the prognostic uh, value, so this group Martin et al, uh, they studied the value of uh, PET CT and they uh, uh, found that the positivity on PET CT correlates with the shorter uh, overall survival and disease specific survival and also it is one of the indicator for mortality. So this will help to plan the uh, aggressive treatment further. So uh, if it is positive we can avoid the other treatment. So uh, I will quickly go through few cases. Uh, this is a case which was referred for uh, staging of uh, bladder cancer and uh, this is the uh, delayed image post the uh, uh, LASIX and here you can see a lesion in the right vesicular uh, uh, ureteric region and it is infiltrating the wall and extending into the uh, adjacent ureter. But in addition there were two foci which were discrete and uh, these were also a tumor, uh, a primary tumor. Then uh, there was a lymph node on the right side in the right external iliac region and unfortunately this patient had the skeletal metastasis and the lung metastasis. So in a single study we can have idea about the primary tumor, lymph local regional spread as well as the distant metastasis. Then uh, it is not just about the bladder cancer, the upper tract uh, urothelial CS can also be detected on PET CT. Uh, in this case uh, patient there was a lesion in the lower ureter on left side. It was extending into the bladder and uh, this patient uh, this patient also had retroperitoneal lymph nodes and left supraclavicular lymph node. So PET CT upstaged uh, disease uh, sometimes in the uh, if we have done it in the staging. Then uh, coming to the treatment response. This is another important aspect of, on PET CT because response uh, this urothelial CS shows good response to chemotherapy and overall survival improve, improves after uh, chemotherapy response. So it is important to uh, ca characterize this response accurately and PET CT can be very useful in such settings. And uh, this new uh, modality of treatment uh, that we have discussed there are uh, various mutations. So this PDL1 expression, uh, FDG PET CT can be is helpful in this patient. How uh, some studies have shown that FDG PET CT can be uh, correlated with the PDL1 expression. So this can help in selecting the patient for this treatment, pembrolizumab, uh, uh, for example. Then uh, uh, this is the example uh, where patient was uh, referred post ERBT, and in baseline there was a lesion uh, in the bladder wall. And he received chemotherapy, post chemotherapy, we can see uh, the lesion which was there in the bladder has completely disappeared. So uh, this is how we can clearly uh, categorize patient into response and non-responders. Then finally, the uh, another most important indication for PET CT is recurrence evaluation. So MIBC, uh, as we know, it can show early and distant recurrence and whenever there is a recurrence, the prognosis is bad. And these pa uh, patients with recurrence needs costly and cytotoxic, uh, mostly toxic therapies. So it is important to be sure before starting these uh, therapies and PET CT again can be very useful. So in this patient, this was post uh, cystectomy and there was a recurrence in the uh, pelvic lymph nodes on left side. Then what are the advances and innovations? So uh, we have developed certain scanners like digital scanners with a special, uh, better spatial resolution. We have developed techniques like dynamic imaging. It is still uh, under research. And we have uh, we always talk about new tracers. Uh, so these tracers have been uh, discussed uh, since many years now, but availability is the main issue with these tracers. And refining protocol is uh, important part. And uh, finally, the most, uh, most, uh, most high uh, technique that is PET-MR. Can this address all the queries that we have uh, right now in the urothelial cancer? Uh, I think it is too early to comment on this, but theoretically speaking, it looks be, uh, promising for urothelial cancer. So finally, what is our take? So uh, for PET-CT, uh, use of PET-CT should be individual uh, patient-based approach uh, for urothelial cancer. Uh, obviously, when we have a PET-CT, we should go with a PET-CT than a bone scan. 
Then FDG plate CT, as we discussed, it is uh, useful in MIBC when we have a suspicion clinically or radiology about the metastasis or uh, in the recurrence setting. And customization of protocol with forced diuresis is greatly helpful. So uh, finally, I would like to conclude with uh, our institute protocol. We have developed one protocol which, in which we have clubbed the CT, all the phases of CT with PET CT. Uh, actually, I cannot uh, disclose the entire protocol exactly because the study is still undergoing and uh, we are hoping it will uh, give a good results in future. So uh, that's all uh, from the nuclear medicine point of view in the urothelial cancer. Thank you. Dr. Samid, uh, again a nice presentation. As a clinician, what uh, we often have a concern is uh, the uh, sen higher sensitivity of a PET scan, in particularly uh, uh, regions like India where the tuberculosis may be endemic and uh, uh, some uh, infectious lesion may be wrongly labeled as a, probably a metastasis and we may ultimately end up denying this statement and probably that is the reason we do not use uh, uh, PET scan in the diag early diagnosis uh, phases of uh, the management. So we would like to know your uh, uh, side of the story. Uh, do we see uh, poorer specificity of PET scan because of uh, the tuberculosis being end endemic in India? Uh, yes, sir, that's very good point because uh, this uh, for infection and inflammation, these are same on PET CT. But uh, we have to uh, see an uh, individual clinic uh, patient uh, context in that and uh, we have to correlate it, uh, we, we have uh, other CT, uh, like in this case we have a CT parameter with PET CT, so we uh, correlate it with the CT parameters, then the location of lymph nodes. So generally these infective lymph nodes, they are more in the mediastinal uh, groups. So uh, if it is just the mediastinal group and there are no other lymph nodes in the abdomen and pelvis, then uh, generally we say this could be inflammatory. So considering the overall clinical picture, the other blood parameters and other imaging modality, we can clearly uh, say whether this could be infective or uh, inflammatory. So uh, based on the uh, individual is patient. Is there a threshold SUV also which may differentiate between? Uh, no, SUV cannot differentiate between the tumor and the infection. Earlier there was uh, thinking that uh, there can be cut off, but there is no clear cut, cut off for infection and malignant. Any other questions? Mike is there. Was there any histological correlation in that trial? Yeah, in this, I mean, that patient which I showed. Or yeah. No, there was complete response. So, when, uh, no, whenever, this is an individual case, when I, this is your case. This was our case, okay. but there are studies where the PET CT has been done for response assessment recently or so there are studies okay. and they have good, uh, shown a good sensitivity and specificity for response assessment also. They have done it for the lymph node uh, response also with a histopathological correlation and in that also it is seen that PET CT correlates well with the histopathology also. And you also mentioned that there will be 68% change in your management? Yeah, up to 68%. To, huh. So various studies have shown a uh, change in treatment management. So it's ranging from 20 to maximum up to 68%. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sameen. Uh, so with this we come to the end of the session and I thank all the speakers once again for having set the stage very nicely and the background for uh, uh, the CA bladder management. Uh, so with this, uh, I hand it over to the organizers. Thank you all the speakers. I think uh, we can close the session now. I think it was very nicely presented. If you come to think about the uh, latest development in the uh, technology about uh, investigative technology, right starting from the ultrasound, now there are a lot of improvements in the ultrasounds also to pick up these uh, tumors and differentiate them from other lesions in the bladder, whether they are inflammatory or they are just like blood clots and all those things. As far as um, MRI is concerned, this viral score is coming up in a very major way. As we have pilot score, we might be very soon 
having this thing in the guidelines. Coming to about uh, nuclear medicine, it has a role more in supportive uh, treatments rather than in diagnostic uh, treatment. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, sir, for your comments. And a big thanks to all the chairpersons and the speakers for a lovely session. Uh, I have a couple of uh, important announcements to make. Uh, the first one is that there is a small change in the schedule and the PG quiz will be held at uh, 2 p.m. in the first floor of the auditorium. Uh, and also the breakfast is ready. So as per convenience, uh, you can please move for breakfast as well. And I would also request all the chairpersons and the speakers to move towards the right side of the auditorium for a mementos and for a group photograph. Now we move on to the live operator session for the day. I would request the following chairpersons for this session to join us on the stage. Dr. M. K. Chabra, Senior Professor, MDM Hospital, Jodhpur. Dr. Prashant Nayak, Additional Professor in Urology from Ames, Bhubaneswar. Dr. Ankit Khayal, Consultant Urologist from Jaipur. Dr. Shrira K.S., Additional Professor in Urology from Jipmar. Dr. Prateek Gupta, Consultant Urologist from Hisar. In OR1, we will be demonstrating robot-assisted radical cystectomy with intracorporeal urinary diversion. It will be demonstrated by Professor Rajesh Elavat. He is a world-renowned name in the field of minimally invasive urology with more than 40 years of experience. He is the group chairman of urology at Medanta Gurgaon. In OR2, we will be having a live demonstration of laparoscopic radical cystectomy with ileal conduit urinary diversion by Professor Swapan Sood. He is consultant urologist at Patel Super Speciality Hospital, Jalandhar. And in OR3, we will be having a demonstration of holmium laser end block resection of bladder tumor by Dr. Devendra Sharma. He is senior consultant urologist from CK Birla Hospital, Jaipur. Over to the OR now. Thank you. Can we be connected to the OT? The breakfast is ready. I request everyone kindly to proceed for breakfast.
Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. This is Dr. Prashant Naik from Ames Bhubaneswar. With me, Dr. Srira from Hipmar. Dr. Pratik from Isar. Hello, I am Dr. Chawda, Hello. Uh, Senior Professor Urology from Dr. Essen Medical College, Jodhpur. So we were waiting on the feed from the OT. This was me, I just spoke. Okay. Hello, are we connected to OT? Hello. Hello. Are we audible? Ah, yeah, you are audible, audible sir. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah you are audible. Okay. Sir. Can we have description of the patient which you are going to? Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to live operative demonstration from can, OR. Can we have a big screen? Can you increase the size of the screen? Huh. Yeah. Is it so, now? Yeah. Okay. The first case for today is planned for Holmium laser in block resection. Operating surgeon is uh, Dr. Devendra Sharma sir. Uh, case is of a 58 year male without any uh, addiction, comorbidity and past surgical history. Chief complaint is uh, painless gross hematuria for last 10 days with passage of amorphous blood clots. On examination, general condition is fair, well built, ECOG 0, no pallor, ectrosinosis, lymphadenopathy or edema. Parvartaman is soft, non-tender, no palpable lump is there. Local examination of genitalia is normal, DRE, anal tone normal. Grade 2 prostate, firm, non-tender, non-nodular, rectal mucosa is free. On investigations, his uh, hemoglobin is 12.6, total count is uh, 4,280 and platelets is 1.24 lakhs. KFT, LFT and PSA are within normal limits. On ultrasound abdomen, there, uh, in, uh, in urinary bladder, there is a wall thickening and mass of 16 cross 13 mm. This is the CT urography delayed images where we can see the 1.3 cross 1 centimeter uh, mass in the right infralateral uh, uh, wall. <coughs> Diagnosis is urinary bladder mass and is planned for TRPT. Are we connected with Dr. Sharma? Yes, I am handing over the mic to Dr. Devendra Sharma sir. Hello. Hello. Huh. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Devendra. Yes, sir. Good morning. So, after the history, we are going to plan cystoscopy in this patient. Proceed, proceed. Can you show us the endoscopic view? Yes, sir. Can you see the endoscopic view? No, we uh, do not have the endoscopic view okay. with us. Good morning, Dr. Sharma. This is Dr. Prashant from Ames, Bhubaneswar. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So, uh, are you considering an obturator block or patient is under GA? Patient is under GA. Okay, fine. Sure. <coughs> yeah, now we can. Now we have the endoscopic heat with okay. us. Okay. Okay. Sure. So we are doing cystoscopy. Irrigation, irrigation please. Irrigation. White balance, sir. Ready. Ready, yes. Okay. 
There is a soft narrowing in proximal bulbar urethra, but it's, I think, posterior wall and anterior wall. Okay, okay. So, Ari, will you be able to do it irrespective of where it is? You said posterior, lateral, anterior, so yeah, anywhere? Yeah, that's why I mentioned, yeah, all four places we can do. Okay. But, but on the dome, you, many a time we find it difficult because all these lasers are end firing. So okay. we don't get that uh, good angle on these, uh, only mainly on the dome. Okay. But okay. these, uh, but what I would uh, tell you that it's good to do on the lateral wall because there is always a risk of obturator jerk when we are doing conventional TURVT. Okay. So here there are no concerns to have an obturator jerk yes. because you're using laser. Yeah. Great. Uh, sir, Dr. Pratik this side. Sir, it, uh, but does it change if there is associated thickening around the tumor or satellite lesions around the tumor? Uh, you can still go for uh, HOLAP or you prefer to uh, switch over to TURBT or if there is thickening around the tumor or satellite lesions. Yeah, it means if, if we are suspecting muscle invasive tumor, then if we are suspecting, it means you, you are telling uh, that uh, there is suspicion of muscle invasive tumor in those situations, usually we avoid uh, holmium enucleation. Okay. Then we go for conventional TURBT. So your decision to do a holar BT would be based on imaging as well as in uh, cystoscopic evaluation? What no, no, do? definitely you will yeah. do cystoscopic evaluation. I am waiting for that only. Okay. Fine. Because this patient has got a soft structure in proximal bulb. Mm -hmm. So first we will do optical internal urethrotomy. Yeah, we are waiting for that. Sure. So now we are ready with optical urethrotomy. Jodhpur OT is excellent. We can excellent. see everybody wearing halyard trunks yeah, yeah. and all that. Yes. It's really excellent OT. With an OR1 integrated OT by Carl Stowe's integration. Wow. So high tech OT. Very high tech OT, sir. Really mesmerized with OT and equipments they are having. Yes. World class instruments, world class OT. I think it is your second experience in AMS OT. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> your... But at that time, OT was in old building. Okay, so now you are enjoying the new modular OTs. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think you did the pyeloplasty last time when you were in the yes. AMS OT. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so, not a very dense structure. Yeah, it was a soft structure. Yeah. Here is the growth. Can you see? Yeah, we can see, and it's a. Yeah, this is right uretic orifice. Okay. And. This is left uretic orifice. So once we are in, we'll see any satellite lesion or any other tumor along with this. This is another mucosal changes, not exactly the tumor. We will fulgurate with the laser at this area. Another, this is another lesion, yeah, but not exactly tumor. So what we can do, you, uh, Dr. Prashant asked that yeah. if there is satellite lesions are there, if it looks like a superficial tumor, then we fulgurate all smaller lesion with the laser. Okay. And the criteria is if tumor is less than 1.5 centimeter, mm -hmm. in those cases we can fulgurate. Yes, yes sir. And those lesions, you have the facility of NBI here. If I am not wrong, I think Jodhpur will have NBI. Would oh, you like to get uh, an NBI done on those lesions? Oh, I was not aware, so we will, uh, yes, 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 yeah. NBI. 
I think from here I can do it. And the camera head we can do, yeah. Yeah, so this is the NVI image that you're getting, yes. Yeah. So maybe those accessory lesions that you saw, you yeah. could probably better delineate them with the NVI, yes. Yes, yes. So that's the beauty of NVI. You can see all one, two, three. So these don't look like uh, humors, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, there is no other tumor. Okay. So it's a single tumor, right? So, so basically, there are field changes only, no? Yeah. <coughs> Okay. <coughs> Change it to normal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Is the Oh, thirty. Okay. Is the okay? Okay. What's your name? What's your instrumentation in this case? What so this was this was zero degree lens. Uh, and uh, now we are switching to 30 degree. Okay. With, with the laser is receptoscope or? Yeah, we are using normal stored receptoscope. Okay. Right. And which laser and what <laughs> settings yeah, will you be using? Fo there? Focus on the laser. It's a quanta laser, 100 watt. Can you see? No, not yet, we are not. Can somebody know our focus on the laser <laughs> machine? Please fix. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the laser? No, we are not yet. Uh, yeah, not yet? Focused on your instruments only. <coughs> we can see your instruments and you are working with your laser. Okay, just focus on the laser. On the yes, laser. so now we are seeing. Yeah. So you got it 20 watt. Yeah, so we will change the setting. Okay. So we what settings would you prefer in this case? So what settings would you like to keep? Some? So 1.5 Joule and 20 Hertz. 1.5 to 20, so that's about 30. 30 watts, yeah. Yeah. So are you going to keep one setting or are you going to have a separate setting for coagulation and cutting? Because no, I will keep only one setting. Okay. Because this laser, I think, affords you the flexibility to have two separate settings. Yeah, if required, we can change it to different set coagulation, but most of the cases we can do only okay and as far as laser setting is concerned we don't go above 35 okay fine so somebody with a 30 watt laser could also possibly do yes. this right yes so yes the reason for not going beyond 35 is there are some in, in case reports where there is bowel perforation especially doing for the wow okay so maybe in the anterior, anterior wall reason. yes yeah. the one in the door what are your thoughts about distension or putting an injection and doing hydro distension at the base before whole RBT? I have not done, but uh, what I uh, when I do this laser enucleation, you automatically get this submucosal plane got uh, edematous, looks like edematous. Automatically, fluid goes into these planes. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah. So that will be nice. So probably it's not required. Okay, sir. Okay. So Usually we mark around one centimeter from the 
base of the tumor. Can you appreciate this? Yes, we can see. So, so but it's very close to the ureteric orifice. Yeah. So we will mark here okay. and mark all around and then take it out. Will it be possible to go all around this or maybe you will only mark it at this end and then yeah, start cutting? Yeah, initially I will mark okay, fine. on the inferior side. Okay. Fine. And when we do bigger tumor also, we have done bigger tumor also, in those cases what we do? Yeah. We just take out the tumor in some mucosal plane. Okay. Fine. And so, then take the deep biopsy separately. Okay, okay. okay. The advantage. Ah, yes, ready. Advantage in bigger tumor is, is less time and less blood loss. Absolutely, because you are not going to cut the same vessels again yeah, and again. Again and again. True, true. <clears throat> but the disadvantage is that we are not taking out the muscles along with the tumor. Okay. So that's the main advantage of okay. enucleation. Mm -hmm. huh? No, no, it's okay. But many times while doing enucleation, I have seen that part of the muscle comes along with it. So do you make a conscious decision to keep confined to just the submucosal plane or? No, that is that's what I'm telling you. For the for the bigger tumor, we do like this. In majority of cases, like tumor like this, we take out the muscles along with this. Yeah, great. That's the main advantage of enucleation, that you get yes. a better, better muscle along with the tumor. Okay. okay. You are trying to mark it, make yes, a marking? Yes, sir. Another advantage of marking is that we fulgurate the vessels which are reaching to the tumor. Yeah, so, yes. So, there will be less bleeding. Hmm. So, now I will go a little deeper. Yes. <coughs> Moment you do defocus the laser, it uh, will uh, fall the right. Sir, sir, sir. छोड़ दीजिए, छोड़ दीजिए। So here, are there any tips in identifying the correct plane? Yeah. So can you appreciate these muscle fiber? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you can easily identify muscle fiber once you are comfortable with routine TRBT. Okay. So, and the depth is, you have to see at least fat at one place. That shows that you are... Take an adequate amount of muscle. Yeah. Muscle tissue. Yes. And that's the only advantage of this. Mm. As per the literature, yeah. there is no, no other advantage mm. of mm. enucleation over the TRBT. That it gives a better muscle yield when we are doing enucleation. The other advantage is that your histopathology trend is also much happier to yes, have this yes. specimen. Yes, yes, yes. These kind of specimen, yes. And on the lateral wall, there is no obturator jerk, which is really a worrisome thing. Yes. Because that lend up into yeah. bladder puck. Uh, Dr. Sharma will be watching you while we go to OR2, they are ready to present the case. Yeah, yes sir. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you. can somebody from OR2 connect with us? Sir, you can see the fat now? Yeah, we can see the fat, yes. So, now I will lift it up. You were saying that you get a edematous plane. Yeah, you will you will appreciate moment we will reach at 12 o'clock position. Because of irrigation, mostly we find, I think... Does it somehow help you to separate the tumor from the base, the flow of the uh, sal uh, saline or... <coughs> Thank you.
Yeah, we are with you over to. Can we uh, start presenting the case? Any question? Good morning to all the respected faculty. I, Om Kumar Yadav, resident of urology, welcome you all to the live midterm CUE being organized by AIMS Department of Urology, AIMS Jodhpur and Jodhpur Urology Forum. To welcome to OR2 where live demonstration of laparoscopic radical cystocrostectomy with ileal conduit diversion is planned. No, and the that procedure is being so done by Dr. Swapan Sood, Dr. Himanshu Pandey and Dr. Suresh Goel. Now I will be giving a brief history no, of the patient. Just like he is a 74 year old gentleman without any comorbidities and addictions. He presented with complaints of pectus cross hematuria without clots for 3 months and there was no history of bothersome lungs. There was history of some open bladder surgery which was done 20 years ago yes, but we don't involved. have any documents yes, available for, for that patient. Especially on the lateral wall. On examination he is a fairly patient with ECOG 0, there is no paleric, there is sinusis, clubbing lymphadenopathy. You need to connect as we go. One per abdominal examination, the there is a vertical midline scar of Devin, we are 7 cm in suprapubic region. So on palpation, it is soft, non tender, non palpable, and there is no palpable lump. Penis is normal with normal meatus. On DRE, the inner tone is normal. It is grade 2 hard prostate, non tender, non nodular, with free rectal mucosa. The, moving on to the blood investigations, the CBC is 9.5 gram percent with the WBC count of 7500 and a platelet count of 1 lakh. 50,000. KFT, LF, INR are within normal limits. Can, his can PSA we connect is, to OT1 for some time? And his PSA is 2.19. Uh, uh, please stop your presentation. We are going to OT1 for some time because it is at the conclusion of the surgery. I think uh, we just go back to OR1 where Dr. Sarma is completing this case. and then Om, Om you hold on. Can you go back to the whole RBT? OR1. Can you just connect to OR1? Dr. Devinder Sarma's OT. First OT which was started. Can we be connected to OT1? Yeah. yeah. Devinder, are you yes, sir. audible to us? Yes, yes. Uh, we so, wanted to see your the yes, final but, work. So what we have done, so we started from here, then we develop a deep plane here, we reach up to the fat here, look at this. Yeah. Yes, we yeah. can see that sir. Okay. Yeah. And now we connected from above, so we have dissected the mucosa all around, yes. so now we are about to free it from the muscle layer. Yeah. So you are happy with the amount of muscle fibers that have come with the specimen, no? Yes, sir. That's nice. And mostly pathologists are more happy and they can tell the real... Yes, true. Because it's in continuity and there are yeah. no effects of uh, using cauterization effects are not there. So, yeah. Yes. Definite advantage. And we should keep the bladder partially full. Okay, okay. Uh, so, Dr. Shira here, like, uh, what do you, like, how do you, what are the uh, tips you will give to a person who starts this? Like, how do you, how do you make sure that you don't perforate the bladder? Rather, we have to perforate the bladder at one place, that's what I was telling. We have to see the fat, but it's a controlled perforation. We have to reach up because to the... Here, here almost it looks like, okay, we have taken a good uh, muscle also. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the area that you are working now, we are able to see that you have almost reached the end of the muscle. So is it what you are seeing is the perivesical part there? Yeah. Yes sir, yes sir. Okay. That's what, that ensures that you remove the complete yes. muscle layer along yeah. with this. Yeah, we can see the fat there, correct. So it's almost like doing a radical URBT. Yes. 
Only thing with this, would you be inter would you be willing to give a post of intravesical mitomycin after this? Yes, we have done. Uh, we have placed mitomycin in these patients also. We didn't we didn't find any problem. But in this patient where I am able to see perivesical fat, I would be loath to give uh, intravesical mitomycin probably. Yeah. yeah. But theoretical, yes. theoretical, How many of yes. you would, would like to give intravesical mitomycin here? Yes, we have done. Uh, we have placed mitomycin C also, but we didn't find any problem. Okay, okay. So this is contradictory to our belief, but it's a small number with, in which we have put in. So okay. probably, probably everybody should do start doing, and then we come to know about this. You okay. see, you have deliberately perforated the bladder, and it's a controlled perforation. Probably that's the difference. Moment. So, so, so mitomycin will not leak from the bladder to the peripheral part of the. Moment, uh, pardon, I, I couldn't listen to you. You see, you have deliberated, uh, perforated the bladder, and when you'll introduce the mitomycin, <laughs> it would be going beyond the bladder. Yes, yeah, that's the theoretical possibility, but we have put in around 10 15 of our patients, but we didn't find any problem. Okay. Not a big thing to say that we can put in. Okay. Yeah, now it's free. Yeah, we can see it's free. And now see the fossa? Yes. No significant bleeding? Yeah. So, Amazing. I think uh, the audience appreciates your work. It's, it is excellent. You can hear the applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank now, you. next question is to retrieval of these tumor. Yeah. So, will, another. will it come out in the sheath or would you need to morselate it? No, I am not going to morselate. First, we will try to take it out. Yeah, through, if you take through, it. Uh, yes. through aspiration mm -hmm. with the with the helix helix evacuator. Okay. It it if it comes out with that, that's fine. Second, we will try with nephroscope and triprong. Okay. And looking at its size, it will come. Okay. And for the bigger tumor, we have done morselation also. But we try to avoid porcelain. Okay. <laughs> Sir, thank you for an excellent demonstration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, Dr. Ankit Kayal here. I want to ask one question. How much circumferential distance you want to take from the pedicle in the pedicleated mass? Yes, Dr. Ankit, around one centimeter around the stalk. So we start marking around one one centimeter and then go deep. Orifice. It was okay. very close to uretric orifice. I yeah. think you couldn't have got one yeah, centimeter that. margin for that. Hello, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think we need to. Can I ask one question? Alex. Uh, yes, sir. No, if you have a bigger tumor and if you mask oh, it, what happens to the muscle? Sir, we can get you, sir. If you have a bigger tumor uh, and you macerate to retrieve it, uh, then what happens to the muscle? Blast to me, blast to muscle. Uh, sir, the question from Flo, Dr. Bhattiyari is asking that if you have a larger tumor and you need to macerate it, then what happens to histology? What happens to that hip muscle that you removed? I couldn't get your question. Sir, there, if the tumor is large and you need to macerate to remove it, what happens to the muscle that you have taken? Does it affect the histopathology after morselation? Sure, it's a good question. Probably we discuss in the early part of uh, uh, discussion that when tumor is large, say for example, four or five centimeter papillary tumor and narrow stock tumor, okay. then we, we remove the tumor in submucosal plane. Okay. We don't take biopsy along with that. Okay. The reason is moment we take the uh, muscle tissue with this, this is little tougher to take it out on. Okay. So we, and, and probably we, we need to morselate for the bigger tumor. So we take out this as a superficial tumor and morselate it and take the deep biopsy separately with the loop, conventional deep biopsy. Okay. Uh, yeah, what about the histopathology of the tumor itself? No, it's same. There is no, no problem with histopathology because we are, now we are giving sample in two one is superficial, another is deep biopsy, as we give for the conventional TRBT. Actually, morselation does not affect the histopathology. So yeah. That proven. <laughs> Sir, uh, again, I would like to say that is an excellent demonstration. I think all of us learnt a lot. 
from that and we would like to thank you for your demonstration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chabra, thank you sir. Thank you, sir. Can we move to over who? We are moving to OT2 now. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can we be connected to OT2 now? Can we go to OT2? I think the case presentation was left in between. If they can complete the case presentation and then we would get on with the case. Okay. Uh, <laughs> continuing on further, the patient underwent TURPT on... Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Please continue. Huh. Yeah, continuing further, the patient underwent TURBT on 17th of January 23. On cystopan endoscopy, there was a 4 cm size broad based growth present over right lateral wall. Bilateral VUJ were normal. Histopathology was suggestive of invasive urothelial carcinoma with high grade nuclear features suggestive of T2 lesion. <coughs> see, see, I show you the CT films for the patient. This is the CT of the patient done post procedure. How many days after the procedure? CT was done how many days after the procedure? I think I sir, the voice is not clear, sir. I was asking CT was done how many days after TRBT? Sir, CT was done six weeks after TRBT. Okay, okay. So please tell us what you see in the CT so that. Sir, the CT shows bilateral upper tracts normal, the liver is normal, there are no distant mids and there is diffuse UV wall thickening. Any NACT was given? <coughs> no, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, CT, CT is suggestive of diffuse UV wall thickening with no distant mids. Sir, no lymphadenopathy. Sir, I am handing over the mic to Dr. Sood, sir. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Good morning. Uh, can, can, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, good morning, man. Who is on the, uh, on the desk right now? I am Dr. Srirak from Chipper Pondicherry. Here with me are Dr. Prashant, and Dr. Chawla, sir, and then Dr. Ankit, and Dr. Pradeep. Okay, good morning to all of you. And uh, I hope you have seen the CT scan and all. And uh, I want to first of all congratulate uh, uh, Gautam on uh, holding this wonderful uh, conference. And I am really impressed to see all the facilities which he has here at uh, AIMS. I had last come here in 2018 with uh, and worked with Himanshu. Since then the OTs etc have changed and they have really become world class right now. I haven't seen any better OTs so far and I have been operating at many this is uh, overall. Yes sir, so, we are just discussing that with over one, the OTs are really world class. They are world class, they are really world class and uh, the staff is also very nice. Yes. So, yeah. do, you have a, do you have a surface view? Do you yes, have we view? have a surface view sir, we have a surface view. Okay, can you can you see me? I can't see whether you can see me or not. Can you see me? I, no. We can't see you, we are only seeing the skin view. Okay, the oh, you can see the skin view. So, yeah. with, with me, with me, hi, can you see me now? Yes, yes, hi, hi. Yeah, hello. Sir. Okay, thank you. So with me, yeah. I have Dr. Himanshu. Yes. I have Dr. Himanshu. Yeah, hi, Dr. Himanshu. Can... Ah. Hello. <laughs> and Dr. Suresh Goyal. Okay, Dr. Goyal, hi, hello. Dr. Hello. Goyal is there and uh, the anesthetist is Dr. Rake. And your name is now? Yeah, hello, sir. Hi. Dr. Kanta is there. Okay. And hello, of course, we have our OR assistants. And now I'll just uh, show you the surface view of the <laughs> yes. open session, yeah. right? So, yeah, we have been waiting for now almost uh, about 40 minutes, just waiting for you people to uh, join us. We, we are sorry to uh, keep you waiting, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. We, we, uh, it, it was not that, it was that yeah. there's a uh, robotic surgery going on in the other uh, OT, and I just wanted to point out that we were 
40 minutes ago and because of the docking time they will take a little more time to uh, get ready. Okay. The point is to highlight the difference between laparoscopic and robotic uh, surgeries. Mm -hmm. So the surface anatomy of the abdomen you see that is the foot. Umbilicus, yeah. Uh, surface area please. Can you see the surface area? Surface yes, we now? can see. We can see it in the... Okay, this is the foot end, yeah. right there. Mm. That is the head end. Mm. These are the five ports I have inserted. Can you see the surface markings over here? Can you please enlarge? Yeah, these are precisely at 18 view. centimeter from the pubic symptom. Yeah, 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 now we can see clear. These are precisely at 18 centimeter. Okay. This upper line is 18 centimeter from the pubic symphysis. Okay. The lower line is 15 centimeter. Okay. And we are trying to insert the ports in such a way that half of the instrument will be inside and half of the instrument will be outside. Excellent, excellent. Okay, yes, so yes. what that will do is, mm -hmm. that will give me a one to one is to one replication of the movement which is outside the uh, outside the abdomen with a one is to one uh, <coughs> replication inside the uh, abdomen. Excellent. Sir. Right? Yeah. There, are, there are five ports, okay. you can see. Okay. There are two 5 mm ports on the extreme sides. Mm -hmm. There are two 10 mm ports in the middle okay. and there is the, of course the camera port through which we are doing the uh, visualization inside the yes. abdomen. Yeah. The two NM, uh, 10 mm ports are going to be my right hand ports. Mm. When I am not using the right hand port, mm. Himanshu is going to be using it to assist me. Sometimes okay. in between I will take over the port from him but okay. mostly I will be doing an ipsilateral dissection okay. and that can good, place me in good ergonomic position so that I don't have joint pains later on when I finish the a surgery. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sir. We are we are using the Rubina 3D system. Okay. Uh, from uh, stores people, this is an excellent system. Okay. And uh, it is giving me a very good 3D view, and my assistants also a very good 3D view, and the depth perception is so good. Can you show me another instrument? That it doesn't take me a lot of effort to touch the tip of the instruments together at any place. Okay. So this is how I assess how you are how good you are placed how well you are placed with the 3d positioning of the instruments okay can so we get we'll the internal view please yes another thing which i'd like to show you yes is this uh, energy source which we'll be using okay so we'll be using the either the covidian this is the covidian 5 mm uh Maryland, yeah and there is the covidian 10 mm can you show me the 10 mm <laughs> instrument that is the 10 mm instrument uh, okay. or known as the atlas mm -hmm. or we will be using a thunder beach Okay. One of the two instruments, the thunder, thunder beam, uh, both of them are wonderful instruments okay. as far as laparoscopic surgery is concerned. Yes. So, with these instruments, mm -hmm. I don't intend to put any clip or any, uh, uh, any, yeah. any suture to control <coughs> yes. the hemostasis. Yeah. I think okay, this is, yeah, when it does, these uh, sealing instruments are enough to do a radical cystectomy. You do not need to put a clip or you do not need to put a suture. Excellent. Yeah. There are only three secrets to a laparoscopic cystectomy. One is the visualization. If you can get a 3D, nothing like it. Mm. Whether it is 2K or it is 4K. Mm. The, the second is the instrument which you are using, which is the hemostatic instrument. Mm. If your field is clean, you can do any amount of laparoscopy. And third is your cameraman. If you have got a good cameraman, yeah. then life becomes so easy that you start calling yourself a good surgeon. Definitely. So, can you, can you see the inside view Yes, now? now we can see the inside view. Okay, I'll just give you a little bit in orientation the surface yeah. anatomy. Yeah. This is the sacral promontory. This is a very good patient. Actually, he is on the other extreme because he is very thin. Yes. We would like a little bit of fats to make the planes, but yeah. still this is a very good case. Mm. So this patient had a had had some kind of a suprapubic surgery over the time. Mm. Just show me. And this is the point of the surgery which has been done. Okay. And I think this is the bladder which is adherent to the uh, suprapubic uh, uh, scar which was there. Yes. If I come down, this is the sacral promontory. Yeah. I think you can make out the right ureter right over we there. We can this see the, right the ureter, ureter clearly. Yes. Yeah. This is the common iliac. It is crossing the common iliac. The internal iliac will be somewhere. Okay. And this is the pulsation in the external iliac. Yes. Can you see the pulsation <laughs> in the external iliac over here? Uh -huh. then yes, we can the, see that. Yeah. Yeah. See the vast difference. These yes, are all our surface anatomy. Yeah. These are vast difference going down on the right hand side. Mm. Then, even on the left hand side, I have deliberately not mobilized the colon because it is keeping the sigmoid out of the pelvis right now. Yeah. So, okay. after I finish the right hand side, then I will move to the left hand side, mobilize the colon and show you similar anatomy. Okay. okay? So, you are so planning to do the lymph node dissection initially and after that? Uh, no, we will RC? do the lymph node dissection at the end Okay. because okay. there will be an automatically medial margin of the lymph node, uh, lymphadenectomy uh, template. Okay. Okay. Fine. I am sure. now planning to create three windows. Okay. See, there are two 
two avascular planes, major avascular planes. One is this, just behind the prostate. If you see carefully, this is the seminal vesicle over here. Yes, sir. Right? Can yeah. you make out? Mm -hmm. And this, I have to create one avascular plane over here. Okay. Right? This will be, this will be medial to the prostatic uh, pedicle. Okay. Okay. Yes. Then the, the second avascular plane is anterior to the bladder, the space of Redzius. Everybody knows that and it is the surgeon's lifeline in most of the pelvic surgeries. Yes. That plane will be between the, the uh, this uh, obliterated umbilical ligament and superior to the vas. So this point is the avascular plane. Okay. I will enter over here and I will hit the pubic bone and then I will take down the fat just lateral to it. Yeah. And the third plane I will create just lateral to the ureter. This is again an avascular plane. Yes. This will be between the superior vesicle pedicle and the inferior vesicle pedicle mm -hmm. which has the prostatic pedicle. Okay. So that is my plan to first isolate the uh, prostatic pedicle, then isolate the vesicle pedicle and then just do repeat it on the other side and drop the entire blood. Okay. Okay. So I am starting now. Yeah. So your initial incision is on a ureter, you are trying to... Oh, cautery is not working. Hmm. Bi bipolar is not working. I'm just... I am making this incision just lateral to the ureter. Can we connect to the other OR? Pardon? Yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. Sooth, we are with you, we are watching you while we go to the other OR with the robotic. Okay. Okay, go on. Uh, are we connected to the... Uh, to the work three, where the robotic is going on. <laughs> Can you please connect audio from OT3? <laughs> Sir, are we audible? We are speaking from the auditorium. OR3 Hello Hello Yeah, hello yeah. Yeah. Good morning sir uh, Good morning all, we are welcome you to the robotic OR Yes we are, we are here for live presentation of a robot assisted radical cystectomy with intercorporeal urine diversion uh, On console is Dr. Rajesh Hilavat sir and assisting is Dr. Sachin and Dr. Shakti. Yeah. Uh, a brief history about the case. Uh, it's a 42 year old male, not a backward chewer and apprehensive, presented with complaints of painless gross hematuria associated with amorphous clots. On examination, general condition is fair, ECOG score is zero, and uh, uh, general, uh, no, no uh, uh, positive physical finding of result. Sir. On investigation, uh, uh, his hemoglobin and KFT whether are within normal limits, sir. Uh, on ultrasound, there is a 44 into 90 mm um, mass involving the right posterior lateral wall of urinary bladder with internal vas vascularity suggestive of malignancy. He underwent TYBT in August with uh, hysteropathy suggestive of muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma uh, T2. Yeah. Uh, Can you give a little brief? Yes. Substantive urothelial biopsy was uh, negative, sir. Now, the uh, current CT suggestive of 4 to 4, 4 into 2 into 2 polypoidal mass and, uh, in the right lateral wall with the urinary bladder. Right view appears to be free, sir. This is the CT of this patient. Okay, okay, fine, we got it. Huh. Okay, so all you found was a growth and an egg, uh, and a lymph node also. Okay. Now, sir, I am handing over to the Dr. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Elavat, sir. Good morning, Dr. Elavat. I am Dr. Chabla. Can you get the internal picture from OR3? The, the intra-abdominal pictures from OR3? Hello. Yeah. Am, am I audible? <coughs> Are you audible, sir? So this is Dr. Prashant from Ames Bhubaneswar. We can see you working inside, sir. Huh? Yes. Yeah. So you know, uh, we that's the pity so Yes. You can you can see that we have taken quite a lot of tissue around. Okay. Uh, 
uh, dissected it till the bladder here. So we can disconnect now or we can disconnect later. Okay. So we'll do that later on. Here, let's go on to the left side. So, so sir, is there any reference in which cases would you like to disconnect early and which cases you keep it? No, it's a, it's the most, um, I use, I usually disconnect late. Okay. But, but you can disconnect it right now. Once the particles are defined okay. and all the structures are defined, I do it that time. Okay, sir. Sometimes early disconnection helps in some kind of hydro distance in urine remains and maybe suturing becomes easier. So uh, your voice, that's the ureter on the... Yeah. The now, yes, sir, we can see that. I saw that on the right side you have dissected it right close to the vesicularic junction. Are you yeah. going to leave a part of the distal ureter or are you going to take it right up to the... We will do the same on this side as well. Okay. Very good anatomy. So, yeah, we uh, can see all the structures, we can see yeah, the ureter so, here. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent cases have been selected by the hosts. So they have. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? I think they can ask. Uh, we have got a mic on the floor. Audience will enjoy this because on on one side we are seeing this manigratal dissection with robot, and other side we are seeing it with laparoscopic. In pretty sorry, read for our eyes. Good. So the laparoscopy is going on on the other side. Yes, other side exactly same step. We are okay. looking at the right ureteral dissection, and you are doing the left ureteral dissection. Okay. Good. Sir, how do you make sure adequate adventitia is around the ureters? So, you know, you can see the fat. You can, you can see all the fat that I have taken. Okay. I have not gone too close to the ureter at any point. Okay. <laughs> you, you can see the, all the fat and everything. With adventitia intact, how long uh, will the ureter get its supply? Is it 8 That's cm? That's the cycle junction on this side. Okay. Yeah, we have reached almost this side. So now let's come up here posteriorly. So we'll go for the posterior dissection now. <coughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sudhir from PJ Chandigarh. Yeah. Uh, like uh, uh, in uh, in what type of patients? Like suppose if you have a patient who is having a T3 disease on imaging. Yeah. Uh, will Will you consider doing an ONB in such type of cases, or you always select cases who are like T two only? <laughs> we uh, the case selection is it should be indication for cystectomy. So you know the I mean, sir, usually uh, the usually usually T three cases would go for uh, new adjuvant T before they are taken up. Yeah. No, sir, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, like uh, uh, there is a concern that the patient might need an adjuvant uh, radiotherapy in the post-operative setting based on the final biopsy. 
So, yeah. so uh, when you have a new bladder, you know, I mean, uh, you don't feel like uh, considering radiotherapy in such cases because you have a, uh, you don't want the pouch to uh, have any effect of radiation on that. So, that was my question. So, like in, if you are thinking that on CD, if there is some local advan advancement is there, so do you consider uh, doing a uh, win in that? No, I didn't get your question. My question is like, uh, if you have a preoperative, uh, on based on imaging, if you think that it is uh, locally advanced, like P3 at least, yeah. so will you consider doing going for a ONB in, in such cases? Oh, the, we, we will give them new adjuvant, and then obviously, you know, if the indication is there, we'll do the system. So. Sir, how does this posterior dissection differ when it, does it differ between radical prostatectomy and cystectomy? Yeah. So it's the same. So, you know, these are the two seminal vesicles. Yeah. You can see the vas there okay. and the seminal vesicles. Yes. And uh, you, you are holding it here? No. Thank you so much, sir, for a great discussion. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Prusavanu Nayak, Additional Professor, Department of Urology, Ames Delhi. And I would please request all the chairpersons to proceed towards the right of the auditorium for a group photograph and mementos. Thank you so much. Now I would like to invite Dr. Prusavanu Nayak, Additional Professor, Department of Urology, Ames Delhi. Dr. Deepak Ranjan, Consultant Neurologist, Yashoda Hospital, Sikandrabad. So, Dr. Kajendra Saxena, Consultant Neurologist, Bikaner. Dr. Atul Khandelwal, uh, Professor BPS Government Medical College, Sonipat. Dr. Ritesh Goel, Consultant Neurologist, Samrita Hospital, <coughs> Paridabad. And Dr. Pradeep Sharma, Consultant Neurologist, Vinayaka Hospital, Jodhpur, to take their place on the stage. Uh, good morning, Dr. Alavad. This is Dr. Nayak from AMS Delhi. I just like to discuss again the same question that Dr. Sudhir was asking regarding whether to do a neobladder in patients with T3 disease. And obviously, you know, neobladder neo would depend on, you know, uh, uh, not the T3 or say it's whether the urethra is clean or not. Exactly. Actually, that is what I want to ask you. Uh, yeah. Sudhir, so, how commonly... Do you My hand is getting stuck somewhere. Radiotherapy, adjuvant radiotherapy following cystectomy in two patients. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we correcting the plane posteriorly, posterior to the prostate. My hand is, right hand is getting stuck somewhere. Uh, uh, not that we routinely go for adjuvant radiotherapy because it's uh, occasionally done once several whenever oh, yes. you have some recurrence. Suppose uh, yeah. uh, there are few <laughs> patients which I have seen, like uh, uh, the <laughs> surgeon has decided for a new bladder. And of course, there is intraoperatively found that there is a, a difficulty because of slight lo local advancement of the tumor there. But uh, since obviously ONB is such a thing, the patients are they are, want to have ONB, so th that was done. And in few patients which I have seen that they developed in the post-operative period local recurrence in the bed Lens after two. six months or some, so within six months or so. And then at that time, obviously, re resecting is a difficult question because you already have a, a neobladder there. So the radiotherapy people obviously think of uh, planning uh, radiation in such cases. Yes. To, so to case ask. selection, uh, my question was actually that selecting a good case for a ONB like uh, uh, based on the preoperative imaging should be there always. Otherwise, you can have a problem later on. Uh, that is yeah. what uh, my question uh, uh, I, 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 I think now I am clear what you are asking. You know, there are two parts of the procedure. One is a cystectomy and second would be diversion. Yeah. So, you know, and T3 disease, urethral involvement possibility, they would affect the uh, type of diversion that you would be doing. Yes, sir. My right hand is getting stuck. I think the literature actually says lymph node positivity and T3 disease, this actually doesn't affect the diversion time. More, yeah, most of these patients would anyway require new adjuvant chemotherapy if the lymph node is comes out to be positive. But then you never know which patient is going to have a recurrence in the post op in the local area. So T3 and the lymph node positivity, they do not contraindicate to do a neobladder. The only thing that prevents you to do if the urethral margin is positive. 
So in that case, you do not do it. If it is prostatic stoma or the distal margin is positive. Okay. So that's the posterior dissection done. So we we'll let's cut the. Yeah. Because the radiation oncology. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. As you can see, neither Dr. Sapunshu nor Dr. Alabad is doing lymph node dissection fast. So, Dr. Alabad, do, do, do you routinely do cystectomy fast, then lymph node dissection? Because there are some surgeons those who will do a lymph node dissection fast, then do, do a cystectomy. Uh, Dr. Alabad, can you hear us? <laughs> okay. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, this is I am Sopan from yeah. OR2, the radical cystectomy laparoscopic. Yeah. And the inferior pedicle has been has gone. That is the seminal vesicle. Can you see that? Yes, yes. Right there, the vas and the seminal vesicle complex. And here I am lateral to the prostate. Almost this is the levator and I. I am almost into the endopelvic fascia, a little bit more I will go, so I will be inside the endopelvic uh, uh, fascia. So these yeah. are the last attachments of the lateral attachments of the prostate which are left. So my inferior pedicle is finished. I have divided the ureter, just ureter please. So I have just divided the ureter and I have used this uh, uh, thread with the hemlock clip and divided the ureter over here. Right? Yeah. Now I am going to go to the avascular window, the third window. The two windows we combined lateral to the ureter. And all, then this is the vas deferens, this is the uh, median umbilical ligament, and this is where we are going, we are going to divide the peritoneum. Water is not working. Chal pada, chal pada, chal pada, chal pada. Yeah, just hold it. Yeah. So, as soon as you divide the peritoneum, you are in the avascular zone, you will hit. Hit the pubic bone, he said. Pubic bone, yeah. Yeah, just, you hit the pubic bone right there. So that is the pubic bone. Just move, just inside the pubic bone. That is a avascular space of radius. You are medial, you are lateral to the median umbilical ligament. So you just remain lateral. The entire pedicle will start falling medially. Can you see the pedicle lining yeah, up? Yeah, can itself? see that, yes. Yeah. So just go over here, I'll just... And I will just enter here, that is the avascular portion, I will try not to insult anybody. And okay, that is the space of radius and we have opened up, this is the entire right pedicle in front of you now, right? Yeah. Now we'll just narrow it down, we'll just make it a lot more cleaner. We'll go right down to the endopelvic fascia, we'll just do whatever hemostasis is required. You have a very thin patient. <laughs> ah, yes, that is there, thanks to Gautam for that. Yeah. Yeah, this is a 74 Yeah. So typically <laughs> I would say it would be slightly easier in a uh, little bit fatty patients. Uh, and right. uh, in obese patients, there is a slight manipulation issue is there, but otherwise the principles remain the same. So that is the pedicle which you have, and you can start uh, cutting this pedicle, and we need to cut till down there. Why do you say it's easier in patients who are little obese? Because you got good fat prints. You don't have, you're not scared of uh, perforating the bladder or this thing. This plane is much easier. Uh, development is there. Ponyra cycle complete. Change kar do yaar iska. You routinely do lymph node dissection after cystectomy? Yeah, we will do the lymph node dissection after the cystectomy. Right? So, niche se dikhana jara. These two windows will connect down there. Yeah, yeah. You see? Can you yes, see the yes, window yes, yes. we have connected? Very nicely seen. The inside, niche se dikhai, niche se dikhai. And, yeah, that is the 
window which we have connected that was the and you see i'm putting the other instrument below that so that you can see yeah we can see that the pedicle is now clear can you see the tip of the instrument right yeah, there yeah. yeah so that is the pedicle this whole thing is the pedicle uh, over here that whole thing is the pedicle all i have to do is to now divide this pedicle i'll be using the atlas uh, to do that right just cut across all the way देखो एटलस कनेक्ट कर दीजिए प्लीज उतनी देर यही दे दीजिए लेट्स नॉट स्टॉप ये कौन सा है रेडी एटलस एटलस रेडी सो दिस इज दिन एम एम एटलस या लाइक अशो एटलस It is like a short atlas. I think you can see it on the screen. 10 mm, 37 centimeter. As the Manchu calls it, the Brahmastra. Suction is being held by you, or suction the, the assistant is putting the suction. The suction is being uh, manipulated by Himanshu, you and he. Right yeah, these both instruments they belong to me. The other two instruments are with Himanshu. Okay. So we are using all our hands, and we are getting a good uh, uh, coordination inside. And I am very happy. Himanshu is doing wonderfully well. He's already so much experienced in all these cases. Can you come closer, Suresh? Yeah, this is last bit left. You are not putting any clips, as you have told in the no, beginning. No, we'll we'll not put any clips. Not that not is the end of every. What is Dr. Alavad is doing? Clipping on the other side. In yes. So uh, I don't think I need the clips uh, right now. So this is the end of every fascia. Right there, we will come anteriorly, divide it, get into the lateral surface of the prostate, and then divide the rest of the pedicle when we are over there. Is that okay? Yeah. So the right pedicle has been done, and the bladder is now hanging just uh, on the right side, just by these few adhesions. Yeah. I expect some adhesions to be there anteriorly because he was operated someplace a few many years back. So I'll use that to my advantage. Let it keep the bladder up. Can you change to the Maryland again, please? So now we come to the left side. Same principle we are going to follow on the left side. Now thunder beat use कर लेते हैं। हाँ, we'll use the thunder beat on the left side just to show. हाँ, yeah, this is the thunder beat. चलता कैसे भैया? बता दें। बस seal and cut and seal, right? Thunder beat is ready. जंगली बिना तेल के Nice. बेटा तो आपका स्क्रीन के रास्ते में आ रहा है राकेश स्क्रीन के रास्ते में आ रहा है कुछ है नहीं यहाँ पे इसको भी कर दो The thunder beat also is a wonderful instrument. I love this, uh, this. Okay, let's get it down. Let's mobilize it. Uh, let's do the cattles. Okay. 
Yeah, hold it. Oops. Are you going to off the screen, sir? Can Who is this? Can you move sir. to the robotic OT, please? I'm sorry, the screen has been turned off. It's okay. Can you connect to the robotic OT, please? Switch off again? No, no, it's switch off again. We can't actually see anything from your OT, Dr. Shopan. Yeah, I know somehow the, somebody pulled out the electrical supply for the Rubina. I don't think you can guard against that, but uh, I think they are just uh, loading up the Rubina again. I also cannot see anything. I think while they fix it, we should move to the robotic theater, please. Yeah, that's a good idea. Anyone connect us to the robotic theater, please? Hmm. Yes, Guru. Is that ready? Yeah. You are back with you actually now. Mirko, oh, that's all. Michela vessel both pass it. I just want a clear view. Uh, that that is there. Okay. Ha, no, no. This vessel is. Can you see on left hand side? This vessel is. Ha, it's here. Ha, wait. So, one more. Gautam. Hello, uh, Dr. Alavat, are we connected to the robotic theater? Dr. Alavad, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. Can you just say, explain what exactly you are doing that two step? Uh, we saw you were actually using a vascular stapler maybe for, to divide the pedicle. Yes. So, you know, what I have done is that I, we have taken the, uh, uh, the ligament and the superior vesicle artery, clipped it, and rest of the pedicle, now we can see here, uh, that, you know, you can see that it's going to the tip of the vesicle there and yeah. rectum is posteriorly mm -hmm. and and you can see that yeah, yeah it's yeah. moving freely okay and, and the ureters are still not divided the ureters are still attached no, i haven't i haven't yet divided so, yeah so this is on this side and this side so uh, i'm just holding it Now we'll fire it. How do you fire it? I'm using it for the first time, robotic stepper. Okay. So please excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So what size of the vascular stepper is it? No. The SFC blue is this one. Achha. Unclamping, clamp, so, Achha. so then what do I do?
Yes, you can remove the stapler. Give the scissor back to me. So now we should take care of the ureter also. Just put, uh, do we have a clip with the thread? So how many of you believe that uh, uh, this ureter should be sent for frozen? We routinely do not send uh, ureter for frozen section. Yeah. The literature doesn't support it also. Exactly, exactly. So you know, we used to send it earlier. That's exactly the answer that I was How much does the stapler cost? Uh, each stapler. It costs zero to all. So Jodhpur Institute. Zero to Jodhpur. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used it because it cost probably had a lot. Okay. I have used it for the first time. Thanks. Thanks to Gautam. So that's the right side done now. I bring the clip. You want to put another one or is it okay? I'll, I'll put another one here at the junction here. Yeah. Good. No, it's not done. Huh. See the part of the DVC maybe those are there. Yeah, that's the, the that's the fascia. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as we have gone below. Can you show the seminar basically? Yeah, you yeah. should go below that. Yeah. The clip lay because the vessels are already taken care of. You just put the clip here.
You can fire another one here. Then we have it. Yeah, scissor Nikal. Good position. Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, this is Dr. Ritesh from Amrita Hospital, sir. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, regarding port position, sir. Do you keep it similar to prostate surgery, uh, radical prostate okay. or uh, it is, uh, or some port is kept higher up to allow the maneuvering of uh, stapler, sir? Well, there, there are two differences. One is that uh, the fourth arm is on the left side in prostate acne. It's on the right side for this. Number one and number two, ports are little higher. Third thing is that the right uh, port is strapped to support the stapler. Okay, sir. A clip here. So that's the neurovascular bundle. You are preserving the neurovascular bundle? Yeah, so we are preserving the, he's, for, he's a young patient. Yeah. So, you know, we have, we have not used any energy here and we have separated, it's an intrafacial dissection yes, yes, yes. for the yes. neurovascular bundle. So we'll go for a high uh, release here as well so, so that, you know, we can give him whatever, it, I'm very sure he'll have a good erection after, uh, after. Okay, so that's the right side done. I'll ask Sachin to do the left side. Sachin is, uh, has been with me for last seven years and you know, he's uh, uh, learned everything from me and now I'm learning everything from him. Sachin, coming over. Come. I'll come back once we have the prostate. I'm ready for your questions if you have. You said you have never used a stapler, but what till you use? I have never used a robotic stapler. No, I am saying for robotic surgery, you do use harmonic or uh, what? No, we I use uh, harmonic, but I use a standard stapler, that Covidian and uh, uh, Ethicon. Okay. So, we, the blue loads we use. So the same thing we would do on the left side as well. Yeah. So the lateral dissection, posterior is already done. Lateral dissection, dissect division of the vas, reaching the pelvic fascia, dividing the pelvic fascia, and then taking care of the bundle on this side. The ureter is still not divided in the right side. Ureter is still not divided still on the right side. Yeah. So, the, like we divided once we had defined <laughs> the pedicle, we'll do the same on this side. Mm -hmm. Just before dividing the uh, pedicle, vascular pedicle.
said in the morning, if for all T3 patients, this patient should receive new adjuvant. Or do you routinely give new adjuvant to all patients, those who are oh, now, now, now we give almost to all the patients. We definitely advise them, we send them to a hospital. And patients who are unfit because of uh, the bad renal functions, or uh, uh, the, the patients who are uh, you know, unwilling for chemotherapy, we can take them. But otherwise, uh, every patient we give uh, new adjuvant for three more, three cycles before we go ahead. Mm -hmm. So good to see. type of when we were planning to do on this patient? Dr. Alabad? Yes, sir. Hello? Hello? Yeah. What type of uh, when we were planning on this patient? What type of diversion? Diversion, yes. Uh, I think we will go ahead with a new plan. Uh, he's a young patient. The anatomy is good. Yeah? And uh, we plan to make a new plan. What type of new plan do you want to make? Uh, actually, you know, uh, we make a standard that you, you know, that uh, Peter Wickland and uh, these people make. Peter Wickland. Okay. Alex Motry. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's not a fancy large bladder, but I think it works very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gives very, very good results and simple to make. Yeah. So in which the first thing you do is a urethrophysical anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least what Dr. Peter Wickland shows, it looks yeah. easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's... Yeah. Actually, and, uh, you know, I have seen him quite a few times. It's surprising that, you know, even in fat patients and things, he says that he has never had an occasion when he had to abandon uh, a new bladder okay. because of the shortage of peasantry. <coughs> he can always somehow manage to, you know, uh, pull the, by using his tricks of pulling, pulling, uh, peasantry release, okay. and he can al almost always reach uh, for the urethra. Uh, it's it's difficult sometimes. Yeah. I have abandoned uh, some, some time, you know, when I found that the tension would be too much. Because, you know, it also means that you have to give an end result without tension. So if you even, you can be, the, happier, the happiest day after cystectomy is the first post-operative, uh, first post-operative, you know. Yeah. When everything looks good, you enjoy, you were just talk, talking the same in the evening. It's the third day onwards that uh, the patient is not passing platers and the abdominal is just ending and he's started vomiting and all those things have started, so, you know. So, if you have to celebrate, celebrate on the first two days after session. <laughs> so, that's why I'll do it today, celebrate in the evening, leave tomorrow. <laughs> but he's a good patient, I think he should do well. How commonly you have seen structure of following neobladder, robotic neobladder, ureter intestinal structure? Ureter intestinal, uh, you know, I was, I have been a big fan of Wallace. So with Wallace, I almost never I used to have, never, almost never there was a structure. But uh, my boys here, they are more fond of Brickard. And, uh, and ever since that has started, we have seen started seeing some structure. Okay. Uh, left side, left side angling sometimes can cause problems. Yeah. Uh, but but structures usually 
they, they, they don't occur if uh, you maintain the uretric anatomy and uh, you know uh, take the attention of the especially of the left ureter band. And do you commonly use endosynin green to see the vascularity of the ureter? Uh, say that again. Endosynin green to see the vascularity of the ureter. No, no, no. ICG. Unfortunately, uh, that's a big uh, thing. That uh, that will be wonderful thing for everybody to have, and that's the advantage of the newer systems. You know, I have, I work on an SI <laughs> which does not have uh, uh, the first line. and. Uh, for, you know, even my second, uh, another very important surgery is that we do a robotic transplants. Yeah. I think there also, it will be wonderful to have an ICG to help you see the anatomy and uh, vascular. Mm -hmm. So yes, well, ICG, if you have, it will go very well. It will help you a lot in reducing the complications and vascularity and in these structures. Yes. yes. You get taking the stripper? Mm. I think he's he'll finish with the clips itself. Yeah, it looks like he doesn't want to waste the stuff. Yeah. He doesn't have to, he's a miser. No, no, me, me can be lower, yes. Ha, ha. We'll certainly <coughs> use IC, sir. For the, for the bowel loop, okay. uh, we'll certainly use it. Yes. Now maybe you can divide the unit on both sides. What time did we start? 10.04. Okay. So it's 10.54, 50 minutes. I think in another 10 minutes we should be yeah. able to complete this technique. Yes, yes. Which was our aim, you know, one hour for cystectomy, one hour for lymphadenectomy, and two hours for... Two hours for diversion? For the diversion. So it's good you have seen stapler on one side. Yeah, stapler on one side and clips on the other side. And the clips are on. And there is no <laughs> clipping and stapler on the laparoscopic side. They're using energy. only energy device. Energy, energy. Yeah. Of the That's the bundle now. Yeah. 
if that's a prostate case. And one more clip you will need. Yeah, in this angle. Clip, please. <coughs> You have to remove your hand. I, yes. Good, good one. That's it. Don't put traction on the pedicle. Talabad? Yeah. Um, regarding lymph node dissection, what is your uh, common practice? Do you do standard lymph node dissection or extended lymph node dissection? Actually, you know, uh, there is a lot of controversy. You know, the extent of lymph node dissection is only an uh, expert recommendation. So, uh, I think the uh, most prudent lymph node dissection, number one, that it has to be done. Number two, it has to be done bilaterally. Uh, lymph node type one and type two, that is common iliac, external iliac, and obturator. They should always be done. And whether para aortic, it can be extended to para aortic by some enthusiasts, but that is what I don't now do. So common iliac, presacral, uh, external iliac, obturator. So you go till the bifurcation of the aorta? Hmm? You go till the bifurcation of the outer. We will go till the bifurcation. We'll go till the bifurcation. But uh, not above it. So that's the extended lymph node dissection that you do. Yeah, that's extended. But no, there, there is... Uh, people include type 3 also. Go high up. Yeah, that's super extended till the origin of the inferior magentic artery. <laughs> yes. Hello? Hello? Can anybody Hello? hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so, uh, so the bladder has been devascularized completely. Yeah. So there are some adhesions anteriorly. I'm currently in the process of releasing that. But just to show you, I have just filled about 200 ml saline in the bladder. That will help the anterior abdominal wall make my dissection a lot easier. Okay. Okay, so just to show you laterally over here, this is the left uh, uh, gutter which has been cleared. That is the prostate, lateral surface of the prostate. Yes, yes, yes. That is the endopathic fascia. Yes. Yeah, we, this we will divide anteriorly and we mobilize the bladder. Okay, uh, I, I take it. It has, it has gone all the way. Can you empty the bladder now, please? Can you see that is the lateral yeah. surface prostate? We can see all the way it has been mobilized right uh, to the bottom, yes. almost. Yes, yes, yes. Same we have done on the right hand side. Yes. Basically, your bladder is now hanging. Now, bladder is just hanging like a pear. Mm -hmm. Like apple from the tree. Let's I am now going to plan to pick it. Yeah. Right? Can you see now? Yeah. yeah. This is just hanging. Here. Now I'll just keep dividing here. And uh, the weight of the water, the urine which we are the water which we have put inside the bladder, that is dragging the bladder down. And uh, because patient has undergone a supravivic surgery, you can see these dense adhesions right over there. Right? Specularity if not please. Agyao, Agyao Suresh. Can you see these dense adhesions here? Yes. These planes, these are probably because of his previous uh, suprapubic surgery, surgery, which is yes. undergone, and I'm just releasing those yeah, adhesions. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. <coughs> really and we are... Sati Api Okay. No, you have a pubic symphysis on it. It's a bad idea. 
यहीं पे मोस्टली जो है वो ब्लड रेंज इंजरी छोड़ दीजिए ब्लड रेंज खाली कर दीजिए प्लीज सुन लीजिए यस इट्स ऑल अडेरेंट एंड डिफिकल्ट हां या ग्रेट जॉब स्पेशलर रेडी उसमें डॉक्टर शोपन यस व्हाट इज द टाइप ऑफ डाइवर्जन दैट यू इंटेंड टू डू इन दिस पेशेंट Oh well, this is a 74-year-old guy, so, so uh, and uh, he's a chronic smoker. Okay. Uh, I am not sure about the renal functions. So the plan is, uh, otherwise, this was a very good case for a new bladder, and I would have done the Dr. Rawls bladder. We just pull it out, do a picture pot. Uh, yeah. Construction. Uh, Dr. Shopan, in the meantime, we actually would need, <coughs> like to move to the QRBT theater. Yes, yes, just ready with that case. <coughs> sure. While we are watching you, we'll just move to the Tiwari the Theatre. Okay. Bladder is stuck entirely. Are you connected to the Tiwari T O T? Okay, spatula ready. There are there are no spatula. Thank you, chairpersons, for the eliminating discussion. Uh, I would request school. all the chairpersons to kindly proceed to the right of the auditorium for a group photograph and memento. Holding it with your finger, right? This will give you much finer control. Ah, just just take a photo. So you know how much you are putting in, putting out. Otherwise, if you try to hold it, it keeps shaking like that. So you just uh, just stabilize it. I call upon stage. डॉक्टर मृणल पावा कंसल्टेंट न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट सर गंगाराम हॉस्पिटल दिल्ली डॉक्टर करणदीप गुलेरिया रोबोटिक फेलो इन न्यूरो ऑन्कोलॉजी एट मैक्स दिल्ली डॉक्टर सुधीर देवाना एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन न्यूरोलॉजी फ्रॉम पीजीआई चंडीगढ़ डॉक्टर जितेंद्र चौहान कंसल्टेंट न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट श्री राम हॉस्पिटल जोधपुर can start dropping the bladder now and this is all five protect issue i'll just incise here am i audible from or1 okay good morning everyone welcome to live demo operative demonstration from or1 the second case for today okay, is planned for conventional drg rpt operating no, surgeon no, is dr no, amlesh no, sir this tissue is left the case is 55 year old gentleman chronic smoker without any comorbidities and past surgical history His chief complaint was a painless gross hematuria with okay. passage of a mostly blood clot since last one month. His uh, on examination, his general condition is fair, well built, ECOG zero, oh, oh, no pallor, ectrus, stenosis, lymphadenopathy, or edema. Parabdomen is soft, non-tender, no palpable lump, and genitalia examination is normal. DRE anatomy oh, normal. Grade one prostate, firm, non-tender, non-nodular, rectal mucosa is free. That is the investigation. Uh, okay. Hemoglobin is twelve point three. Total count is seven seven thousand seven hundred, and the PSA is two point nine five max. KFT and LFT are within normal limit. PSA is point seven five. He underwent a CT, uh, CT urography on fifteenth of March, okay. which showed uh, in urinary bladder, yes, sir, yes, 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 of affecting the right vuj with extension into bladder nail with indistinct plain with prostate these are the ct images patient underwent right side pcn placement on 17th of march diagnosis is ub mass with right pcn in c2 and plan is conventional tubercular thank you thank you open mic Now I'm now I'm at handing my mic to Dr. Amlesh sir. Sir, oh, oh, which OT are we connected now? Right now. This is OT one. Can you hear me? Hello. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. So this uh, is Dr. Sudhir. Yes, yes. Good morning, Sudhir. Yes, I could make out. I could make out your voice. I, I still have your voice. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, as a part of this A to Z of the Urothelial Cancer uh, Conference, 
uh, the initial plan was to start with the conventional TRBT, and so now we are uh, going to begin with the conventional TRBT. Although you know it may be called a, but I can tell you that it is from A to almost almost T or U V you can say, because X Y Z is a, for a small percentage and for a small number of centers. Because radical cystectomy, neobladders will obviously not be done in most of the centers. And for most of the centers, a TRBT is something which is uh, done most commonly for bladder cancer. The case that they have selected for me is actually a very, should be an easy case, uh, although one should not say before beginning any case, uh, because uh, this is right in the posterior wall and it's a big tumor. And it is obviously muscle invasive here. And if you don't do a complete TRBT, then that is also acceptable. I'll just begin with the cystoscopy. Can you see my screen? Can you uh, see my cystoscopy? We are unable to see the endoscopic view, sir, actually. You are getting the endoscopic view? No, no, sir. We are not getting the endoscopic view at all. Yeah, now we are able to, able to see. Yeah. Uh, please change to the endoscopic view. <coughs> yes, sir. We are able to see now. Okay. I am just about to begin. Let's see. So, sir, are you planning a complete TRB or just a biopsy or uh, what are you planning? Actually, he is a 55 year old male and he has been a chronic smoker, but he should be a candidate for radical cystectomy. So, a complete TRBT is not essential. Here you can see that there is beginning, it's looking fleshy. Yeah, it's looking rather fleshy. And. Okay. It's almost entering so, the bladder, uh, the prostate yeah. as well. Yes, yes, yes. So all this is a tumor. The prostate also seems to be involved. And it's a big tumor. It's a very big tumor. There are in fact multiple tumors. There are in fact multiple tumors. Uh, at least three big, big tumors I can see. This is one big one. This is another big one. And there are small ones also. Oh, so many small ones also. And yeah. Okay, so this is a. In fact, even if it turns out to be non muscle invasive, he should be a candidate for radical cystectomy unless he is uh, refusing. Uh, because to control this massive load, even if it is low grade and even if it is uh, non muscle invasive, is, is a challenging task. Although it is possible, it is possible. It is, it is not that it is impossible, it is possible. We can do it in two or three sittings and that is possible. How long is the history? But, uh, consider, uh, but considering so the right the, side hydrouretron nephrosis and that to the back. Yes, 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 yes. The likelihood is that this will turn out to be muscle invasive. But it is, yeah, you, you look at it. I will uh, show you some videos also later on. You will look at it, fronds are not very well formed. There are fronds, so it's not a totally solid, ne completely necrotic type of tumour. This would be amongst the mis muscle invasive ones, uh, the less aggressive variety. The so called, although you know, differentiation between luminal variety and basal variety is based on molecular markers. But grossly also, this would be like the endoluminal variety rather than the basal variety. If one has to find a gross correlation of the uh, micro of the molecular features. Okay, so we have seen sir, it. I have a question, sir. The, the tumor yes, which we have seen entering into the prostatic urethra, is it a yes. separate tumor from the other one, or is it a yes. continue, continuous tumor from from the? Actually, upper? there are two separate tumors involving the prostatic urethra, there is one that is coming from the left side and there is one which is from the right side. So, there are two separate tumours which are involved in the prostatic urethra. The right tumour is also, it's involving the, uh, the median lobe and the left side tumour is involving the left lobe. <coughs> okay, so I think what we will do is, we will go ahead with the resection of this mass the one that is protruding into the prostate dot also has to be taken <coughs> care of. And we will not do a complete TRBT because he should be a candidate for radical cystic. Yeah, fully okay. Agree. Fully agree, sir. 
and also for uh, right nephew urethectomy and uh, left urethrostomy. Okay, so we'll go ahead with the plan. You can go to the other theatres and keep on watching in between. Can we be connected to the robotic OT, please? Are, are we connected to robotic OT now? Radical cystectomy part is done uh, in your OT right now. Yeah. So, uh, so you are sending the urethral margin, sir, now for frozen? We are sending the, we are sending the urethral mucosa for frozen. Okay. So by the time we do the lymphatectomy, we expect the result to come. And uh, if it is positive, then we do urethrectomy and a di conduit. So meanwhile, we will be doing the lymph node dissection part. Yeah, we will do the lymph node dissection in the morning. Uh, regard, regarding the uretric biopsy, previously some uh, somebody raised the question of sending uh, ma uretric margins. Uh, we have an experience. I have we have done robotic cystectomy in one case, just to share the outcome of that case. So uh, after we didn't send any uh, uretric margin intraoperatively. But in the post operative and once the biopsy came out, the biopsy came as that uh, one of the uretric margin or uh, the, the uretric margin on the specimen side was having CIS changes. Yeah. So subsequently, this patient, uh, after three years, actually he developed uh, uh, hemorrhage <coughs> through the conduit. Uh, he, uh, we did a robotic cystectomy and intracorporeal ileal conduit in that case. And he developed a recurrence at the uh, uh, uretro uh, ileal uh, anastomotic site. So in that case, he had CIS actually. So yeah. we, we also routinely don't do uh, the send the margins for biopsy, but if you have a tumor which is sitting on the uretric orifice, and uh, or is it like uh, uh, T3 lesion or anything? In such cases, we tend to send a margin on that side uh, and then do. So uh, that is our policy of uh, uh, sending the biopsies. So you, we are uh, ligating the DVC now. Yeah, I, I'm just taking the DVC, although we had, uh, it was well in control, yeah, yeah. because, you know, uh, there was, and actually it's a air seal which does the trick, because, you know, with the air seal, the pressure is maintained despite suction. So you see, there is not much of a bleeding problem. Uh, can, we, can you tell us the suture materials of this one? Is this is a V-lock 3 V-lock 3 yeah. yeah. What do you have, Marsant? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. So, can you see, <laughs> uh, we have also sort of uh, fulgurated or burnt the DVC. You can see the apex of the prostate on both the sides, and that's the urethra uh, right there. So, we did not bother ligating it or any such thing. Can somebody give a bit of perineal pressure on you? Go ahead, sir. Swapan, sir, we are you. We are yeah. listening you. So you can see, I have mobilized the the, the yes, right uh, prostatic pedicle is left over here. Good. The left prostatic pedicle is already done. There are some uh, retro prostatic adhesions are there. Oops. Uh, and uh, just can we clean the camera quickly? See down the rubber. Yeah. So right, that is the urethra. That is the. Post, uh, I will just be cutting open the urethra right now after releasing the apex on the. So, uh, uh, how did you tackle the DVC, sir? Uh, I just, you just use used the, the bipolar. energy device only. Yeah, yeah, I use the energy device. So you can see the catheter coming up now. Yeah. Just release the apex on all the sides. 
पास में अवेलेबल है Why not to to use a a just a sharp scissor to cut the at this level? Yeah, whatever you like, not a problem. It's just a cutting, so कुछ खास no, I mean uh, uh, there's no technology involved in cutting except well whether you want to use a cautery, just because I had it in my hand. So I have uh, clipped the catheter and I'll be using it as a traction device now. ओके विद दिस रॉन्ग सीजर इज देयर ये नहीं काटेगी भी जब दूसरी सीजर चाहिए होगी फोक सीजर से नहीं होगा आई हैव जस्ट होल्ड इट लाइक दैट ग्रेट जॉब मच सॉरी मच यू आर डूइंग अ ग्रेट जॉब देयर द कैमरा वर्क इज परफेक्ट कैन वी हैव द टूथ फोर्सेप नाउ आई एम अंदर आके मेरे को वो दे दो का स्पेचुला प्लीज टूथ फोर्सेप uh dr swabhav sir yes sir uh, in uh, radical cystectomy as compared to radical prostate so will you be taking down uh, as much urethra possible or will you be just releasing the apex and leaving the urethra part intact like in radical prostate no no it's पढ़ रहे थे कि क्या भी कहते क्वेश्चन यू आस्क मी हाउ मच यूरेथ्रा आई विल स्पेयर इज दैट राइट या मतलब विल यू बी स्पेयरिंग द होल ऑफ द यूरेथ्रा और टेकिंग डाउन एज मच यूरेथ्रा पॉसिबल फ्रॉम दिस साइड नो दैट डिपेंड्स अपॉन वेदर द यूरेथ्रेक्टमी इज इंडिकेटेड फॉर द सी एफ लेटर और नॉट बट इफ आई एम टू मेक अ कॉन्टिनेंट डाइवर्जन देन इट इज अ गुड आईडिया टू रिटेन जस्ट अबाउट द वीरो सो यू कैन सी द वीरो राइट देयर कैन यू सी कैन यू मेक आउट द वीरो या या दैट्स द वीरो राइट देयर राइट So now I'm going to cut uh, and uh, liberate the apex right over there. Yeah, right. I'm cutting right across the viru. So when, so what happens is that when we, if, if and when, not in this case, but subsequently, if I've done a new bladder or something and I want to look inside the bladder, then I have a identifying landmark. Please. Do you wish to send any urethral margin here? yeah that's up to the i mean the treating uh, uh, doctor we can send a part of the urethra as a margin these are the uh, uh, i'm just uh, some rectal and other adhesions are there on this side endocrine and dental villus fascia and everything yeah on all those posterior adhesions to the prostate this is a little bit of the prostatic pedicle which is left which i was not able to assess because of the which i will now do so in a retrograde manner so so this is how we just end up uh-huh. so you see now this cystectomy is complete bladder is free that is the apex along with the catheter i'll just pull out the a uh, specimen and uh, leave it there can you take out the catheter and let's do a little bit of air exchange to get the smoke out so open sir for information uh, the robotic cystectomy and your your cystectomy both are actually running at the same speed <laughs> doctor i love this so a privilege and an honor to at least keep up with him if not do <laughs> similar surgery section uh, section kar lijiye sara clean kar lijiye so now the you can see the entire pelvis is empty niche se folies dal diye uske liye tamponade ke liye and ha ha kar lo kar lo kar lo ha this is an excellent suction with a motorized uh, sir uh, suppose one more question sir supposing if there is bleeding from the dvc area like uh, if you want to suture it what uh, tips you suggest how to suture the that part of the uh, because uh, suturing at that location is very difficult particularly in laparoscopic uh, uh, with laparoscopic assistance so any tips on that sir okay i'll let you know two secrets so here comes the second secret you just put in a foley and you just make a tamponade okay just inflate the foley and just push pull it into the any bleeding which are in this region will stop because of that you see and the other other uh, trick is just to increase the pressure inside the retroperitoneum in inside the peritoneum so just before you cut the dvc increase the uh, 
intraperitoneal pressure, make it 20, 22, and typically it will result in a uh, intraperitoneal pneumatic tamponade. So uh, I have not required so far, I have run into an issue where it has not stopped with this. And first come worst scenario is you take this folies, put a, put a, uh, instrument, put a gauze piece just uh, around the, uh, uh, around the uh, folies over here and then put, pull it as a, just pull it and you can just tamper at that uh, uh, area. Does that answer your question? Uh, my question is a different one, sir. Actually, what I you want to suture was, how to suture, how to suture at that location laparoscopically? Yeah, it's difficult. We, we can do it. It's not a problem, actually. It's uh, not that bad. You always have to use the reverse suturing. You do uh, reverse all the way till uh, you are uh, through with your hemostasis. Or you like get the uh, DVC before you do anything. Let's come for the lymphatic neck, please. Bus, okay. Can we shift to the QRBT OT? Yeah. So this is the uh, this is the template for the uh, lymphatic dissection where the ureter crosses over the common ilia, then right down where the vas cross where the vas is crossing, and that is the uh, template for our lymphatic dissection. Of course, you can go above and below depending on what kind of protocol you want to follow at your. Uh, hospital. No, either go short or right? So we'll just mobilize it and take it. So, Apan sir, uh, we are going to the DURBT OT. Uh, oh, we'll come no back problem. shortly. Sure, sure, no problem. Uh, please connect us to the uh, to your TURBT OT, please. Audio from TURBT. Okay, mic chal raha hai. Sir, you are audible, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Amdesh, sir. <coughs> Hello. <coughs> you are audible, sir, in the auditorium. Connect us to URBT OT, please. <coughs> PC <and> OT. <coughs> Sir, you are audible now. Separately clearance नहीं करवाई हुई. Separately treatment clearance नहीं करवाई. करवा लो, करवा लो. Amir sir, uh, audio visible team, please connect us to URPT OT. नहीं treatment clearance करवा लो, बहुत ज़्यादा simple है. Someone check the audio from QRBT OT.
क्या है इसके ऊपर कुछ लग गया है या तो पहले नहीं था भी आया पीसेस ले लो पीसेस पीसेस हेलो कमलेश सर यू आर ऑडिबल देखो लेंस को बीटा डिंग से क्लीन करो अभी क्लियर हाँ उसके हाँ जी ओके हेलो हेलो सर यू यू आर ऑडिबल सर गो एड यस यस ओके माय प्लान वाज टू बिगिन विद द लेफ्ट साइड वॉट एवर वॉज दी ट्यूमर फॉलिंग इनटू द प्रोस्टेटिक ग्रोथ ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड आई वांटेड टू टेक केयर ऑफ दैट and then go on to the right side so my plan was that i'll do the left side just to get it out of the way now one or two more points that i would like to show one is look at this yellow color you you can see this yellow color yes sir i'll talk about this yellow color in my lecture also because this yellow color can mean two things it can mean that this is a tumor or it can even mean that this is the stroma the one that is so and the distinction between these two is based on microscopy only so now we have reached the depth of the tumor we can take a biopsy from the depth of the tumor and be certain whether this is muscle invasive or not but you see even the left sided tumor is also a very big tumor it's not it's it, it is smaller than the right one but it is uh, it is still reasonably big so you will be sending a separate biopsy from the bed after uh, uh, resecting the pedunculated part we should do that yes just to prove muscle invasion yes, but sir. in this case actually it doesn't matter because we are we have to do a radical cystectomy in him you look at the left sided tumor i'm just i i thought that this is a small one <laughs> i'll be able to get rid of this quickly whereas this is not what is happening the other point that i wanted to show to the residents is look at these bleeders this uh, these bleed points have to be specifically coagulated and the point i wanted to make was that in a in a bipolar quadri the spread of the energy is minimal and therefore in a bipolar quadri you have to sit on the bleeder and coagulate it over some time in a monopolar quadri these bleeding points are easier to control <coughs> whereas in a bipolar quadri the control needs some degree of patience you using bipolar cell <coughs> yes yes i'll also talk about monopolar bipolar in the lecture aaj <laughs> but this is a point that i wanted to demonstrate that in bipolar <laughs> you need some degree of patience for point coagulation of the bleeders there are this yellow halo that you are seeing i'll also talk about this yellow halo here you all of you can appreciate this yellow halo just at the time of cutting i wanted to see the left ureteric orifice i at least wanted to deep block the left ureteric orifice just in case it is involved because right kidney is practically non functioning right kidney is having a output of between 100 and 200 ml and uh, as seen on the ct scan there is hardly any parenchyma on the right side so right side we will also have to take a note for the beginners what i wanted to make one more point is that you should not do half of any tumor whatever tumor you begin with you must complete the resection otherwise it will keep on bleeding don't begin another tumor till the time you have completely finished the first one and achieved complete hemostasis on that side 
don't think that you'll be able to come back and achieve hemostasis later on or at the end of the procedure don't do that He'll also need a urethrectomy because his prostatic urethra is involved. Okay, one point I wanted to make regarding the cystic regarding mastectomy along with cystectomy. There are two ways doing of doing a mastectomy along with the, a cystectomy and. Obviously, we know about both these ways. One is laparoscopic, the other one is open. If you have to do an open in a lean and thin patient, it is possible with a lower abdominal incision, although it is difficult. And if one has to do a nephrectomy with a lower abdominal incision, then the patient should be in the lithotomy position. <coughs> in the lithotomy position, the surgeon can stand in between the legs and with the left hand retract the kidney down and with the right hand keep on dissecting around and control the pedicle. Meanwhile, we will be going to other OT and we will come sure, back. Sure, sure. Please, please, please. Please go ahead. Uh, can you connect to the robotic OT? Sir, uh, we, uh, at what stage you are saying you are doing lymph node dissection on the right side? We, uh, what did you say? Uh, ca can you brief us sir, about the landmarks, where to start and where to, till what level yeah, we have so to? Yeah, that, so that's the, that's the uh, genital humeral <coughs> nerve there, laterally. Okay. So that's the, and we'll take everything around the vessel. And that's the obturator nerve, fossa, so we have cleaned up everything from distal, Inguai here. Okay. So we are taking up down right up to the, that the co common ilia group, that's the obturator group, and we'll go on to do the common ilia, that's the ureter division. So we'll release the ureter to this side. So that. So you routinely send all the lymph node uh, uh, dissection areas in one specimen or uh, separately? Like no, no, not necessary. Not necessary. So, you know, they should need to be identified. Konsa kidar ka hai? So that's essential, but uh, not necessarily that you know you have to. So there is an enlarged node there. Do you routinely use uh, 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 applying clips while doing lymph node dissection, sir? Yeah. Or you just use the energy device? Dis distally always. Distally always. Distally always. I don't know whether how much does that help, but you yeah. know, gives 
you know, but it gives me the confidence. And in the post-operative period, like uh, what is uh, your uh, practice pattern of uh, uh, dealing the drains, like uh, uh, based on the output? Uh, based on the output, as long as as soon as you know that the urine is uh, there is no urine. Yeah. So the drain fluid creatinine is a very important thing that you need to. That's the ureter again. Oh, that's the that, okay. That's the lymph node. So that's the lymph node. You you uh, routinely wait till the drain output is very minimal, or you uh, if you rule no. out that there is no urine, you no. write down. As soon as as soon as we uh, if, if it's a transperitoneal surgery and yes. if the and the drain output is uh, uh, irrespective of the drain output, I would uh, I would be able to do that. We would be able to pull out that. <coughs> Can you put a clip on that also? <coughs> so distally, uh, I'll always put the clip. Have you ever encountered, sir, in your experience, the operator nerve injuries which happened intraoperatively and then subsequently how they were managed? Any talk, any any points on that? Did it ever happen? Intraoperative injury, which were detected later on. So intraop only, so, uh, accidentally the uh, the nerve got injured or anything like that. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I have divided a nerve also one time. So. Uh, and reanastomosed, although, and you know, it was anxiety for a long time, but which it doesn't have much morbidity, fortunately. <laughs> Put a clip there. Uh, they might be having some difficulty in adduction, otherwise. Uh, yes, yes. They, otherwise, otherwise, otherwise they are not, fairly okay. Yeah, so they, they feel that you know their ad adduction is a bit weak, that's all. So, uh, apart from that, vascular injuries, they are. Uh, detected and to be managed. Venous injury times they can be dubious. So you you may not find much bleeding from the you know venous injuries. They may go unnoticed and they may require. They, sometimes they have required re-exploration. So take this also. Okay, so that's the. We are coming towards the common iliac group. Where is your third arm, sir, right now? Third arm is resting. The third arm is right there. So I could can use it for retracting the vessels, but you know they are so clean. So sometimes I use them like this to retract the vessels. So here, when doing this, they, this will be helpful. Okay. Doing this part of the procedure when you want to take the you know, clean up the fossa here.
In the given case, you have placed the third arm on the right side, right, sir? Uh, third arm on the uh, right, right side. Say that again. Uh, where, where was the third arm placed? On the third right. arm was placed on the right side. Yes. Right side. Yeah. So in in uh, the, in these cases, uh, uh, in rooms, strictly we put the third arm on the right side. Right side. Okay. At uh, PGI Chandigarh, sir, uh, what we do is we. Uh, place the third arm on the left side only. Uh, but what we do is we generally put a 12 mm port and we put a port in port technique there where the 12 mm port is used through the robotic port is placed. And while doing the ONP part, we pass the stapler through that port only after de-docking the third arm. Makes sense. So, but, uh, but it would be on the left side actually at our center. Quite a good amount of lymphatic tissues there in the given case. <coughs> yes. Cleaning of the complete operator fossa. Yeah. So that's the most important maneuver. That you know you retract the vessels medially and clear up this fossa here. Okay. So that's. That's a common iliac. So, you know, we have come up to the common iliac here. Yes, sir. And that actually is the bifurcation of the aorta. So, here is the bifurcation of the aorta. Yeah. So you can see that this idea going on this side, this side. Sir, do you lower the cautery settings while uh, playing around the vessels while doing the... Uh, say, say that again. Dr. Alavat, sir? Yeah. Sir, do you lower the cautery settings while doing lymphadenectomy? Lymph Your voice is, uh, you know, cracking. Any, so any... Any change in the cautery se settings while doing lymph node dissection? No, no, I don't. That's the internal iliac artery and... Yes, sir, that's the internal iliac, external iliac, common iliac. So, it just detected here, so that's the common iliac. These are the, the lymph nodes all... Okay, so that's a pre-sectoral group of lymph nodes. If you want to clear them. Coming shortly, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's a great, great demonstration of uh, lymph node dissection. Uh, we'll be coming back, sir, soon in five minutes. Uh, can we get? Can we be connected to the TRPT OT, please? I think the tumor resection has been done. I guess. Hear me, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay, okay. I just show you what I have done. I'm planning to stop here. So this is the Vero Montanum. And you can see this is the blood and neck. This was the tumor that was hanging from the left side. So I started from the left side. There is still some tumors that is hanging, but most of the left <coughs> side has actually been cleared. Here you can see. I was trying to look for the, here there is a bleeder. 
This is what I wanted to show that for the bleeder, you have to sit on the bleeder and give a good coagulation. And the other thing that I wanted to show was, you know, you look at this yellow color. This yellow color can be the pedicle or can be the tumor. But you look at this yellow color, this is quite likely to be tumor. And you look at, I'll show you another yellow color here. Here. This yellow color is likely to be tumor. Okay. And here you can see the muscle. I'll show you the healthy muscle. So you know where the depth of the resection. Here, here you can see this pink muscle. So this is a healthy pink muscle. Yes. Okay. So the depth till which you have to go. You know, the cameras are so good and picture is so good that you can get a better picture based on your endoscopy rather than what the pathologist will take you back. I'm not so, undermining so you are doing a uh, hemostasis and then stopping <laughs> yeah yeah so that is what the plan is hemostasis is more or less done there were lots of yeah. readers so I have completed the hemostasis I just wanted to look for the uretric orifice but I can't see the left uretric orifice there is some bleeding at the blood and neck but it is not too bad I am planning to stop just looking at the last bleeders because I don't want to go to the right side because that will again open up Many, many more bleeders. Yes, sir. So we couldn't identify the left uretric orifice uh, as of now. No, I tried to, but I could not see. There is a tiny bleeder here also. You, that is what I was saying. You know, the hemostasis has to be perfect. Because if you leave, leave even a small bleeder, then you may have to bring back the patient to the, to the OR, which is not a good thing to happen. Okay, I'll just show you the return color, show the color, it is not bad at all, but this is Ex obviously, external view, is, external view please, can you enlarge the, can you, view? can you, I can show you with this color only, yeah, yeah, yes sir, you can see this color is reasonably good, it's Very more good. or less transparent, okay. uh, but then this is the full irrigation return, Sir, would you contemplate switching to monopolar cautery for hemostasis right now? If if the uh, if it was more oozy and uh, hemostasis was not, not being controlled by bipolar? Yes, I would agree with that. And you know, there are some centers where they routinely use monopolar cautery for TRBT. Their argument is that you can use both, then you can use, uh, this is the right sided one. There is some bit of ooze from here, I haven't dissected here at all. The argument is that with the uh, distilled water being used, the implantation is less. Implantation is definitely an issue in uh, bladder cancer. It's, it's reasonable. There are some bleeders here, but they will get controlled with uh, the catheter. Inside it's all clear. You can see the irrigation is not bad. The fluid is okay. There is, it's a little bit red, but it's okay. I think we'll stop here. With this degree, you can't have a totally transparent. Uh, get the catheter ready. So this entire big side, right side tumor I have left. For the dome, you know, the way going ahead for resection of the dome is by the horizontal movements. Yeah. The movements are easier in the posterior wall. But in the dome, the movements that have to be, they have to be horizontal movements. And in the anterior wall, you have to keep your hand on the anterior, in the anterior abdominal wall. Okay? Okay. Okay, sir. Thank I you so much, sir. Yeah. It's a wonderful demonstration. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Then all the remaining questions can be there during the lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, can we move on to the laparoscopy OT table? Uh, Dr. Swapan Sooth, OT, please. Because he's, he's going to finish the lymph node dissection on the left side. Uh, Swapan, sir. Hello. He's he's Laparoscopy table. Hello. Hello, sir. We are watching yes. you, sir. Okay. So we've just finished the left limb, uh, right lymphatic packet, just planning to finish the, uh, on the lymph, lymph, right, the lymph nodes on the left side. 
So that is the left packet and uh, I think you can see the uh, external iliac and the uh, well, external iliac vein and the obturator nerve and that is the packet and that is the internal iliac right there. Can you push, pull it back? Can you see the internal iliac? Yes, sir. Let me show you. That's the, yeah. That's the, yeah. That's yeah, the ureter okay. on the right side. Yeah, that's the ureter and uh, the lymphatic packet is just about finished. Little bit of more scheduling over here. <coughs> And I'll be releasing it from the vein just near its apex. So that is the left uh, lymphatic packet and the left ureter and I'll just keep it here for safekeeping. Now we are left with uh, uh, two issues only. The primary procedure is finished. So we have to do a urinary diversion. I am planning the ileal conduit. Let me see the uh, the transverse colon. That's the appendix. Okay, and that is the ileocecal junction right there. Let me see. Yeah, right there is the ileocecal junction. I will take a marking somewhere about 15 centimeter and then mark out the loop before that, uh, before exiting the abdomen. But before I do that, I also need to transfer the ureter onto the other side. So uh, this, uh, the idea of the laparoscopic, yeah, pardon? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, sir. The idea of the laparoscopic is to keep a small incision to facilitate a, 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 a early recovery. <coughs> so that is the advantage of the minimally invasive surgery. So we need to do all the works which were to be done inside the abdomen prior to exiting the abdomen. So here I am trying, I am planning a a tunnel behind the colon with the avascular portion and come on to the other side. Let me see. Yeah. So you can see I'm um, Yeah, here. we are able to see. Yeah, so I will just, uh, uh, I want to come out here actually. Uh, okay, let's come out. Let's, div let's divide this peritoneum. Yeah, just. The, the left ureter has been already mobilized uh, well, sir? Yeah, both the ureters have been mobilized well. The good length is available. And I'll, okay. yeah, and I'll I'm just uh, extending this incision over the uh, sacral promontory. So I'll need your port macho over here. So I'm just making a hole. No, no, the other side. This side. You hold this side. Okay, and if your other hand is free, you can make a hole here. Gently just make a, uh, the other way around, you should be doing it. Suction ulti help me have here. Mm, yeah, hold this, uh, you use the suction to just uh, make a small, yeah, just extend over here. Remain next to the promontory, yeah. Uh, Gently keep making the hole, or soul is not Okay, now yeah. So now, oh yeah, you are, you are on the other side, right? So now what you need to do is to take your uh, the other instrument, the grasper, and put it where your section is. Uh, sorry to interrupt, sir. I would just request the chairpersons now. Uh, I would like to thank you and please proceed towards the right side of the auditorium for a group photograph. So we can collect your mementos from the registration desk outside. Uh, now I would like to call Dr. Abhishek Chaube uh, from IKDRC Ahmedabad. Uh, Dr. Vivek Sharma uh, is an assistant professor in urology in RML Delhi. Dr. Ravindra Prok Purohit, consultant neurologist in Jodhpur. And uh, Dr. R.K. Saran, uh, consultant neurologist in MDM Hospital Jodhpur to take their place on the stage.
Hello? Hello? So I want to watch you. Just uh, hold the gut. Oh, actually, yeah. Yeah. Take it down. 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 Yeah. No. My mirror is hot. The other coach is here. Yeah, yeah, the coach. I think that was the issue. Instruments coming in the same direction. Scissor, scissor, please, quickly. Go. Let's see, got any? Do I hear? Yeah, these are the. Place another marker. Bag ready, go. बैग दे दो पहले बैग में वो डालें लिम्फेटिक पैकेट्स देन वी कैच दी बैग बोथ दी यूनिटर्स के थ्रेड्स पहले इसमें डालें और तो कुछ नहीं था एक और पीस और लिखा था उन्होंने ओके इट्स फाइन चलो आ जाओ पीछे जस्ट होल्ड इट हेलो हेलो आप प्लीज कनेक्ट ओटी वन हाँ रोबोटिक ओटी Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Saran from. Uh, Hi. Sir. Uh, hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, what are you doing, sir, now? Yeah, yeah. We have done the lymph nodes from the right side. We have done the pre-sacral group of lymph nodes. So now we are turning on to the left side. So you know that's the upper limit of where we'll divide, and then we'll take it down. So you know that's the aortic bifurcation area. So we'll show it from the opposite side just now. Can you put a clip here? Which type of neoblader you uh, want to in this case? Sir? 
yeah, we'll, we'll make a, you know, what do we call it? Uh, Peter Wickland makes it, you know, there is no definite name for it. Alex Motri also does the same. Most of the European centers make the same. So, uh, it doesn't have a name like extruder or, uh, or other bladder, but it's, it's, a, it's a good bladder. Uh, robotically, it makes sense to do that. We will just show it. So that's the lateral limit of the dissection, that's a lateral to the artery. So it will be genitofemoral nerve there. Hello. So that's the lateral to the vessels going to the origin of the obturator fossa. Surface camera ka display the teacher, please. Then just home. I'll just do this. Gently put it. Okay, Alice, put it. Now start it. Alice, do not put it on. So is this surface camera on? Ha. Yeah. Just pull it out. Now we get the ureters. Mere ko wo de do bata. Medium clamp ya kuch. proximal so I know what is the proximal part and what is the gas off please this port is the port sir this 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 is the port sir okay okay you can see the patient when you go down the ureter will pull the ureter down so we have to be careful not that the ureter is going straight. So उतना की सीधा करना कि ureter बाहर में। हाँ जी। Okay, fine, बहुत है, बहुत है, बहुत है, बहुत है। बहुत है। Light एक बारी readjust कर दीजिए। हाँ, arcade करो एक बार। इसके लिए। Okay, can I have the audio please? Yes sir. Can you can you hear me? Yes sir. Can you see the surface view of the camera? Yes sir. Okay, so this is the gut. Can I can white balancing करना? अच्छा light center में करना? Yes sir, yes sir. हाँ. Yes, yes. Yes sir, yes sir. Can you see now? So you see the size of the incision. It's just about two phalanges, and that's the ureter which has come out. 
and that is the gut. So what happened? Because I have kept the incision small, I pre-marked the gut. Can you see these two sutures? These were yes, the sir. sutures which I was passing when I was inserting. So this is the distal part, D4 distal and D4 double suture. And proximal, this is the proximal part of the glue. So I am going to construct the ideal conduit from this only. So now I am going to see where the arcades are. So there is a very nice uh, arcade, thin patient. I can see nicely. Can you hold it here? Uh, just give me the... Uh, I think we are going to... If anybody can see, we are, we are going to base it on this. Udar ko udar Bipolar आप 10 सेंटीमीटर के लिए रेडी रहना हां जी अच्छा वो इसीलिए ठीक से नजर नहीं आ रहा ओके आई एम जस्ट गो राइट अप टू द एज देन डिवाइड 1 सेंटीमीटर ऑन दिस साइड Step already with my daughter. Sir, which anastomosis are you going to uh, planning to do, sir? Pardon? Which part type of anastomosis are you planning to do? Which? Which type of uh, anastomosis? Uh, Ureteral or anastomosis? anastomosis. Oh, we'll do uh, individual anastomosis to the breaker anastomosis. Why you prefer breaker over the oil, sir? So I want individual uh, anastomosis to the is this long enough? Uh, scale the camera. Alright, you see? Okay, take a fine. 10 centimeters, you know. 10 to. Yeah, take a fine. Fine, fine. Mm, so maybe it's out to here, right? How much uh, length of this uh, real conduit? 10 cm to 12 cm is the length, ideal length and also it depends upon how fat the patient is. So for a little thinner patients you can use less. Yeah. That mark is at 10 cm from this uh, suture line. The same bipolar which I used, I am using for the hemostasis in developing the gut. Uh, Switch up the room, please. I'll just turn it on. Hmm. Okay. You know, staple mark is side to side. Give the little clip there. So I just 
अब ऑन टू अगर आपको पूरा एक ऑटिक को शो ऑफ करना तो हैंड्स में कर दो स्टेप को मार देते हैं टाइम लग जाएगा उनका अगला केस भी होना लो स्टेप लग देता हूं नहीं दोनों ही दोनों पकड़ लेंगे हाँ आपको इधर से पकड़ना मैं इधर का साइड पकड़ूंगा दैट इज बेटर टीम वर्क यार खोल के नहीं लगा आप लगाओ कौन से वाला स्टेप लगा है खोल के नहीं लगा क्योंकि उधर ध्यान ऑडियंस पे आ रहा हाँ जी आप पुल अप कर लीजिए पुल अप कर लिया गॉस पीस आउट कर हाँ जी नहीं दें ये देखना कहाँ पे मेरे को दिखने का ठीक से यू कैन डू Now we are doing this stapler nice mostly for the idea. How much friends Suresh are doing that? Uh, yeah, nice. I think you're close now. Look, stapler. बाहर अभी जेंट्री. पहले आप लॉक कर लो, फिर निकालो अभी जेंट्री. Okay, nice. Nice. अब वो रन करना होगा. हाँ नीचे कर दो वेट फॉर थर्टी सेकेंड्स जाने दो जाने दो जाने दो जाने दो सूचर पुल करके प्लीज दोनों साइड से हाँ हाँ वेट फॉर थर्टी सेकेंड्स प्रेशर उससे जस्ट वेट फॉर थर्टी सेकेंड मीनवाइल वेट दो दी असिरोजा सूचर क्विकली लाओ लाओ सिल करो प्लीज ये फटाफट जब तक करके आओगे थर्टी सेकंड हो जाएंगे इमोस्टेसिस वैसे ही हो जाएगा सो आई डोंट डू इंटरप्रेटेड आई डू ए कंटिन्यूअस कंटिन्यू हाँ सरफेस कैमरा पे आ रहा है क्या Hold on. How are you doing this? I'll keep this needle here, please. Hold it. Here it is drained. Here it is adjusting. I'll just finish it.
ये पकड़ो थ्रेड प्लीज गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल में अनलिमिटेड सामान आ रहा है मैं यहाँ निकल उठ रहा हूँ थ्रेड ही काट दिया एक सुरेश तुमने बड़ी देर पहले एक वो आईवीसी थ्रोम्बस भेजा था इस पेशेंट फॉलोइंग अप विद यू या ये एंड कम ही टोल्ड मी मेट यू इज डूइंग वेरी वेल शी इज डूइंग वेरी वेल ना विद थ्रोम्बस वाज देन हाँ अच्छा एक मिनट के ऊपर हाँ ओके नाइस अंदर कोई ब्लीडर तो नहीं है हाँ चलो हाँ जी ओके ओके हाँ इस साइड पे करना है उसे उतने देर इसको क्लोज कर दो साइड पे इसको क्लोज कर दो इसको क्लोज करो और ब्रिकर ने स्मूथी समझने करना है। Connect to this uh, robotic one.
सर या हेलो सर सर यू आर टेकिंग दिस इलियम आई थिंक एक मिनट यू नो जस्ट शो देम द लिफ्ट नेक मी फर्स्ट कंप्लीट सो विल देन विल स्टार्ट सो सो so that's the common iliac yeah. no that's the the external iliac a common iliac and that's the iv division of the ivc here yes okay that's the left ureter coming the sigmoid recently whole has been so it is all cleared up that's the opposite common iliac opposite internal iliac opposite external iliac so that's the left common iliac and the right common iliac and the presacral area and coming on to the left side so we you have the, the same vessels uh, the external iliac and internal iliac the lymph obturator and the all lymph nodes and everything has been done okay yes so level 1 and level 2 extended lymphectomy has been performed now we have uh, moving to the diversion so you know that's the distal ileum you can show the c cup in there uh, sir uh, at this stage uh, do you change the uh, uh, slight position of any trend line bar position do you try to change it reducing the tilt no, or anything we, like that if if there is a problem you can change it and uh, uh, we can change to actually 10 10 12 degree uh, less at this time So that's the mesentery now unfolded for you. Okay, so that's the distal ileum. So this will be the site for uh, urethra. You can see that approximately, you know, 40 centimeter of bowel is on the left side. Sir, how you are measuring the uh, length of the bowel? We will we'll take the measurement. The first thing is to do uh, to find out the, which is the easiest place for the urethra vesical anastomosis. so the longest part of the mesentery is taken which is which is usually this part <coughs> we'll fix it we'll make a urethrovesical anastomosis and then measure and then uh, uh, divide the bowel for the mesentery is take and sort then so doctor raval yeah So, sir, if, have we you understood you right? You are going to first do the urethrovesical anastomosis, then plan yes. the proximal and distal limbs. Yes, yes. So, the first part of the the anas first part of the thing is a uh, uh, bowel to urethra anastomosis. Doctor, now what's our PP sing this side, sir? Yeah, I. Yes, sir, I, sir. So, but what happens in a patient who is a little obese and has got thick mesentery, where well, without sir, dividing the mesentery, you are not able to perform the urethrovesical, sir? Uh, that's what I was saying. That that's just the experience because uh, Peter Wickland says that uh, he operates on all the uh, obese uh, American patients, and he says that he has never ever found a patient fat enough where the mesentery hasn't reached urethra. <coughs> so you have tips and tricks. Uh, you can. It's the simplest of the case. Then you can take a loop in the bowel. on mesentery two sides gradually pull it you can give a transverse incision in the mesentery so you know there are so many things that you can do you can pull the urethra bit inwards you can tubularize a part of the bowel to reach the urethra there people use so many things but but yes okay. there could be one patient for yes. you and me there could be one patient where so, we would not be able to reach the urethra so in, in case of difficulty one can divide the mesentery first and then do the anastomosis yes yes one can divide the mesentery okay. yes or the, the the first suggestion that was given the so first thing that you do is the uh, take the trendel and burger okay take the <coughs> so it's a sort of roco for uh, the this uh, procedure 
I Rajesh Tattu Patel. Rajesh, so it, will, it will it is going to bring the urethra inside. Yeah, this is a Rocco stitch. Yeah, so it's make the uh, bring the urethra into the peritoneal cavity. Yeah, so that the tension is relieved a bit. Yes, tension and you will be able to see urethra better. Okay. And uh, so you would do a better nasomosity. So you will see that urethra is just <coughs> right now it's getting pulled out. But after this, Thank you, uh, chairpersons, for the interesting discussion. I would now request all the chairpersons to proceed to the right of the auditorium to collect their mementos and for a group photograph. I would now like to call upon stage Dr. Nitin Agarwal, consultant urologist from Ludhiana, Dr. Himang Bakshi, senior consultant uro-oncologist from HCG Ahmedabad, Dr. Paris Singhal, Consultant Urologist from Kailash Hospital, Noida. Dr. Aaron Jain, Consultant Urologist from Alwar. I think we'll take a bite in the back of the mesentery also with the same thing. I I am taking it. <coughs> so so is that bite is to reduce the tension on the anastomosis? Yeah, it the will it will bring the bobble, you know. So once we <coughs> so that's. It will bring the bowel close to the urethra. Right, sir. Yes. My specialty is urology and oncology. Is some sort of like you take a bowel from the. Uh, yeah, just support it. It's a modified roco while you take a. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, a bite from the, uh, the posterior part of the bladder. Yes. Dr. Allah? Yeah. Yeah, I'm Bangbakshi here, right? Hi. So, what uh, suture material is this and what, what this, do you prefer? This is VLOG. VLOG. It is 3 0 VLOG or 2 0 VLOG, sir? 3 3 0. Good. So, so, do you measure the bowel segment from the ileocecal junction or you just uh, take the part which Afterwards, is the most dependent? We'll, we'll start the measuring after the anastomosis is done. Okay, so. This is, so, obviously, you know, we have taken the distal. Uh, I'll just show. Right. Look, don't cut it better. Just take it out. Take it out. Take it out. Take it. That's not the needle hole. I'll just, I'll just explain. So, so that's the C cup. Right. Right. And that's the that's the distal bobble. That's the IC, yes. So, yeah. 
So this is the uh, most dependent part of the bobble, longest with the longest mesentery. entry. So I've just brought it here. Now proximal loop would be now a distal loop would be here. So we'll we'll divide somewhere here for the distal loop, and we'll divide somewhere here after measuring for the proximal loop. Okay. Th this will be continuity of the bobble, and this will be used for the blind. So how many centimeters uh, would you take for the neobladder? This is 20 cent 12, 15 centimeters, 15 centimeters, and 10 centimeters. So, <coughs> 40 centimeters overall. 15 this segment, 15 this segment, and 10 for the chimney. Give me a scissor, please. <coughs> and then double arm rope for as you give for the prostate. Okay. Our lens is a bit dirty. I, I hope the picture is clear. Yeah, we can see very well. Sir, so the effective uh, length of bowel using for the bladder formation is 30 centimeter only, right, sir? 30 centimeters. So, it's adequate in your experience? The, it's ad adequate in people's experience. You know, I, I just do what the other have done. Right, sir. They haven't found problem. What may be the expected capacity of this bladder after six months? After six months, you know, initially this may, may be just 200, 200 ml. But, you know, the bowel distends enormously. <coughs> so, uh, gradually the uh, capacity becomes better and better. Needle holder back. Suture to me. You are giving me double arm? Okay. So different surgeons use different measurements and different kinds of neobladder. Most of them are modifications of uh, scooters. And uh, in Derby Gill, I think you use a 55 centimeter segment. Mm. He also would discard the 5 centimeters uh, near the anastomy. So you will keep the chimney on the left side, right, sir? We will keep the chimney, that one uh, 10 <coughs> centimeter length. Yeah, chimney would be on this side. Left side? Yeah, on, uh, on left side. And ureter you have taken on the right side, from left to right? Yes, yes. But it will go there. Because sigmoid is going to be on this side. So it will be between sigmoid and you have to take the sigmoid on the left side. Sigmoid has to be on the left side. Right, that's fine, sir. Uh, but why don't you take the chimney on the right but side? If you, Just if I'm you, asking. If you don't take the ureter on the right side, then it will be behind the sig sigmoid. So the question is whether uh, the chimney should be on the right side, as would happen in a classical oh, scooter. Yes. So, but I think once the double cross folding of the mesentery is done, the chimney would shift to the right side. So yes, yes. Because this bowel would go down. Yes. No, doctor. Ibang, the chimney will be on the left side only. No, once, yeah. once this no, is done. Chimney has to be in the proximal segment of yeah. the small bowel. That is wherever it sets up. Yes. We have to make a chimney from the proximal segment of the correct, bowel, correct. not the distal. <laughs> So the move, it's a basically a U-shaped thing. The, you keep the straight chimney 10 centimeter, rest 15, 15. You make a U and do an anastomosis. So chimney will come more or less in the center or on the left side of the patient. No, no. The chimney is going to shift a little to the right side, right? Once, once the entry for the chimney is proximal. So everyone agrees on yeah. that. And chim chimney is. has to be proximal. medial to the medial to the sigmoid. Correct. Isn't it? Right. But yeah. it, medial it more or less medial. comes in the center. And the left ureter has to go behind the sigmoid with the need to be in a smooth. Absolutely. So, with the question of left and center, after all, it says the left part of the bowel, so it will remain more on the left side. Only. So, it is to medial to the sigmoid. Oh, yes. Correct. Uh, Dr. Pipi Singh, sir, 
actually it's not necessary mandatory to take the ureter on the left side even you can right side from left to right even there are different techniques while ureter kept on the normal anatomical position and being anastomous with the chimney so the, if you use the hopman explain that again i did not understand so what i'm saying that uh, even you can keep the ureter left ureter on the left side on the normal anatomical position and you can anastomose with the chimney there is no harm there are lots of i do vip bladder i never take the ureter on the left side i keep the ureter both ureter on the same side uh, as per an anastomose with the chimney or whatever way you anastomose so it's uh, actually it's a more important for ileal conduit for new bladder there are many many techniques where you don't take the ureter from right to left to right so uh, whether there is an advantage of taking the ureter from left to right on the in new bladder is not really proven so different word uh, methods would have yeah so if you are doing wallis then you have to take other yeah, you can put two ureters separately that's so if you design the hopman pouch both yeah. ureters would be separately uh, implanted into the ileal ends at the proximal end so then you don't need to go below the sigmoid colon as that's a valid point sir when we go below the sigmoid colon sometimes what happens is you need to bring the ureter again higher up to anastomose so there will be some amount of traction also there so to prevent the s uh, yeah, shape S which you are talking about we should be uh, bringing the ureter above the sacral promontory then the curve would be a little no so one, one can always uh, decrease the length of the ureter in case it is it is going from below up so it means the length of ureter available is more so we we'll cut down the ureter let that we do not need to actually go from below upward you we decrease the length of the ureter that makes it dependent oh, oh, uh, if you can anastomose the ureter separately why don't you uh, keep the ureter on the same side that's basically if you talk about science the, how it is going to advantage i'll come for ureter future so i'm not able to understand yes. that that panda that how how would you anastomose the left ureter to the chimney just as a talaba what does it do i think it'll show us in some time i guess So, Doctor Allah, this is a double arm, two O V lock, right? Yes. Three O. Three O. Doctor Allah, sir. Yes, sir. Do you, Do you feel any difficulty in using this V lock suture? Is there a danger of cut through uh, using the this on the bowel, sir? Mm, uh, no. No. So you are you are comfortable with V-lock, sir? Yes. And what is the total length of this suture, sir? Fifteen cent. Fifteen cent. And and this is twenty-seven mm needle. No, sorry. Urethrostomy. Uh, so if you do a ureter sigmoidostomy would you make a mains to pouch would you retubularize it or would you just uh, directly implant the ureter into the sigmoid I keep the incision small everything is uh, centered around that because we have to make that you know position incision just to remove the uh, the specimen correct so, so my uh, wonderful demonstration dr so we we completely enjoyed uh, uh -huh. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank uh, you very so much. More, just one more yeah. question. Yes. Uh, if we use IFTs as splint, we usually fix them with the suture to the bowel loop, to the ileal yeah. conduit loop. So do you yeah. need to fix the stents also with the suture to the ileal conduit loop? No, the double jet stents have the advantage. There's a J on the upper side, so you really don't uh, uh, see the stenting. In my opinion, when you are doing an open reconstruction and everything, is a measure of the uh, uh, the. The security, the insecurity which the urologist has. So uh, while we used to see cystectomies which were unstented a lot earlier, so then ureteric catches were put in, then uh, IFTs were put in, now stents were put in. So it's just a measure. So if somehow if your if your anastomosis lasts for about 40 hours, so if your anastomosis holds for the first 48 hours, then probably it's hold uh, for a long period of time. Okay, we, we, uh, one more question, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Sul. We keep on watching you. Can we go over to Dr. Allah please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Suresh. And thank you, Hema, Manshu. And thank you, Om. And thank you, Rakesh. And, Rake, and 
वो भी थे डॉक्टर आई कमता है काव्या काव्या आई डिड हेयर इट इज गॉन ऑफ दिस वन मोर क्वेश्चन टू डॉक्टर सूद सर यस like like when you are bringing the conduit out uh, through this uh, port site how do you ensure that the conduit misentry is not twisted inside how to uh, the conduit do about it <coughs> like the when you are when you are bringing the conduit out through the port yeah uh, there is a possibility sometimes the misentry inside might be twisted how to oh, avoid yes. how the how to misentry? avoid that yeah yeah so you keep the so see these are surgical nonces you keep the loop in the uh in the anatomic position when you take it out so typically the serosal uh, border will come out to the inferior side of the ileostomy and second when you the when you are taking out through the port side it's not what you do is you put in your finger i usually put in a finger or finger and a half and dilate at least the uh to a finger and a half uh, or so thirdly uh, i always incise the uh, external oblique aponeurosis with at edge uh, of which the ileostomy is done i make a cruciate incision so that it doesn't uh, uh, squeeze the uh, loop uh, uh, sir uh, i would like to ask one question that usually uh, the dictum means you should take out this uh, ileostomy through the rectus muscle right uh, uh, so yes it should be taken yeah. out through the rectus muscle yeah. so there when you are putting a port port is uh, is located little laterally no so it's uh, uh, it's unlikely to be through the rectus muscle usually mm-hmm. no no in this case also right hand port i may have forgotten to mention in the initial part should go through the stoma site you plan your right hand port through the stoma site itself in the first place in the first go only in this case also uh, uh, dr gautam's team at the stoma site and we have gone through that only Okay. we have not uh, decided this from uh, after what, the what as per uh, your anatomical it was decided on the basis basis of the stomacide mark right yeah, yeah. Okay. so for example in this case we we made the uh, port insertion on the 12 o'clock position of the stomacide and then we incised inferiorly so ultimately it came almost to the middle of the mark stomacide give or take a half a millimeter or so Thank you. So, but it was a wonderful demonstration. Thank My you, only sir. point is that, uh, as everybody is discussing, uh, the stoma should come out of the rectus muscle because if it is not, then the chances of parastomal hernia is quite a bit. Yes, so you are right. I lost me hernias will occur in almost 30 to 35 percent of the cases. Parastomal uh, hernias uh, will occur eventually. Uh, so sir, uh, while we are at parastomal hernias, uh, uh, in general open surgery, we would uh, uh, close the peritoneum around the uh, stoma from yeah. inside also. Uh, yes. So how do you do that in uh, laparoscopy? Do you plan to do port, put the ports again and so, close it? No, no. After Imanchu has fixed this uh, ileostomy, he will go through this incision. He will mark out where the loop is and he will uh, do whatever closure he can do around that. we can do that easily it's not really a problem especially in this case which is very thin case okay great <laughs> right, so can we now shift over to dr alaul so thank you very much for such a patient uh, viewing thank you thank you dr sudhir we completely enjoyed your session open doctor lal are you there yeah okay great we could see that you are wiring your bowel uh, uh, stapler yeah. yes once you are uh, done you can walk us through what, what yeah now means. after that there will be lot on lots of suturing right actually the most difficult part of the anastomosis of uh, this procedure is the bowel to urethra anastomosis right if you have done that then rest is just mechanical so the staplers are coming through the port in the left hand side right from the left side. so and there are there are three, uh, two ways people do it uh, but you know i had kept even a uh, assisted port as 12 mm so sometimes if the angle is not good you can you can you can bring it You you can bring it from the top side also. 
Dr. Alawal sir, you have demonstrated uh, the uh, ileal anastomosis very well. But my question was, isn't it better to uh, put a few interrupted suture in the mesentery to avoid any fat coming in between the anastomosis, sir? Yes, you can do that. People, uh, you know, I have seen people taking two sutures before they fire. Yes, sir. Uh, at least distal. So that definitely helps. So now this exercise. Is uh, because this man doesn't have too much of a fat. Right. So fortunately. So otherwise, we would have certainly done it. Right. Point. This is a 60 mm uh, step dresser? Yes, this is a 60 mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, after you... this, we will take a couple of sutures to uh, 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 have. Uh, to, uh, just to sub the and ask So, do you use the sure form uh, stimulator at any point, or you think it has some advantages, or you would use it in certain situations? Which one? The sure form, the robotic stapler. The motorized. Yeah. So, no, I have actually, I have used it for the first time. I have used it in just one case, but. Uh, I don't know whether it, it really has great advantages compared to an assistant yeah, coming through the laparoscopic board. It just adds to the cost. Take, take a suture this time. Take, take a suture because you know, the, the posterior wall is coming more closer to the mesentery. Yeah. Uh, so they will be, take PP Singh's advice. So, Dr. Elav, so what are your practices about the pre op bowel preparation when it comes to new bladder formation? No, I, didn't, I didn't hear. So, the pre op bowel preparation protocol? There is no pre op bowel preparation. So, you don't use any uh, bowel preparation? No, no nothing. Okay. Just liquid diet and a mild laxative previous evening is all. That is. Do you practice some form of uh, modified ERAS? Protocol. Or oh, I, I bet that that's the that under now. So definitely that that's a good thing to do. And enter first. <coughs> Thank you so much, sir. I would request you to please move towards now the right open, side of the auditorium. Now open the blades. Uh, for a photograph and for the mementos. Uh, next, I would like to call upon stage uh, Dr. Major General D.V. Singh, Senior Consultant Neurologist in Venkateshwar Super Speciality Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Rupesh Shah, Chief Uro-Oncologist in Sims, Ahmedabad. Uh, Dr. Dharambir, Consultant Neurologist in Yashaman Hospital, Jodhpur. Uh, Dr. Prashant and Sharma. Lift, lift it up so that the mesentery falls down. Dr. Prashant Sharma, Consultant Neurologist, Fortis, Noida, and Dr. Anil Sharma, Consultant Neurologist in Jaipur. Post here, buddy. Uh, I request the chairpersons to please move towards the right side of the auditorium for a photograph and for the mementos. Yes. Ro rotate, rotate your plates. So we are extending the incision further. Rotate and lift. Yes. Now we can close. It. And five. Doctor Alavat. Yeah. Uh, can you s uh, tell that to avoid the devascularization of bowel, what are the precautions? What we should take while firing when you have separated the ileum? Yep. Uh, I think the main thing is that uh, you know uh, you have to be. Uh, so don't don't take too much of a uh, mesentery and uh, actually you know most of the devascularization occurs when you divide the so 
Dr. Lauer, why is Haya? Have you uh, ever felt that ICG helps here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We'll no. use the ICG. We'll, we are going to use the ICG in this case. Okay. And anything regarding directions of uh, that stapler? Yes, sir. Rotate. Good. Good position. So the bobble color looks good right here. No, the point is that why use ICG after instead of before? No, uh, that's right. But you know, we, we are by using ICG more for the uh, conduit and the ureters. You can use it. You can use it anywhere. You can use it two times, three times, whenever you have doubt. But but my uh, concern would be ureter more than anything else. <coughs> and one more point that in obese patients, sometimes that mesentery cover the almost half of the intestine uh, segment. Absolutely. So Absolutely. in such situation, what are your tricks and tricks to avoid uh, any then, then problem? The, that's uh, the point that Dr. Singh pointed out, that take the sutures and fix the serosa to serosa. Or you can even dissect the fat off. I have seen that people uh, doing it uh, in obese patients. That you can dissect the fat off, take some fat off, and then then do it. Sir, do you close a mesentric window routinely or uh, you don't have to do it? You can do it, but sometimes, you know, when it can sometimes twist the bobble. You have to be very careful. So, if you are trying to close the mesentery gap, uh, then, then you can kink the bobble. If you don't, then you can herniate the bobble. So, you know, it is a... Just so that the internal herniation is always an issue if uh, the window is not closed. So just limited uh, closer of it always. Uh, yeah, just yeah. So you can uh, keep your to keep yourself happy that I have done it. You can put two sutures, uh, but uh, but I don't know whether it serves any purpose. It's a many times you know we do things because we have been told that this is the way they should be done. Uh, but definitely you know both the things that you can. Somebody would definitely report that there was a herniation through the mesentery and somebody would always report that there was a kick because of the... Uh, <coughs> and while preparing a robotic neobladder, once you have done the vasicourethral anastomosis, so after that you are doing ileoileal. Yeah. So yes. what we are the, uh, the length of the bowel, how will you select? Right, we, we, have, we, we had a silk suture, probably you did not notice that. It is still inside, you can see on the right side. So uh, that, that suture was taken as uh, 15 centimeter. So 15 centimeter uh, bowel distally and 30 centimeter proximally is what we have done. So 15 of it would be used for the chimney and other 15 each would be used to rotate the bobble and make it into a, you know, neo okay. So let's come to the neobladder part now. <coughs> so that's the distal segment. So that's the suture that we measured it with. So 
this will come like this. Okay. Yeah. So that's here it is very important to take some sutures and approximate the bubble together. Anything, any sir. In your experience, any difference while preparing uh, this robotic neobladder and uh, previously what stood or neobladder in patient voiding or any uh, outcome of both? No, no. I, I think I think robotic wise, the uh, advantage has been the sphincteric, uh, say saving the uh, sphincter and the nerves, and uh, probably that is. I have seen some hypercontinent patients. I have seen uh, people uh, some uh, incontinent leaks also, but uh, I I don't have enough experience to say that you know one is better over the other. But this works very well. Robotic, I think the biggest advantage of robotic is the anastomosis and uh, the, the saving of the sphincter and the nerves. Yes. And any uh, incidence of leakage of uh, urinary the leak or had you encountered? Of, any one of them could leak was. Yeah, okay. So that's what I was saying. That the, the best period to be happy after a cystectomy and diversion is the first two days. So that's the mark at uh, 15 centimeter on this side. And that's another mark. So that will be the chimney. Now we'll open up the bowel for detubularization. So if you can keep put, push your grasper through this and spread the bowel. So you need bowel is very well prepared. So no preparation needed. So here we will come
closer to the mizan tree when crossing this area because you have to save the anastomosis. and move again to the center of the mesentery, center of the bowel. What are your protocol for neobladder uh, flushing and everything? How after how many hours you start? No, we don't do that. Like the urine keeps on flushing it. So to prevent mucus so block and catheter blockage. Yeah, if if that happens, then otherwise we do we don't we don't do it regularly. Soda by card, I definitely we give. From audience that regarding neobladder that uh, mucus plug and flushing is it not required or you put large 24 French catheter? No, many centers they do follow for about uh, you know a week or ten days, um, once or twice in a day. So for, there will be a lot of suturing here now for next one hour. If you want to go for lunch, you can. Bobble looks good and pink. I'm very happy with the color.
Dr. Elavat, uh, Dr. D.V. Singh here. Hello. Hello, Dr. Elavat. Yeah. Dr. D.V. Singh. Hi. Hi. Uh, meanwhile, when you are doing this long uh, work for so suturing with reconstruction of the neobladder, yeah. we would like to know from you any tips or any issues in the construction of this neobladder. I think the Main thing is uh, the cirrhosa to cirrhosa. So as you would see, the yeah. main thing is not very tight. You know, don't, don't over tighten it. Especially robot can really, uh, you know, strangulate the tissues. And just cirrhosa to cirrhosa. Okay, so you stay outside the, you stay in the submucosa. Yeah. So that the mucosa gets in, inverted completely. True. If the audience has any questions or any issues, they can kindly ask. Another you was you about to tell something else? Dr. Alavar? Yeah. Were you about to tell something else? <coughs> no. We were asking for more white. Okay. So you know this will the uh, straight parts that right part would be anastomose to the left distal part and the uh, proximal part of the segment would fold up. Anesthesia people are happy because we can uh, make the patient straighter if they want. Meanwhile, OR3 are ready. Can someone present case? Am I audible? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the live demonstra operative demonstration from OR1. Uh, now we have the third case uh, for today, and it is planned for uh, palliative uh, laparoscopic radical nephrodirectomy. Uh, moving to the case, a uh, 55 year old male without any comorbidity and past surgical history, chronic tuberculosis. He came with chief complaint of left flank pain for last two years and persistent painless cross hematuria for, for four months. He initially he was evaluated outside with uh, CT thorax abdomen pelvis in uh, December 2022. It showed heterogeneously enhancing asymmetrical circumferential wall thickening involving the left upper, ure upper and mid ureter with moderate left hydroureter nephrosis. Lesions so, uh, of extracerosal spread with loss of fat plane with psoas muscle. Few enhancing nodes in mid and lower lower para aortic region and along the left common eyelid vessels. Then he underwent a, a ureteroscopic biopsy from left ureter mass on 19th of December, and the HP showed no evidence of dysplasia and malignancy. And he uh, again underwent a true cut biopsy from the left mid ureter mass on 30th of December. The HP was revealed left uh, uh, urothelial carcinoma high grade. Patient underwent NACT. Uh, 
of first cycle on 7th of January and second on 24th Feb. Feb. He was then referred to Ames Jodhpur for further management. On examination, general condition is fair, well built, ECOG 0, no palate ectra cyrosis, lymphatidomathy or edema, where peripheral soft, non tender, no palpable lump uh, um, observed. Local examination of the genitalia is normal, DRE, anal tone uh, normal, grade 1 prostate, firm, non tender, non nodular, rectal mucosa is free. He was investigated further, uh, his hemoglobin is 9.4. Uh, total count is 7,600 7, and platelet is 3.5 lakhs. KFT, LFT and serum alkaloids are normal. Then he underwent a FDG PET scan at our center and it revealed ill-defined enhancing soft tissue thickening is seen involving the left, upper and mid ureter from PUJ for a length of 10 cm, causing moderate hydroerythronephrosis with parent camel thinning and relatively decrease in enhancement of the left kidney and shows loss of front vein with the left psoas muscle, left common iliac artery and vein. Multiple heterogeneously enhancing left paraiotic nodes are seen, largest 1 into 1.1 cm, few aortocaval and upper internal iliac heterogeneous lymph nodes with FDG away. This is the CT urography images. There is a mass in the left mid ureter. The diagnosis of uh, left, upper and mid ureter TCC was made and the plan is palliative nephroscopic radical uh, nephroeurythectomy with uh, blood cuff excision in view of persistent hematuria and intractable flank pain. Thank you. So what may be the cause of <coughs> intractable flank pain in this patient? It is just because of the myelin, uh, the hydronephrosis? Sir, it is probably because of the uh, hydronephrosis only. Or it is the involvement of the some nerves, paraspinal nerves uh, in the, uh, by the uh, malignant. Sir, mass. it is the advanced disease which is involving the nerves also. So uh, usually we have seen that this kind of pain usually due to involvement of the nerve rather than the hydronephrosis. So if you are doing a palliative uh, uh, kind of nephrotectomy, Sometimes this kind of pain persisted because uh, you, you tend to leave part of the mass lesion with that patient and uh, uh, sometimes they may require celiac plexus block and all palliative kind of pain management. Just a opinion. Agreed sir. Sir, I am handing uh, mic uh, to Dr. Anup Kumar sir now. Good afternoon, Dr. Anu. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Rupesh here. Dr. Anu. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Rupesh, how are you? Yeah. Fine, fine. So, we are we're just putting the first port, uh, doing the encephalic. Uh, you, have, you heard the case history. Yes, yes. We it's have a case like history. A, it's more like a palliation only. It's a very locally advanced case, you know. Yes. And uh, it is uh, adhered to the common allic artery also. So we have to see whether it will be resectable or not at that area. Yes. So we'll my see. question is how much time in your clinical practice you encountered such case for palliative no, nephro urethrectomy? No, they are rare presentations. We do, get, we do get these cases, but not very frequently. And uh, again, uh, because indication here is only the palliation and not the cure. We know that. So, once in a while we do that case, but not routinely. Okay. Okay. Right. Fourth line. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, this is Dr. Prashant here. So, what are you planning to do here, sir? Would it be, uh, it will be an intraoperative analysis, and then based on that, you'll be going for lymph node dissection? Or you're not contemplating to do any lymph node dissection at all, given that how... Uh, so the lymph node dissection, we are not planning in this patient because already uh, suspicion, yeah, because the suspicion of already metastasis is there, so it will, it is not therapeutic in this case, huh? and we know it's already uh, 
nuclear vans and probably metastatic also. So that's why we are only aiming to remove the thyroidectomy part so that patient becomes symptom free. That's the only plan. And you rated as long as the uh, the entire thing or uh, just uh, uh, will you be going for bladder cuff sir? Yeah, we will definitely want to go for the bladder cuff. Like, so it all depends. Uh, it sir. all depends the position of the common iliac artery. This is what I mean. My uh, my worry is that if it is totally infected by the tumor there, then it might be unacceptable tumor in that area. Yeah. So, Doctor Anup, how does the taking blood cup food going to help you with this patient? Because this is already <clears throat> metastatic or so. So, uh, how the blood cup taking fluorophyll going to act, uh, help the patient? I, I got your point because uh, it is not for cure. But the thing is, uh, if although this patient the survival rate is very poor, but we, we, we do see patients surviving for more than two years or so. So if he survives more than two years on chemotherapy, he might develop a recurrence in the bladder. So we don't want to do any more surgery there. So that's why if it is not very morbid procedure, just take 10, 15 minutes extra, we might go for the bladder cuff. So let's see how it goes. But I am planning for the bladder cuff if it is resectable at the level of common allied cuff. Okay. okay. In Can we glasses please? The three glasses. Sorry for the interruption. I would like to make an announcement that the lunch is being served in the hall near the main entrance. Harmony, it's a working that lunch. Works. We won't be breaking for it. I request all the delegates to proceed for lunch okay. as per convenience. Good. Also, Thank kindly do not you. carry food or drinks inside the Thank auditorium. You. Thank you. The back foot. Back foot. No, no, back foot. Always <laughs> So it is foot pedal, not foot pedal, eh? And that is what is coagulation. Coagulation. Last of volume, but I need light. We can put it off if you want. Only one light you can keep ready. Can we have a PIP off in Dr. Anom's case? We always go for a total laparoscopic or robotic, whatever we are doing, total laparoscopic or robotic approach for the removal of cup of bladder. Uh, we don't do endoscopic uh, resection of the orifice. Yeah. We are using an advanced harmonic paddy, uh, scalpel. What will be your landmark to identify ureter in this case? As almost from PUJ 10 cm tumor is there and it's a palliative case. So you will be going more lower down? So, yeah, I will first go in the area of the renal hilar area and we'll see how the lymph nodes are there. And we'll try to approach the ureter in the normal where there is no, no mass and no adherence to the surrounding structure. You can see I'm just dropping the bowel close to this. And after colonic mobilization, we'll go for the hilum. I want a foot paddle if it's there. Okay. You have used three port or more? So right now we are using three port, but then later on I will put one more port. And uh, if required for spleen also, we put one more port. So that depends upon case to case. Uh, so right now, three ports we are using.
So the advanced harmonic scalpel, you know, can see it makes your life slightly easy, and uh, you can cut and plug at the same time, make your surgery faster and hemostatically better. फाइव का बोर्ड अड़ी रखेगा। The mass is at the level of L3, L4. I will use a one more five meter fork. Keep it ready. Do you think that in such cases, upper pole mobilization and starting from upper aspect would be easier? Uh, basically, our concept is to reach to the hilum and of course, uh, take care of the vessels. And then of course, you have to mobilize all around. So, yeah, if the, if the lower pole is involved and uh, then uh, you can come from the upper pole, but normally, come back please. We uh, we go for the hilum first. Give me five minutes per pole. Bara per Twelve is Twelve. 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 So normal. Right. Give me one back pocket. So one assistant can come there. Do you have one more back foot? Uh, cross it, cross it like. So your plan is to identify hilum first and clip the artery and vein. And if you are able to do it, then you may proceed for little down. Yeah, so I, I will first go for the hilar dissection. And before clipping, I will also see the ureter structures. And uh, then I will go for the hilar clipping. Okay, give me the uh, harmonic. So we have put the fourth port now, just for attraction. In robotic, that is done by the fourth arm. And uh, here we are using the uh, assistant. I don't, I don't need this uh, lock. So our normal protocol is we identify the ureter and then we follow ureter along with the gonadal vessel and we reach to the uh, hilum. But uh, we'll see in this case how it goes. And what is your usual protocol to evaluate such advanced case? Two cycle of chemotherapy and or you wait for at least complete four cycle almost? Now we give two cycles and uh, we do CT scan again. If patient is responding, we give one more cycle and after three cycles, we take up the patient. Uh, Dr. Anu, yes, sir. Uh, 
Since you normally everybody will proceed with the ureter or the gonadal vessels first, so why are you doing a different thing in this particular case? No, I am going the for same way, sir. I am going into the same area first, but but I said that I will dissect the uh, just hold it. I will dissect the hilum, and before clipping the hilum, I will look for the ureter status. How is the density adhered to the hyaline vessel? That I have to see. What is the status of that mass? Because once I clip the artery and vein, mm -hmm. then I have to fit it to the nephrectomy part. That in any case you have to do, isn't it? If it is unacceptable, then we might have to abandon the procedure, sir. Because there is no point of removing the kidney and leave the whole mass here. Then there is no point of doing the surgery. So I will, I will uh, do the nephrectomy only if I am able to remove the mass. Otherwise, I won't do the nephrectomy, sir. Hmm. That looks like the, the mass is there. Close please. So our main aim in this case is palliation, removal of the mass, so the patient does not cause, uh, has uh, uh, any hematuria in the future. That is the only aim in this case. We can't cure this patient with the surgery. Close here. So if you are not able to resect the mass, then I, we should not proceed for the effect. So in that case, we should go to the mass first. <coughs> yeah, that's the mass. Okay, it's there, right there, right in the front of the mass, L3, L4. Look sir, palliative radiotherapy for hematuria could, could have been an option. Palliative radiotherapy? For the hematuria. So they have given the chemotherapy, there is a partial response. Uh, these tumors, the radiation uh, is not very good, the response is not very good. Uh, Only for the palliation purpose, like in bladder tumor sometimes uh, uh, undesectable tumor we give palliative radiotherapy for immaturity. Even prostate cancer uh, in <coughs> metastatic or something we give palliative radiotherapy. <coughs> Just to control the image here. That could have been an option. Just asking for my understanding. No, that, that option is there. Definitely is that there. Yeah. So, if this mass is found unresectable, then that's the next option. Better is this? Can you carry out a Doctor, no? Doctor, yes, sir. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Doctor, no? Uh, in such cases where we don't have any landmark and uh, the, can't we take the bigger vessels as a landmark to go for along with dissect along with it? And in case the, if we don't find a pain, then it's better to abandon at an early stage. That is, I don't know, what's your take on it? Because finding ureter will be a little difficult because. We are almost there, uh, we are going towards the ileic bifurcation and uh, trying to identify the ureter at that area.
Okay, give me my line. Hello. Thank you, chairpersons, for an illuminating discussion. I would request all the chairpersons to proceed to the right side of the auditorium to collect their mementos and for a group photograph. Now I request Dr. Santosh Kumar, Professor in Urology at PGI Chandigarh, Dr. Ram Dayal Sahu, Associate Professor in Urology from SMS Jaipur, Dr. Chawar Lal, Associate Professor in Urology from CMC Vellore, Dr. Prashant Gupta, Consultant Urologist from Jaipur, Dr. Sanjay Venbal, Consultant Urologist from Jaipur, and Dr. Amit Singhvi, Consultant Urologist, Medipals Hospital, Jodhpur. Kindly join us on stage, sir. Dr. Anup? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir, we support this uh, percentage with uh, curative intent uh, along with the one uh, solitary small papillary bladder tumor. Uh, what will your approach be? Bladder tumor is there, then of course uh, we have to do TRBT. Along with the TRBT, uh, we do radical nephrotectomy, cuff of bladder, and lymph node detection. Okay, sir. So that should be our approach. And behind the ureter, so, with uh, TRBT, sir, any chance of post-operative leak or you will give irrigation along after this radical nephrotectomy, sir? No, no need for uh, irrigation after TRBT. Normally, after TRBT, don't give irrigation. So, not required. This seems like to be ureter, Dr. Oh. Yeah, I was just ch checking it out. Section the time. Anup sir. Yes. Uh, in routine nephrotectomy no cases, okay. do you perform left node dissection? Yeah. Ru For routinely we perform left node dissection, but in this case, uh, uh, there's no. This is the uh, palliative only. Yeah, there's no need for that, but yes, routinely. Uh, that should be done in nephrotechnics. Only for sampling purpose or? No, we, we have to do, you should do it a proper template as you do for a, 
uh, radical hysterectomy. Same template we use uh, for lower upper ureter, lower ureter, different templates we are using. Thank you. Maybe you can check here. Lock. Are you telling me? Hello. Wave theater is disconnected. Mr. Chairperson, I am Dr. Sivarama Krishna. One question I wanted to ask Dr. Anu. Since he is having so much of difficulty identifying the ureter, is it possible that uh, he can try go downstairs somewhere where normal ureter is expected, dissect it upwards? Anu, sir, is not connected. Audio is up. Uh, just a small announcement. Uh, the PG quiz is going to start on the first floor of the auditorium. You can make your way uh, towards the quiz. All residents to please note.
You are middle now. Eh? Middle. Uh, Anup, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult dissection here around the lower core. So, uh, yeah, question yeah. from audience: uh, It is possible to go a little bit down for the normal ureter? So, actually, the this is extending uh, right to the common alley bifurcation. Yes, sir. So, like, yeah, it's extending down also. Huh. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. We can go more towards the hilum, but downwards it is almost extending up to the common alley bifurcation. It's a long, it's a long, uh, long segment thickening. Yeah, yeah long okay. segment thickening. So, um, if you have seen the report, it says 10 centimeter segment. Right, sir. So, it's a very long segment. Normally, it is not there, but in this, it's an unusual case to have 10 centimeter long segment. Uh, Chair, can I ask Dr. Anup directly? <coughs> Anup, Dr. Shiva. Anji, sir. Wo, I was asking if there will be a normal ureter. I know it sounds desperate. I know it will be there. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to get into this plane, lifting the the ureter. We think will be in this complex fissure. It should be here because this is all. I was asking pelvic brim ke pas. Yeah, Sir? Yes. Suction, please. A gauge, please, Vijay. A gauge, please, Vijay. Can you see what I have Clip ready to keep. Live clip behind. Take section of the section. Sir, man. Then four chair, man. Hmm. Section ready. Lo. Ek mujhe gossip di dega. Clip ready to keep. Metal. Anup sir, in this situation, can you put a, another port for suction and clipping simultaneously? Yeah, we already have one port and we are waiting for suction. You can put it there and then we'll put a clip. Metallic clip lane, but I wanna Clip lay metallic, metallic clip behind me. Mm -hmm. 
बंद ही नहीं हो रहा है एक क्लिप ऊपर लगाएंगे तो दिस लुक्स लाइक ए न्यू वस्कुलरिटी इन द ट्यूमर एरिया एंड दिस वी आर एक्सपेक्टिंग टू बी मोर बिकॉज द ट्यूमर इज गोइंग एक्स्ट्रा सिरोजली एंड लॉट ऑफ डस्टम प्लास्टिक रिएक्शन ऑल अराउंड नहीं लगा ढंग से लगाओ एक और दिखाओ तो ढंग का वाला नहीं हमारे पास जो दब दब ही नहीं रहा है यार तो ढंग का है उसकी लाओ तो ऐसा नहीं है जो हम हम ही प्रेस कर लें ये नीचे करो नहीं बनाना करो उसको दबाओ लीवर को दबाओ नहीं बनाना दबाया आई नीड अ गुड क्लिप अप्लायर हाँ वेयर आई थिंक जस्ट गुड अ स्मॉल क्लिप हाँ सिंपल वाला क्लिप है और क्या थोड़ा सा सक्षम कर लीजिए बस एक क्लिप लगा दे हल्का सक्षण हमें दिखा दीजिए Is all mass. You can see there in the audience that all this is a mass, uh, ureteric mass looks like the head to surrounding structure. All this is a mass, and this is the lower down is a common iliac bifurcation. What is happening to harmonic? Harmonic, please. Can I can start the harmonic again? This is the ureter. Eh? Mm. We can go in this plane. Mm. We we try to lift this because plane is not well defined. Mm. We can lift here. Go. This is the swath. Eh? We can reach up to this. We lift everything up, and then we try to go here. Eh? Ready? Go. Yeah. So this looks like the ureter with the mass. Can see there? That's all the ureter with the mass. It's extending right up to the common iliac bifurcation. So we are trying to go here, lift this up, and then we we'll dissect here and see the site, the relationship with the common iliac. हाँ कर दी कर दी वी आर वी आर डूइंग अवर जॉब यू कैन स्विच मीन वाइल कैन वी सिफ्ट टू रोबोटिक फॉर आई थिंक अलावा सारी जड़ी फॉर यूरोट्रो एंट्री के नाजमस सिद्ध सेम दिन आओ हेलो Yes, sir. We are audible. Hi. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So you know well, what we wanted to show at this time, there was some doubts that you know. So here is we have done the uh, neo bladder. This part of the neo bladder is still open, which will close in the last after the stents have been put in and they'll be taken out from here. That's the Foley's catheter, 
from the urethra and the stents would also come out here and the stents would come out, you know, it will take them out at the uh, And this is the chimney. So now uh, this chimney will come here. So it, these are the two ureters on the right side and they are without tension. So, you know, you can see that, that they are absolutely relaxed. So we'll make a wallace here and this would be anastomosed to the uh, chimney like this and we'll take out the stents from here and uh, we'll use this. So that, that, that's how we plan it. Is it clear now? Yes, sir. Okay. So the second part that we wanted to show at this time was the use of ICG for the vascularity of the neobladder, for the ureters and the anastomosis here. Okay, so we'll do the ICG now. Now that everything is there for finally, okay? So. Ah, Carlo, you take it. <laughs> so you see the vascularity of the neobladder? The, and this is the ileo ileostomy, very well, okay, and that, that's, these are the two ureters, yeah, so, you know, now it shows that, you know, we can, we have to trim them a bit, so, okay, so, yeah, yeah, this much we'll have to sacrifice, this, we were planning anyway, this we were planning anyway, so, the anastomosis neo bladder is good. Hello. Yes, sir. Right, sir. The after recently, this tabel part of both your the uh, length will be adequate to yeah, the even end. even there. You know, yeah, up to uh, what where the forceps is. That's the limit. After that, uh, everything and the bottle anastomosis is good. You can see that here. Okay, so that makes me happy. Sir, like uh, previously, somebody was uh, discussing regarding the uh, tunneling of the left ureter from left to right. Uh, why not to uh, <coughs> bring the <coughs> keep the ureter on the left side itself and directly anastomose to the chimney? See, we can do, do that. We can even take the right ureter to the left side. Do anything. But what I'm saying is that you know that I mean, this this is a pelvic bladder, and uh, so you know. The lights back, please. So that's the that's the. So the this is these are the ureters are coming in the iliac fossa. Here. So either they would come here or they would go. So it doesn't matter. So if you take this here, you you can anastomose them here, or you can anastomose them here on this side. Give me scissor, please. So that's the vascularity. right on my face. Second ureter slipped back. Got divided completely. So, so I would need another stay.
Can you hold the urethra here? Or I can do that. Leave it, leave it and hold it now. Yeah. <coughs> okay, give me a second. Hold it. Needle holder. This got completely disconnected. Yeah, give me one stick. Just take a little bit of it. I request all the PG students kindly proceed to the first floor of the auditorium for the PG quiz. Thank you. And can you give me a photo PDS? A four of PDS data, 15 centimeter, 20 centimeter. एक फीडिंग ट्यूब है उसमें
Okay. Honey, I just wanted to see. Abhi maine jo suture liya tha na apical. Just wanted to test that. Love. This time, abhi to you know. Love. Hmm. What happened? ले जाओ पता नहीं कहा जाएगा ले दिया
Alava uh, sir. Hi. Uh, you will uh, use the uh, same number of IFT both theatres or different different color code like six branches eight branches. Uh, say that again. I didn't hear clearly. So uh, as, uh, this uh, asking that you will use the same type of interpreting tube in both theatres or different size for color coding like the right theatre is small size and left side is larger size. Uh, can somebody uh, hear what was asked? I didn't get it either because this probably the sound. You want to take it over? Then. Whatever it is, here it is unsuccessful. So we can't Correct. move the whole thing. The mass we can't move like this. Awesome. यहाँ पर तो क्रॉस कर रहा है नहीं महिलाएं देखो बढ़िया आती जा रही हैं
uh, allow us, sir? Yeah. It will not compromise the bird supply of Van Rob Chimney. This much of Again? Uh, Again, I'm not able to hear clearly somewhere. Say that again. What, what did you ask? This looks like the erotic mask, huh? yeah. and this this is this is erotic mask which you have. And it's my green jar, you know. The little man is still there. And this story starts here. Yeah, behind the chair, that's the reason. Yeah, we not very clear. And even if we get better here. This area में तो विशेष तो नहीं कर पाएंगे, हैं? इसी में होना चाहिए। सबसे बड़ा है। Very fast clean। ऐसे हाँ, ठीक ऐसे जा रहे हैं लोग तो बचा नहीं कुछ उसी में जा रहा है। Mass में ये रिटर है। अब एक सेंडी पेन सेंडी बिटर हाँ। तो अगर टेंशन टर की बात करें यहाँ से स्टार्ट हो रहा है, यहाँ स्टार्ट from here and going up to here, हैं? � कि हम इधर से ऐसे देख रहे हैं ना नॉर्मली हम इसको ड्रॉप कर सकते हैं ये बावन जा रहा है इससे भी फायदा होगा मैं ड्रॉप कर हैं थोड़ा हारमोनियम को पास करेंगे प्लीज क्योंकि इस पोजीशन में हम से ज़्यादा नीचे नहीं जा पाएंगे कितनी पोजीशन है ना हाँ पूरी तो आगे एक सेना लेकर मारेंगे ये बैठो जाके अंदर ठीक है ना इसको अगर हम ड्रॉप कर भी दें तो सपोर्ट पीछे करें याद है अगर हम ऐसे देखते हैं ना ब्लेडर हमारा कहाँ है? ब्लेडर हमारा इस तरफ जाएगा। इधर से ये बेटर जा रहा है हमारा। इसी इसी मार्च के अंदर बेटर है। ठीक है? सेक्शन देखो, देखो। I think we have to give take a call now because that mask looks unsuitable. It's a common one. Where our area was, that is not unsuitable. Where is the mask? Where is the mask? Yeah, I'm going to take a look at it. Yeah, I'm going to take a look at it. Yeah, I'm going to take a look at it. 
Thank you, Chairpersons, for an interesting session. Such I would request all the Chairpersons to proceed to the right of the auditorium to collect their mementos and for a group photograph. Okay. So now, Next, I would like to call up on stage Dr. Ashwin Tamankar, Consultant Neurologist, Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai. Dr. Kamlesh Patel, Consultant Neurologist, Zydus Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Rajesh Gangas. Consultant Neurologist from Kurukshetra, Dr. Ajay Gandhi, Assistant Professor from Bikaner, Dr. Govardhan Chaudhary, Assistant Professor and Head of Urology Department from MDM Hospital, Jodhpur, Dr. Rohit Ranjan, Consultant Neurologist, Gorakhpur. After the posterior, after the posterior plane. Huh. I would have done that. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, Dr. Kamlesh, sir. So, I just want to show what we have done so far. Yeah, I, I think you it can, is... You can see this is the uretric mass starting from here. Okay. And this is all tumor. Going, okay. This is the gradual vein going through the tumor. Okay. This tumor extending right from here, 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 till this 10 centimeter segment here. Okay. And this is the aortic mass. This one is the aortic mass. This one. And this is... Uh, Loose cut. Combining with this mass here. So, both mass are joined together here. Okay. And the brittle, brittle goes like this. So this in this area it looks no, unresectable no. because this is all stuck here to the underlying Person permanent right. vessel. Okay. See there? And this was my concern hmm. right from the beginning. If it is unresectable in this area, I want to proceed for nephrectomy. I can do nephrectomy from here, you can see. I got the pain. Yeah. But this yes. will not benefit the patient. But if you get it in the nephrectomy, then yeah. chances of immaturity might be less. Yeah. Okay. So it is always better to get it than the nephrectomy. Yeah. That is what I was hmm? Yeah, so because if we have to remove the... Another option to put a hemolog clip just above the tumor, if it is possible, then there will be no hematuria. If you eat, there is no even if you in production is there. And I think yeah, above yeah, that, ureter so might get little bit of damage. Yeah, just Oh, just okay. Because this mass is unacceptable, you can see there, sir. It's all unacceptable. I, I, I cannot just, remove this yeah. mass. But I think if it is possible, get it in the nephrectomy. That will help to the patient. How nephrectomy is unlikely to help the patient because this kidney is likely to be non functional. No urine is coming down. Or bar me come. Or bar, bar, bar. Outside, outside, outside. I don't want to see it. But yeah. So, uh, what we what we feel right now that uh, even if we do the nephrectomy, the mass is still there and the bleeding will continue from this area. Uh, so, and this is almost non-functioning kidney on the scan. Why? So, suction. So, this looks unacceptable to me right now. Okay, I'll push it. No, you do Feeding tube, do the doctor say? Yeah. Or passage or something. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And sir, this is a tumor you can see. That's a tumor. Yeah, yeah. And I have to do the nephrectomy to cut hair through the tumor. So that will uh, further violate the tumor uh, and uh, it will make it already it is metastatic, it will spread the tumor all around. So, okay. I, I don't want to cut through the tumor. This is our tumor, sir. This is our okay. tumor. If, if yeah. we want to get it in the open, can it be possible? Convert it no. to open then? No, sir. Because this, this all area is stuck to the common allic acid. Even if they do open, okay. you can't do it, sir. So this, see, I, I will just show you here. I can feel it here. It is all stony hard. Yeah. And this is the, this is the aortic mass right there. Right. It is, a, it is a combination of aortic mass and the uretric mass and they are all joining here. And this is long segment 
right up to here, long segment. I here. think that ureteric mass is adherent to the vessels, big vessels. Yeah, yeah, it is adherent to the common allied vessel, sir. Okay. Uh, this all area is uh, uh, common allied vessel uh -huh. bifurcation, so it is uh -huh. all in that area. Uh -huh. Okay, and lower down that part is ureter or something else? Uh, lower down, if you see, sir, uh, the mass is uh, mass is extending right up to here. No, no, and that structure below, which is going on the upper side. No, this is the it gonadal. It is going into the bladder, I think. This is gonadal, sir. That is gonadal, right? This is gonadal. This much of thick. So you can see the gonadal is coming from here. This is the gonadal here, coming here, going engulfed in the mass, and then coming out here. Okay. So this whole thing is stuck here, and this is the underlying the aorta and the common leg bifurcation. Okay. So I think uh, this patient uh, won't benefit if I do nephrectomy. Number one, this mass is unacceptable, as I was thinking right from the beginning. And number three, as Dr. Surekha was saying, now the only option is uh, palliation of radiation and chemotherapy, because his survival is already uh, very less, whatever we might do. Okay. So I don't want to make his life you know, miserable by doing unnecessary surgery. It will not help his, this patient. Right, right. Right, sir? So okay. I think uh, I would like to abandon this case. And uh, thank you very much, sir, for uh, watching us. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Doctor, hmm? you. Uh, good decision, and we must no. uh, appreciate your patience. Now, yeah, thank you. Can we thank shift to the robotic coating? Thank you. Let's go. Bang kar dete hain. Drain down. Can we shift to Doctor Rajesh Alavat? No. Hello, Doctor Rajesh Alavat. Hi. Hi, Dr. Kamlesh here from Ahmedabad. Yes. Sir, I think on the left side, guide wire is not going, right? Yeah, no point of doing this. We, we had tried actually the feeding tube yeah, earlier. Yeah. For the sake of nephrectomy, I can win before, but there's no point, now. Nah. But that's what I will the initial beginning. I will do nephrectomy only if you take Otherwise, this mass will continue to, you know, bleeding will be through this mass. Right. The bleeding is through this mass, not from the kidney. And bleeding is happening through the mass, not through the kidney. Kidney with the mass in there is no point. I am just amara. Okay, I am just bending. Kar rahe. Ah, I have told you. I have told. I think this is what I told you, na? That that this is a uh, case where we should decide. If it happens, it happens. 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 If it happens, I have seen it before, but it is not possible. It will not happen. These are kind of cases, you just need some palliation. Sir, guide wire is gone? Palliation is gone. Yeah, guide wire. Now, guide wire is gone. No, no. It will be pushed out. It will be pushed out. What will you do in the open? Vascular is gone. Because we don't want to, because his survival is less than six months. We will do the best for the extension. Sir, if guide wire has gone, sir, can we try some smaller size stamp like 4.5 and 5 French? But why it's not going? That's the question. Sir, if guide wire is gone, sir, I think there is a two possibility. We tried our best to decide. No, we can't do it. We can't do it. Yeah, 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 Dr. Lava, there is a king most likely at the end, uh, at the entry of the mesentery. Yes. I, yeah. I, I, if it is not going smoothly, then it's definitely going to create problems later on. I know. Yeah, ureteric capsule is. You know, the, it lies yeah. absolutely straight. Yeah, it is absolutely straight. Even uh, twisting is not uh, looks like. 
और थोड़ा सा स्ट्रेट कर देते हैं यहाँ पे रिलीज कर देते हैं is coming up to that part of the ureter we don't know because you know but we know that uh, you know we have we we not a we have made it through the white tunnel right so you can see the ureter there yeah so Let's we'll be able to see uh, which part part it is going. Okay, can you switch the theater to Dr. Chandra Mohan? He is going to start a, I think, thulium laser, prostatectomy. Hello, Chandra Mohan. at the angle hello dr alhawa yeah sir if it is not going then what could be the your plan no it will go it has to go so you know that there has to be a, we have to rectify whatever it is so you know release the ureter more from opposite side even we can't take chances with that yeah hey, hey, just just i am taking it so Uh, can this uh, ureter be blocked for some time? Give him little Lasix. Let it get dilated and try. Yeah. The ureter is. That is a good option. Let's just connect connected there sometime anti grade mucosal flap can also create this kind of the problem which connect we are not able to rectify from down retrograde like bipolar
Got a lot. What about urotrotum proximally here? Some flap, if you go retrogradely, may be causing every time some flow. So, you know, it's good. So now there is no possibility of a kink here. It's released. Yeah, it looks like absolutely normal. Sir, you can check where the strength has reached from the opposite side. Ah, yeah, we'll just check. But now we, we are trying the guide wire first. Guide wire, yeah? Okay. So just, just guide wire, yeah, because you need to capture the damage. Just, just check. Guide wire? Okay, you can see the, I can see the uretic yeah, catheter. Yeah, we can see the uretic catheter. Yeah. So I think you are transastomotic, you can even keep till this also. Can you the down the You can, it's a transastomotic, hmm? you can keep it here also. If there is no stone or some obstruction here, the, you can just keep it the, here. Is the wire going now? Wire going? Okay, you can see the... We actually guide wire he did right Yeah, we are able to see the urethra catheter there. So might be, I think, mucosal flap. Nothing else. Yeah. Huh. There is the urethra catheter. Now we'll push the urethra catheter, we'll put the urethra catheter. Would you like to check once in the preoperative CT scan that there is no stone or some obstruction there? No, there was no hydronephrosis preoperatively, so I don't think so there is an obstruction. Guide work, call me, give me the This is sufficient for. So, this is 15 centimeters. So, this yes. is in the kidney. Yes, yes, yes. So, we'll check this. Difficult to say it's not something because it's I can't say it. But urine is coming out around the stent, so that is your purpose. Yeah. And and there is no blood. 
there is no that, image that's reality. another thing which i feel is good Distant is not outside your ureter. <laughs> no, no, it's not outside. <laughs> no, all possibility should be checked in this kind of difficult situation. No, we 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 can feel the all the that ureter catheter is there. Yeah, yes. it is. It is there. Yeah. It is even visible. Yeah, it's yeah. because of the color, it is visible. So it's not. It's uh -huh. in, and it's in 15 centimeters. Yeah, I think this is sufficient. If we can keep it. <laughs> So, what do we do, Sachin? Guide red dalke? Stand dalke? So, there is a possibility you can put a thinner stand, maybe four French or five. Ah, uh, yeah. Then, is there a bit of guide red dalke? But ureter is so good. Hold cover, distribute. It's not going to help, no. There is a no, instead is going beyond this anastomosis. So dismantling the anastomosis is not going to help probably. Yeah. Dr. Alawat? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people here in the audience who feel that may, most probably are going in a false passage. So there yeah. are two options uh, that are being suggested here. Number one who is... Do nothing or leave the catheter where it is. Number one is yeah. you do an unstented anastomosis. Because yeah. whatever okay. flap has happened, we, it no, is hopefully... We, we can put 10 centimeters. No. Uh, it's it's right up to here. We so even you can that. put a... No, no, sir, I don't think 60 no, no. No, no, the thing is like this, that initially it was going for 5 centimeters, then 10, now 12. So there's a possibility that the, it may be all the way up in some submucosal area. So if it is a submucosal flap, then there are two options. One is that even higher up, the ureter is dissected and a small ureterotomy is made and a guide wire is glided on both the sides. And over that, the stent, uh, double J stent is put in. Huh? Or, or, or it can be unstented. And hopefully, yeah. because of submucosal, uh, this... Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll do the urotomy and put the wire. Uh, so then, urotomy will have to be put even higher. Not at the point where it is obstructed. Huh. So even higher. It's an angle. So, so the upper, the upper urotomy will have and to be dissected. We'll, we'll have to, we'll be able to confirm the, any uh, false passage also, if we do yes, urotomy yes. here. Yes, so it has to be higher up. No, yeah, but make it along the, make it along, along the, yeah. 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 Now, now extend it along the... Yes, now through this a guide wire can be put in. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
सो Yeah, yeah. it is going easily right sir yeah actually the ureter catheter is quite rigid you will have to replace it with a stent which is softer don't push guide wire mm -hmm. uh, give it to me डिस्टल a big thanks to all the chair persons i would request you to please move towards the right side of the auditorium for a mentors and group photographs and uh, i would like to call dr saurav patel uh, consultant neurologist fortis hospital mumbai uh, dr saurav joshi senior consultant neurologist accord hospital faridabad dr subhna ram consultant urologist jodhpur and dr santosh kumar uh, professor of urology in pgi chandigarh to take the place on the stage guide wire nikal lo निकाल लिया कंप्लीट गुड यहां से मैं सीधा स्टैंड की डाल Trust me, boss. Trust me. Do it in transplant all the time. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Put a small suture here, and now.
Take it out. एक छोटा सा पीडीएस दे देना बस नहीं है ना ले जाओ Take it out. Good. You want to do the posterior end of anastomosis first? Ha, ah. ah, yeah, we later on, after the first layer. And you want if you want to put it right now you can.
वट इज दिस एक और नीडल है हेलो एम आई ऑडविल हेलो या यू आर ऑडविल फ्रॉम ओ टी टू अरे ये कहा गए हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यू आर ऑडिबल डॉक्टर Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to live operative demonstration from OR2. Uh, the second case for today is the bladder mass planned for a thulium laser in block resection. Uh, the case is 47 year old male, known diabetic without any addiction. Chief complaint is intermittent gross hematuria for last three months. Known case of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, large cell type since 2013. He received nine cycles of. He received. On examination, general condition is fair, well built, ECOG zero, no pallor rectus, lymphadenopathy. Investigation, uh, hemoglobin 12.6 and counts for 4200. PET CT uh, demonstrates uh, in urinary bladder multiple FTG avid endophytic mass arising from left and right lateral walls, largest 2.5 into 2.4 centimeter on the right intralateral aspect. Multiple FTG avid ill-defined pericardial deposits are seen along the right atrium and right ventricle without any obvious myocardial infiltration. At least two to three FTG avid left axillary lymph node level one. This is the CT urography showing the mass in the bladder. Diagnosis is known case of Hodgkin's lymphoma, stated post chemotherapy with bladder mass with hematuria. Plan is TRBT and proceed. Thank you. Now I am handing mic to operating surgeon, Doctor Vardhan sir. Can you show us the endoscopic view, sir? Dr. Chandramohan? Okay. 
is the two button. This. Okay. Dr. Chandraman, sir, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. So, how do you select sir? your patient for uh, end block resection? Uh, sir, uh, good afternoon. At the outset, uh, I thank uh, uh, Jodhpur Urology for organizing this wonderful workshop. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sandhu, sir, Dr. Uh, uh, Gautam, and uh, all other team, I thank first of all. Uh, bladder tumor TURBT is the standard. In this case, you can see a small tumor here. Uh, you can see an anterior wall tumor here. Here. Can you see, sir? Yes, yes. And uh, you see one more tumor here. Correct. Here. This tumor is, uh, for me, appears okay with the laser fiber. Entire thing I remove. This patient is already a case of uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a tumor you can see, sir. Yes. This is very ideal for uh, this thing. Then you can ask uh, uh, why you wanted to do Thulium. Can you give the fiber? Why you wanted to do Thulium if you wanted to do only one or two cases, small tumors? It is only for. Uh, the depth of penetration, if you are suspecting super tumor, it will give better idea of the muscle. Other than that, there is no advantage. Because 0.15 mm is the depth, we can give better idea. And in the area where dome-like thing is there, you can cut a designer cut-like thing. See, multiple patchy lesions are there. I will try to show at least uh, uh, two lesions with this Thulia fiber laser. When compared to uh, overall end block resection of bladder tumor is controversial. In certain conditions it is very useful, in certain conditions it is not at all useful. For example, this tumor may be going deep, it's very angry, and urinary orifice is here. Now I will start from here, go like this, go like this, and elevate. And second thing is, any time you can change it to, you can change it to the TURBT. TURBT is easy. Whereas this takes time, around 15 minutes more. Now energy settings, I am using incision, one, uh, uh, one wattage and uh, 10 hertz total equal to 10 power. Now I am using right pedal for the uh, this thing. Distension of the bladder is essential in this case, so that it, it cuts easily and you have to move very, uh, incision is right. So I am cutting here. Why not to start near you later? Ah, right, that's what I am telling you. So starting uh, later and go apart. Uh, you can do, sir. See, uretic orifice here, it is there. Uh, I wanted to keep, uh, take some edge. See, water outflow, I have uh, stopped. Now I will on. So that if the, if the uh, bladder is, see, you can see the, you can see the separation, sir, Santosh, sir. Yes, yes. Can you can see the separation without, if you stay for some time, if you stay for some time, you will get a charring like this. See, initially I did. If you move fast, if you move fast like this, it automatically lifts off. Like this here, I wanted to cut the, you have to move fast and bleeding will not be there. The biggest advantage is, whatever the vessel comes, uh, see here bleeding will not be there. What Only is your setting? 110. See how it is moving. See how it is moving. Only thing is that you have to move very fast. You should, you should not stay. And one more thing is that depth, it will go more. The ultimate uh, advantage is can you somebody uh, do the... Uh, can you see sir? Yes, How sir. I am taking edge. See, the vessels will immediately coagulate. This is primarily a coagulative laser. Whatever the major vessel, see, not even a drop will come. At the same time, it sticks also. Sometimes, see, it sticks. Sir. Then in that case, you can increase. See, as you go, there is no charring. And it is cutting like this, see. Here, as you said, no, sir, I don't want to, uh, I want to elevate and then cut the urinary orifice. 
so that lumen will not get affected. If I cut directly, lumen may get affected. See, you can perforate the bladder also with this bow outside also. Even outside vessel also sometimes uh, uh, get coagulated. See, here I am getting edge. I don't do the distal margin. I uh, usually in this surgery you don't request. See, this area where I am cutting, histopathologist can clearly comment uh, what is the uh, 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 tumor, uh, uh, this thing. Can you see, sir? Can you see the muscle fibers are here? Yeah. So here, like this, I am elevating. Entire thing will come in one go. Now, next controversy is, how will you remove it? If you really cut a large tumor, you cannot remove it. That is a totally theory. You can cut into with the, uh, you can cut with the, can you increase the uh, to uh, 10, 15? See, can you see the uh, fibers are here? Yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. So fibers are not getting uh, uh, coagulated. If you keep laser fiber too much outside like this, it sticks. So you have to keep uh, close, like, go close like this, then move like a pen. If you increase energy, you can... Whatever the large tumors, it will not cause bleeding because it's uh, too much coagulative laser. That's why if you use this laser in infantibular region or ureteric orifice region, it may stenose. Dr. Chandravan, Dr. Saurabh here. So how do you ensure the depth of this cutting? Because yes, you are cutting in between the muscles. So, yes, so we have to take muscle also. Yeah, you there. have to take muscle, otherwise this technique does not have any advantage. So what, the, so what is the impact on histopathological examination? Yeah, that, that is the worry. Sir, if so, you take so the what muscle, is the point of depth? Because ah, sir, sir, the tumor is not seen now. Sir, now. Okay. So histopathologist will see the tumor, how depth it is. We don't see it. That is what they aim. We should not see the uh, tumor. No, macroscopically, we are cutting in between the muscles. Or, yes, or just superficial to muscles. No, I am cutting through the muscle. Almost no, I will perforate the uh, bladder today. <laughs> Almost I will go outside. Uh, you will see at the end. You will see at the end. Uh, this muscle is almost uh, uh, two layers uh, uh, deeper. Can sir, you see, sir? In a tiny, uh, small tumor, how often you get cautery artifact? I, I mean to say artifact population. Sir, artifact, artifact uh, 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 0.15 mm is the depth of penetration, whereas cautery is phenomenally high, no, sir. When compared to this, if you do with cautery like this, it all becomes charred. Uh, see, here you can see, see the fibers are here, here. See yes, this fiber. See, we can see nicely. If the, if the, if the eyes only are seeing that, histopathologist can easily comment it. We have done around 25 cases. All the cases muzzle. Only thing is that unnecessarily for superficial tumors, you will go deep. For example, uh, in the intertrigonal region when I do, intertrigonal region when I do, uh, I will go unnecessarily deep. In one cut, uh, TURBT will come, but here you, you see, entire thing I am lifting in, in the muscle plate. In fact, uh, Sir, now in this part, you are exactly above the intramural part of ureter. So, how would you prevent the injury? Pardon, sir? At this part where you are cutting, you are exactly above the intramural part of ureter. Ah, yes, sir. You, you have to so, go superficial here. For example, you push here like this, push here like this, and see now it is elevated. You come close. You, you Because ureter, orifice, if you see the anatomy, it will go vertically dip down. It will not come horizontally like this. So unlikely. But otherwise, ureter gets damaged with this type of technique. If you keep uh, close, see, almost half of the tumor I lifted. Uh, the another disadvantage of this technique is opposite end uh, where it comes uh, you will not be able to see whereas with loop uh, you can easily uh, uh, you can easily see it see for example here 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 i have to mark like this i have to mark it like this see i have to mark i have to mark i have to mark 
and then come. No, no bleeder will bleed. This is a diffuse disease. I really don't know how much benefit I am giving to the patient. See, I am coming here. In the dome, you can you can take out the exact chunk. See, for example, if the if the if the orifice comes here, you be superficial like this, and you lift from the side. Sir, you are too far from the base of the tumor, margin of the tumor. I meant to say, don't you think so? Too far in the deep or uh, the no margin away from the medi tumor margin. Medial side, medial side, sir. Sir, here it is. See, ah, medial side. Yes, I am taking a little more, but anyway, I have cut it so I don't change the. Uh, this is little distended bladder. You can see like that. I will I will show the collapsed bladder. In distended bladder only this surgery can be done well. If you collapse the bladder, you cannot do this surgery. It's like a vortis. So what is the incidence of jerk in this? Ah, uh, uh, zero, sir. Zero, zero, zero. No, no discussion. Zero because this is not electricity. This is heat. And what are the chances of perforation? Because it is distended. Very high, very high, very high. Because you will go very deep here. I there is discussion uh, here in perforation. Yes, sir. The perforation is very high. In fact, I am perforating now. See, this is all almost. Uh, that is why the histopathology will come. Uh, what happened? So it it goes uh, deeper than what uh, uh, we expect. In fact, it takes time also. It's frustrating. Uh, uh, continuously, slowly doing. Then, then it what is suitable is for small tumors, uh, not, not wherever, large tumors. Wherever, wherever you are suspecting a 100% superficial disease, it is better uh, uh, to go with this. Wherever you are suspecting 100% deep, uh, it does not hurt. Sir. So you, can you do it in piecemeal, only in block? <laughs> yeah, wherever you want to cut, you can cut. But uh, the entire purpose uh, will go, no, sir. If you do piecemeal like in uh, no in, la in large tumor, so if you do in block, it ultimately is not going to give you any advantage. Any so, advantage? It will not give. The patient, uh, suppose large tumor, patient will be left with a large area of the of, only thing uh, I am saying is that this type, of, this type of fiber, you may not be able to see clearly in a uh, uh, TURPT. That is the only thing. Yeah, you can see. It's not like that. You can't see. Do you do in your regular practice? No, Left sir. I do less than. I, I I do less than three centimeter. This more than three centimeter to your bit. See here, it's almost it perforates if you distend the. Are you going to extend this? Pardon, sir. Are going to extend after to your bit? Uh, yes, sir. Better better stent. I have almost uh, uh, damaged the urinary carpus, so better to stent if I can. But uh, literature recently, uh, the EAU paper NQ said that because it's 1.15 mm depth, uh, there is no. Pro See, if you stretch like this, you will get little bit idea. So uh, here I am doubtful, so I have to, uh, I have to cut down in between, like what he said. Better to stand sir, anywhere if you have doubt. Okay, better to stand. If you could, have, if you would have done uh, TRBT. Bear control cut would have been much better than this. Okay, you could have avoided putting a stent also. And suppose yeah. it is a superficial because, tumor. Because chances of uh, implanting tumor cell is also there. So suppose uh, it, it's a superficial tumor. It's, it's a, not not this case. Then then uh, it is justified that. Uh, we have taken muscle in every every layer of this. Sir, uh, 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 sir, actually, muscle layer. If you don't comment in a slightly larger tumor, people are going for relook uh, TURPT after 15 days. Uh, then, 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 how how we will answer that, sir? If you are really more than three centimeter tumor is there, by chance if muscle doesn't come, even if lamprea propria comes, there's a high grade tumor. They say that uh, do TURPT after uh, 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 two weeks. That type of uh, uh, muscle not coming in this case is uh, very less. I am not saying this is the ideal procedure. It can't be uh, better than TUR. Only in conditions where you wanted muscle desperately uh, to prove that it is not muscle, not muscle, not muscle invasive, and you can wait surveillance in a young patient. 
muzzle is must. If that muzzle is not uh, available, then uh, as Santosh sir said, uh, uh, nearer to the uretric orifice, uh, I, I feel this is uh, not good, sir. Even this, uh, I am not happy. See, see the surface, sir. Can you see? All trabeculations. Sir, can you outline uretric, uretric outline? Can you, can you show Yes, sir. Us? Here it is there, sir. Here. Here. Here I have spared. Can you see, sir? Sometimes if the mucosa is averted like this, there is no need to stent also. I have come above this level. Uretric orifice goes down, not parallel. Still I am trying to... I, yes, I you might can have... follow up with ultrasound. Yes, sir. Without putting a stent also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because contamination is the theoretical part. You can go superficially like this here and cut it off. Uh, any curvature, any curvature can be uh, followed. Like dome also, you can do. For example, dome sometimes uh, uh, perforation can happen. With this, uh, even if you want to uh, perforate outside badly, you cannot do because maximum you can cut is only uh, only point uh, 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 five mm. Water, please. See, it's a field change. This is all. I cannot remove all this with this. It, it will, for that superficial change, this is no use. For superficial uh, disease, this is no use. For example, carcinoma in situ, like this thing, unnecessarily will be removing the too much uh, uh, You have, to, you have to move with this like this in enucleation because if it is falling, you cannot cut otherwise. Can you increase to, can you increase now because I am confident, I am away from the orifice. Can you increase the energy to 1.5 please? So that I will slightly, okay? Sir, this, uh, this is an incision, coagulation I am not requiring, 1.5. Ready? Karo. And if large tumor is there, we will reject afterwards when it when a small stock is there. People say that in that case, artifact anyway will come, but that, that artifact will be less. That artifact will be less. See, now I am peeling it off like this so that tumor goes away like this. If you have marked the opposite side, uh, then it exactly it will cut off uh, uh, there. I am quite deep. See here, if you see the edge here, edge like this. Sir, how many cases you have done uh, tumor over the uh, uretric orifices? Without, uh, I am able to see the mucosal outpouching of the uretric orifice, sir. You have seen that, that here, I have shown that. Here, here. See, I have, I have, I have uh, this small mucosa will help me if I am lucky. Otherwise, it will still us. So you have to follow up as Santosh sir said. Water, please. Sir, so for the uh, for the smaller growth, you will do a conventional T R B T. Uh, 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 conventional T R B T, definitely, sir. Otherwise, so you will use two instrument, one laser and one is. Uh, no, sir. Here, uh, this is the start one. All I have to change is the uh, all I have to change is the working element. That's all. Okay. Working element. Uh, I I brought both my work kit only today. Uh, working element as well as start working element like any other. Uh, it take small tumor. You will get uh, uh, you will get annoyed and say that Chandramohan uh, abandon this procedure because it will take lot of time for small also. In one in one cut it will come. See now, slowly like it's the enucleation type of uh, feeling is coming. Once you know that there, uh, what I wanted to say is that this type of, uh, this type of, uh, see sir, can you see sir? This. Sir, in, uh, uh, in uh, TRBT, enucleation is, I think, difficult to feel. It's more of a end block, right? 
Ah, n blocks. This is a complete n block. And if the if usually I take a nephroscope and forceps, a triprong forceps and take it out, it will come out. It will get folded. Cutting after releasing this bladder tumor, cutting into pieces is very difficult. It is a it is a hell of a job. And ultimately, the purpose uh, what you have done is uh, lost. So there, these are all. Uh, uh, disadvantage. This is not an established procedure. Only few people like NQ, uh, Scaffold uh, in the world are encouraging. And I am also not uh, uh, like a really fan of this. But whenever you wanted to see the muzzle, sir, you can't imagine. Muzzle will be seen so nicely uh, in the specimen, sir. I have seen with the histopathologist. They also say, now see, it is elevating itself. My difficult part is over. Only thing is that opposite side market, if you don't do, you will be going, mucosal lifting, 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 entire bladder you can lift. So always you see like this, and then cut wherever you want to cut a little deeper, so that you will finish that there, otherwise it will be going on. See like this, like this, see how the separation is happening. Like this you have to meet the other point. You are doing a radical. Chandra Bhavan? Yes, sir. Anil Varshni here. Yes, sir. Uh, I must compliment you for being very bold and doing good job. But uh, the only message I want to convey to the youngsters here is that the laser is very precise and you can uh, really go pre with precision layer by layer. So, if we have to get the muscle, we can define the mucosal layer, we can define the muscular layer and definitely as somebody said that uh, you are just above the zero. Huh? So, the thing is that the way you are doing, we can do with precision and uh, earlier in my cases when I used to do, we used to lift only the whole thing and block above the mucosa and in some of the conferences I showed that we took the muscle another layer uh, just to take the biopsy. So the message is that we can do very precise work with laser and layer by layer also enucleation or saucerization we call it can be done. But good job, thank you. But here uh, he has gone uh, till uh, even somewhere can yes, see sir. the fat. Yes, so, sir, sir. So it sir. is equivalent to radical uh, TRBT. Yes, sir, radical TRBT. This if is. muscle so invasive is there and you want to preserve the bladder, radical TRBT is also an answer. Yes, After yes, that, sir. you will give it exactly. adjuvant treatment. Exactly. If it is a single tumor, if it is a low grade, and if it comes muscle non invasive, <laughs> you will have great feeling that you have done complete uh, uh, job. And you can, you can, you need not uh, worry about that area of resection. Uh, otherwise, recurrence in other area can be a different uh, subject. But uh, it's a really radical. Really radical. If you distend the bladder, you will perforate. But that perforation will be 0.15 mm. It will be, uh, see, this is the perforation I am doing here. Here. Uh, uh, especially it happens with the edge. Uh, if you, you, you get, you get uh, uh, happiness by seeing the white tissue. Then the, uh, see all this is white and see the how much area I have rejected but if I collapse the bladder you will not see that much. Uh, you will not see that much. I will push the, and if you keep the laser fiber too much outside this precision will not come. Now same thing I will show the anterior wall uh, with the TURBT. It is very fast. By this time I might have finished uh, all the tumors. Uh, but in this patient, he is sick, uh, heart skin's lymphoma, heart skin's lymphoma. Uh, if his muscle uh, comment can be done, uh, multiple surgeries can be avoided for him. And uh, that helps. Anyway, this is bad disease. Entire bladder looks uh, unhealthy. Uh, in this case, I don't know whether I am justifying or not. I am demonstrating only technical here. But a place where you need really the muscle, very important, then uh, I... Uh, feel that this procedure is useful. See the stock like this, 
and uh, precisely I have cut. The effects of, uh, uh, see the thulium sticks, uh, that is the problem. See this has come out. To my knowledge, uh, this can, I can pick it, see the floor here. Even if I reject now, this will definitely give comment on the muzzle. Much better. And see, not even a single drop of blood, quite deep here. Now, if the same thing if I have to do here, sir, uh, it may take time, but I, I will show you how superficially you can you can you can lift it up like uh, Anil Varshne sir said. See, just uh, superficial. To, uh, you are, it's all your angle like PURPT. See the vessel how it burns out. Not even a drop comes out. Now I am just lifting up. See. So this is excellent uh, layer, Chandramohan. I think uh, you have done a good job now. You don't have to go very deep. Yes, sir, I am not going deep. Uh, but you uh, can I, I, just take it from this layer. So that would make it uh, reasonable to envelope the section. See that video, Mr. See that. Yeah. Hello. Just one point of technique uh, is that if you bring the uh, this uh, laser fiber from 12 o'clock, then what it happens is that that uh, takes the adenoma away from the instrument. So what happens is that the beak of the instrument retracts and shows you the plane and then the fiber sort like of this, yeah, like, like this. this. Yeah. So that way like it will not uh, see, see how, how it is, it becomes simplified. Yeah. This, now this, this way uh, you will not go deep. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. The, the, uh, my, I'm practicing this, sir. You are master. No, like I just, have, because uh, here we have a lot of students. Hello. So, yes, See, so sir, if you I'm just good. make it 12 o'clock, it becomes very this simple. This is not that deep, sir, what uh, I am saying. Excellent, excellent. This is not that deep. Now, my job is whether I can reject this or not. This, this, this. Like this, sir, easily you can make a plane. Uh, it's definitely doable. And yes, uh, I must say that in anterior tumors, if you stick to the mucosa and the base, it will just saucerize yeah, and fall down. Very. Uh, <laughs> now, now I am doing like this. Yeah, uh, you have to go to the edge. Uh, problem that is, will, uh, lot of tumor is there. I may tell you the uh, too much mucosa. This is the most difficult location for this uh, type of technique, sir. You have to release the mucosa first. The most difficult is the dome because no, there it is, is a end firing fiber and you can't do that. So there you see, oh. you only fulgurate. Oh. Okay. Can go to robotic or table? Hello. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Santosh, thank sir. you, thank you, Dr. Chandavan. Very nicely demonstrated. Sir, thank you, sir. Can I go to table one? Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. You have so, come. No, finally, you have completed nicely. Everything. Lastly, everything went All well. The specimens are a bag, and we'll make a small uh, supramubic incision to take them out. We have put in a SPC for those uh, skeptics, you know, who were saying that what should be done when the catheter gets blocked. So two catheters are always better, and you know. So uh, there is a SPC and there is a urethral catheter, which should take care of uh, the drainage very well. <coughs> any anything that uh, any comment or any question? Any qu any question from audience? Uh, thank you, sir. Everybody has seen from morning. Everything thank went you. well finally, and uh, all uh, both stand well. And as we see also there for extra safety. Thank yeah. you, sir. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks very much. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for an excellent demonstration which you have seen for today and the wide variety of cases done in an excellent manner. Thank you so much. I would request all the chairpersons to please move towards the right side of the auditorium to connect their mementos and for a group photograph. Now we have a very important robotics session and for the same I would like to invite Dr. Amlesh Seth, Professor and Head, Department of Urology at Ames New Delhi. Dr. Anoop Kumar, Professor and Head, Department of Urology in uh, VMMC Delhi. Dr. P.P. Singh, Professor and Head, Department of Urology at Pushpavati Singhani Hospital Delhi. Dr. T.B. Yuvraja, Head of the Department of Urology at Kukila Ben Dhirubhai Ammani Hospital, Mumbai. And Dr. Vijay Bora, President North Zone USA and Consultant Urologist from Agra to chair the session and invite the speakers. Good afternoon everybody. So now we come to this sponsored session. Uh, the first one is uh, a lecture by Dr. Aditya Pradhan, who is a senior consultant urologist at Venkateshwara Super Speciality Hospital in Delhi. He is going to talk about ergonomic differentiation and clinical experience with Hugo Ross. At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present the, uh, this, uh, this talk. I'm speaking on a platform which has uh, been introduced in India and currently available at three locations, including the hospital where I'm working. Now, the, um, there are a few things which are different in these models compared to the, uh, the earlier uh, models, which were basically from intuitive. Now what has happened is actually they have made them modular, which means that they are inherently more flexible to use. We have this uh, machine which has been brought by the company which is the originator for a lot of uh, technology which we are already using in the theatre. And uh, therefore, uh, some of the names that you see here like Valley Lab or your uh, staplers etc. are already being used in the theatre. So it makes sense when you look at this platform to see how this has all been integrated to the robot which they call the Hugoras. So the Hugoras system, as I mentioned, is uh, very flexible. Instead of having one boom with four arms, you have each arm separate so that you can decide what you want to deploy. You may use three arms at a time. The un unused arm need not be in your theater. The visuals are basically uh, 3D and it has a large telescope, something like the old SI. So therefore, the clarity in vision is quite remarkable. The ports which we use for the instruments are about 8mm, similar to what is on the other platforms. And currently, the applications include urology, general surgery, gynae and head and neck. Now, this is what it looks like, the platform. The surgeon's console is on the extreme uh, right. Yeah, that's, that's the surgeon console, these are the arms and that's the video cart as you see it. So, what is the advantage of having each of these separate arms? Well, the first is that there are a lot of adjustments including the height adjustment and then there are various tilts and 
pivots on the module which allow you actually to reach better so that you could probably cover each quadrant of your field and therefore that is quite uh, uh, user friendly. Now this is a picture which is shows you statically this arm can go all the way down and all the way up like I have shown here and then you adjust the tilt so that if you your instrument you visualize it like this your entry could be at this angle it could be a little more vertical or it could be 90 degrees down straight down so this kind of flexibility is what you get with this these options i'll just play this video to show you how it works here and uh, this is a person who your bedside technician he can go down lift it up and then as you extend the arm it can go and lock into your port like this so these are a little different from what we have earlier been used to seeing on the the intuitive machines right then the actual maneuverability of the device i this, it's just been shown on this model so you can imagine that those arms are sneaking to the see the head end or to see the foot end or to go right and left so you you get a full reach which is a little more than what i have experienced when we were working on the, the intuitive machines the only difference which i would say having used both platforms is that it's mandated to carry your arms with you along because you tend to otherwise have a slack and then there's internal or external arm clashing which creates an error which has to be then manually shut off so The other thing is this, that because it is, uh, you use what you need, this movement is pretty good. It's uh, very quickly, uh, you can move it from one platform to the other. Now speaking of the console, it's an open console compared to the intuitive, which is an immersive console. And it has all its advantages now. Here, now if you see the surgeon is sitting in his normal relaxed position. So the strain which we all experience when you're doing long surgeries at the console on, a, on an intuitive device, that, that no longer is there. You're sitting comfortable. The rest of the ergonomics, that is the height of this panel, your uh, elbow support, your foot controls, all these you can adjust like in uh, the other machines. The important other things are that the surgeon's controls have been given to you on a pad which is at your side. And because this is all open, uh, actually your trainees can sit right next to you and watch you doing it real time. You can ask him to get into the seat and you can proctor him. So a separate console, a separate uh, unit only for a person to visualize and to train, you probably don't need all that when you're using this platform. These are different, the, the effector arms, I'll just show you this now. You see, uh, here we have a little difference in the technique. Here it's a trigger, so it's you're pu pulling the trigger so as to say to activate your fingers. So it takes a little time if you're switching from one platform to another, but once you're done three or four cases, uh, your muscle memory, your in reflex pinch actions, those are no longer a problem. This is a beautiful uh, foot pedal control. It is far uh, easier, user friendly than the other ones. You see, I'll particularly draw your attention here. So the right foot we always use for monopolar cutting or coagulating. This uh, actually doesn't have two pedals. It has a single pedal because this is what you use most often, the bipolar. And therefore, it's very convenient to use. You don't uh, usually make a mistake when you're switching from monopolar to bipolar and vice versa. The ligature pedal, foot pedals have already been given to you, but the instruments have not yet been FDA approved. So the technology exists, but the instruments will come in only after approval. Now this is a really neat uh, thing that they have added, which is a rotation multiplier. Now this is a, a graded kind of uh, control that you have in your hand. So it multiplies the amount of rotation your, uh, your fingers can do. You can go from none to 1.5 to two times. And it has a lot of advantages, I'll just show you how it helps when, say, you're suturing. Now, typically this four o'clock suture which you're doing a urethrovesical anastomosis may need two or three parses. 
but i'll just show you this on this is on a on my very first case when i was trying to do this and see how easily in one throw you can get your needle all the way out so it has simply multiplied my movement about uh, two times over so that in one throw you can do this needle throw quite easily so it saves you a lot of time if you learn how to use it the other things are in this which is uh, the display unit it has the standard uh, cautery the valley lab and i'll draw your attention to this device which is quite unique the touch screen this touch surgery is a software device which is a, a camera which is actually copying all the videos but where it differs is that these videos are all 4k they are cloud stored so that you don't have to carry any, any storage device to the theater to capture your your modules and then it has integrated analytics to it so you can actually look back at a video and if you've done say five or ten you can compare okay first case my dissection at the neck took this much time in my fifth case i've come down to that much time so it helps you to see where and how you could improve your own surgery and you can have then video sharing between people and there is also ai included in this software which will then probably teach you how to improve your surgical technique so these are the advantages which i have worked out here and i'd like to thank you for your attention for this particular part of my presentation my next uh, few minutes if i have i will just present my data on what we have done so far and uh, this is uh, about our cases at the hospital where i am currently uh, working so this is a modest uh, experience where we have uh, done the about 11 cases in the last few months in prostates we have done three and uh, these were the kind of profile that we had so as you can see we had well a mix of high and intermediate risk patients the initial surgeries took time we lost some blood but overall i think we had a fairly suitable kind of uh, follow uh, recovery from those patients we did three cases of nephrectomy including one partial nephrectomy all of these were large tumors the partial nephrectomy was a smaller one but we achieved margin clearance and the uh, ischemia warm ischemia time which we took was about 25 minutes for the partial we did one radical cystectomy this was t uh, Uh, a failure of new adjuvant and in that we had n3 disease bulky disease we did limit our surgery to only 3 and 1/2 hours consult time so we did the cystectomy and then we did a conduit by the open extracorporeal method we did a couple of benign situations we had a con syndrome where we did a rectectomy there were multiple uteric stones we did a uterolithotomy and we did a benign nephrectomy for a non functioning kidney Initially our consult times used to be quite a lot my first prostate we took almost 5 hours but now with time we have come down to about 3 hours and similar for the nephrectomy the recovery so far we have had a pretty good and uh, we were able to discharge our patients by about a second or third day which is what we all we see in other robotic uh, series as well this is a little difference in the ports which we have so as you can see for pelvic surgery the port for the camera we docking from in between the legs and for the kidneys most often your assistant port is actually behind your camera port and your instrument arms are above so it looks like what you did for the si configuration on the uh, da vinci so this is a little bit of those ports so my take home message from this is that yes this is a good platform we have been able to utilize it for all the procedures and so far our experience has been promising thank you so much thank you aditya thank you now as i understand you have been user of da vinci earlier before using ugo so you have told us about lot of advantages of ugo ras now i have a question for you what are the disadvantages of this system compared to da vinci we understand it as an open console it has got separate separate modular instrument arms but what are the basic disadvantages you have realized in this system so i i like i like to, to look at it like this see if i was a novice 
entering into a robotic uh, uh, platform for the first time, probably straight from lab to a robotic platform, a lot of the problems of the initial memory which you have, the instinctiveness of your movements, for instance, this pinch movement, that's a problem. You've got to learn to use your index finger more. So this, these are the first things. The second thing is actually the pivots are quite a lot on the arms. And it takes a little time to figure out exactly where your arm would be positioned and how much is the best pivot for you. And this is more in the upper track than for the pelvis. The pelvis is pretty sorted out as they have got some clearly predefined positioning for you as a template. But in the upper arm is still a little bit of a struggle. All right, so these are the two things which I feel we have to get past. So when you've done two or three cases, your comfort level goes up. What about multi quadrant surgery and arm clash problems? So that, that's exactly what I was saying. When you're trying to do, say, a leg, a nephro, you, you need to carry your instruments along. This device is a little unforgiving in that. If you, there is a lag, when you're moving your camera and your, your one arm, the other arm stays back. If you've lost visual contact with that arm, which often happens, when you're doing any robotic surgery, you're very likely to clash. The moment there's an internal external clash, there is a strong alarm and then it switches off. And that can be quite jarring. You need to again figure out where is that arm struck, where is your camera position, bring back your camera, then get that arm in. So yes, these are points which are definitely disadvantaged. In the XI system, it also tells you where exactly in your field or out of your field the instrument is. Yes. Sometimes if the instrument goes out of the field, Correct. the XI system points out that you are, this is where you need to look for your instrument. Correct. Uh, does this have that kind of a mechanism? No, as, as of now, sir, it doesn't. And it is a, a big, uh, uh, you know, favorable factor in the, uh, the, on the XI system. They don't yet have that technology here. And the XI system or even the S, SI, all these, all the uh, intuitive robots, they had so-called seven degrees of freedom, the yeah. three left, right, up, down, in, out, and then the yaw and the roll and uh, the pith and the pincer. So what are the uh, degrees of freedom that this one has? Yeah, this has all that in addition, which are this, this, that was the additional point which I pointed out, this multiplier, which you don't have otherwise. So they have all the same degrees of freedom. In fact, I have a video on cystectomy just because this is the same uh, urothelial uh, uh, malignancies forum. I thought we could play it, but we don't have time. But I can tell you that because this multiplier is there, your the, the extent of the effector arm is much more. So when you're doing fine suturing in narrow places, that's a big advantage. This we didn't have on the earlier platforms. So this is a little difference. And the scaling, what are scales are available? So scalings, they have that one on one, one on three, they have that. I haven't used it, but it, it's there. Yeah, as far as uh, the cost concerns. So yes. what is the cost, the equipment cost and the cost of the disposable? How does it wow. different from Da Vinci? <laughs> because you're seen in R&R. &R. Yeah, okay. I, I see where you're getting. And the answer to, me, to you is actually, at least from what I, little bit I know of the dynamics of the costing, this is cheaper by about 20 or 30 percent. The per instrument number of usages permitted is also about 30% more and maybe I was told some other day that they're extending that for a few instruments. So overall, if you see the cost of surgery compared to the intuitive or in, in any institute should be about 30% cheaper. That's the ball mark I could give you. But you again, think that the again, technique... You, technique. Yuraj, I'll give you a, another catch to this. The other catch is that it depends on how the institute has acquired the robot. Is it an outright purchase versus higher or pay per use? That would also de determine how the billing happens for our patient end. Because I heard that there is no much difference, 20, 30 percent difference yeah, yeah. in a five lakh rupees patient. Suppose if they're paying, it's not a huge amount for an individual patient. Yeah. So are we compromising on the technology what you already know versus the new one? So that was I was thinking about it. See, the technologically wise. Uh, do I have time to show? I would show you two minute clip of the recording because once you actually start operating, you'll find it's no different from the x -ray. It's exactly the same. So to say that, you know, the only point is that are you uh, compromising on anything? No, it's exactly the same thing. The fact is that our experience so far has been limited. We are still, we need to pull out our numbers before we can talk of equivalence or any difference. Dr. Pradhan sir, uh, uh, I have tried the uh, Hugo only as a dry lab to train the Euromat residents. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to like 
ask you like there are few instruments which are not still there in the Hugo, but they're trying to bring them in the market. Do you think like staplers and clip appliers, uh, they're going to yeah, so from, from what those guys in their technology lab who I had occasion to meet, they told me that those already exist. The fact is that each of those, like the stapler for instance, or the ligature, the instruments exist, they are going through the FDA approval process. So in the wet lab, we were allowed to see and even get a hand on it, but you cannot use it on clinical work. So that much for the... Right, for the intercorporeal diversions because uh, when... Yeah, so the stapler the... actually on the hand grip, you already have the uh, stapler firing uh, uh, switch. It's already been put there. So the moment I guess the FDA has cleared it, it, it would be available to you right away. I think the challenge is going to be the patents, with which I think the new new robotic systems are not disclosing that why there is a delay in la launching various instruments like ProGrass or, or the Ligasure. Uh, these are the patents within the patents, like uh, patent has gone away from, from Da Vinci uh, as far as the manufacturing of the robo is concerned. But the newer companies, though they are ready with their newer instruments, they are not able to launch them as yet because of the clearance of the patent. It is, it is of course, the USFDA you mentioned is, is one roadblock uh, for the use of uh, uh, Ligasure or other technologies. But uh, as I yeah, learned, because I have been using CMR, and uh, CMR is CE certified, it is not yet US FDA yeah. certified. And they have been telling me for last good one year that the program is, is they are going to launch. Now I understand they have changed the, 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 the technology of, of the mechanics of the program, and ultimately they are going to launch it in the second quarter of this year, something like that. So I don't think... It, it, they are not short of instrument, these new newer companies. Probably it is the problem of the patent. And and it's like, you know, Apple one phone was not as good as the Apple 14 is. So as, as that, uh, over a period of time, these newer, new generation or new robots will find their own place in the market. And it's, it's, it's good for us because competition will bring the best out yeah. of it. We'll have a, we'll have, we'll have a power to negotiate with, 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 the grand uh, father Da Vinci also about the cost and the cost of robo will come down. Yeah, true, true. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Thank Victor. You. Now uh, we invite Dr. Sudhish Shivastav. He is going to talk about the SSI mantra. So we we have the founder and CEO of the SSS, and I understand he himself is a cardiothoracic surgeon qualified cardiothoracic surgeon and, and it is a make in India Robo SS Mantra. Good afternoon, and I uh, want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Gotham, who has been constantly in touch with me, and Dr. Sandhu. And uh, so we're going to talk about uh, what we have created in India, a truly make in India, as we call it, for the world. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip a bunch of my introduction, just to kind of say that I uh, uh, lived in the United States and did over 1,400 robotic cardiac cases over there, did a lot of early pioneering work in launching the whole revascularization, did a lot of world's first cases. Uh, I still hold the world record for totally endoscopic bypass surgery of over 800 cases. And uh, I came to India in 2011 and uh, purchased the Da Vinci system myself. The idea was to launch uh, multiple programs and try to train people. Uh, the experiment didn't work because of the cost. So made a commitment to really get involved and develop a system. 
And the journey was not easy, a lot of challenges, but I think uh, being the end user and working with a very enthusiastic and committed team of Indian engineers, we finally reached uh, uh, post funding, etc. And uh, ultimately, uh, really, we have created a system. So when we look at the, the, uh, the Indian scene, in fact, I did uh, the first operation back in December of 2002 at Escort. Uh, Dr. Trehani is a dear friend, he invited. And when we look at over the last 20 years, we have only a total of 140 robotic systems, about 100 uh, Da Vinci's and uh, 40 CMR, and few uh, Metronic uh, Evoras at this point in time. And that's a pity, it's a shame, that uh, if you look at the United States uh, with one fourth of our population, uh, they have almost uh, 5,000 systems and uh, long ways to go for the country. And the biggest factor, I think, apart from the steep learning curve, was also the cost associated with it. And uh, so this is a picture I show. This is back in 2002. President Abdul Kalam was there when I was operating. And uh, so they made a commitment to really come up with a system. I used to talk to Da Vinci guys right up to the chairman. I was a poster child for them. Asked them, why don't you guys develop a system that many other countries can actually afford. They were enjoying monopoly, great stock pricing, and they weren't interested. And even today, uh, if you look at some of the countries around us, they don't even want to go to sell, which is really not you know, a good thing for the medical world. And patients don't get the benefits. So we made a commitment to create a system that hopefully will be different. And at some point, we will surpass the existing technology and most importantly, make it effect, cost effective so many, many more patients, not just in India, but around the world can benefit from it. Um, so I'll just go through some uh, brief points in relation to the technology. And as uh, Dr. Pradhan mentioned, uh, uh, we have an open phase console, uh, somewhat different than uh, many others. Uh, there's a head tracking camera on the top for the uh, Safety reasons, if you look away, a uh, system won't respond. The large 32-inch monitor, beautiful high-definition 3D view. On the right side, there is a large 23-inch touch panel uh, 2D monitor because one of the, when I was doing cardiac surgery, it was very difficult to really tell on those little file pros, one and a half inch type of images. Mean nothing, in a EKG you cannot tell uh, if there are ST changes. So we have created whereby you can really pull the images in the real time in the sense of you know large images that are meaningful, whether it is CT, MRI, echo, NGO, et cetera. And then also we have a virtual image of our system to the software. So even though in an open console, you can just turn your face and see what's going on in the operating room. Uh, but it's right in front of you. I think there was a question regarding where do you know your instruments, et cetera. So you can literally manipulate that, zoom, so you will know everything by just looking at the 2D monitor where everything is going, or if the arms are coming closer, and so on. And then other thing that we are going to use this monitor is we have developed a holography thing, whereby literally you can superimpose the actual, uh, these images, convert them into 3D model on the fly, CT, MRI, or any of these ICOM images, match your operating view, and so that you have the entire anatomy right in front of you. Uh, surgeon controls are different, and I'll show you a close-up. Also, uh, other than the standard foot pedal that everybody has, our console is prepared right from the beginning for up to five arms. So there are certain things that we will use the fifth arm, particularly for some cardiac application or other uh, automatic uh, deployment of uh, devices. So we have prepared it. There are two toggle paddles and you can put the camera in the middle, two on the left and two on the right, and then you can use all the five arms. The hand controls are different, and they literally are, um, you, you basically uh, let them rest in your hand. Anytime, I think, uh, whenever you have to grab things, there is always the muscle stands up right up to the neck. So this is very easy, it just literally rests in your hand, and you've got a hand bar, and then you just have wrist and, uh, finger motions, and of course all the other larger motions are done with the 
uh, larger muscles of the, our arm. Uh, it's a modular design uh, and uh, right up to five arms. So one can use three, four or five arms depending on the target anatomy and what you need to do. And we can literally place them wherever needed. So you don't have to follow the classic Da Vinci force that one has. The instruments are long enough, they will reach wherever. And uh, the cars are motorized and one of our goal in future is to be able to automate that based on the procedure whereby nurses don't have to push. So we are looking at a lot of futuristic ideas. It reaches up to seven and a half feet, so you have human space underneath them. And uh, you can do multi quadrant surgery. You can just rotate it completely and it will change the direction. Uh, vision card, right from the beginning, we have given 3D for everyone. I think one of the important thing is that surgeon has a 3D so we can do the surgical task very precisely. Uh, I used to always ask why Da Vinci doesn't have 3D. Their answer was, we have to go back to FDA uh, to get an approval. And so, you know, I was give you a very uh, a quick anecdote. I was operating in South Korea, launching the uh, robotic cardiac program. A nurse put the knife right through the heart. And I, of course, we repaired it. I asked her what happened. So I couldn't tell how deep I was going. So this thing actually occurs more frequently than ever gets reported. So I think the 3D vision gives, first of all, same view to this uh, table side team, avoids accident, shorter than learning curve, and it is safer. And also, I think, as was pointed out by Dr. Pradhan, uh, you don't need another console. You know, if you are going to be teaching somebody, it will take 10 seconds to change the seat because you're seeing exactly the same thing as your, um, you know, trainee. And you don't need a, another half a million dollar console. And then this has a built-in recording playback capabilities. And we are going to be using this for live tele-mentoring. We've already partnered with some of the telecom companies in India. And uh, we've already tested it. The platform is, uh, is ripe, I think, with high-speed connectivity and 5G. So we don't have to put, uh, send out people for uh, travels and so on, and it will, I think, make it more efficient and cost-effective. Partner with Olympus with an articulating tip, so you get rid of 30 and zero degree, and literally with a joystick, you do it in five seconds, and you have all different angles. And it has got a pretty uh, circumferential view that doesn't exist. You have to move the arms. In this case, all you do is rotate the tip. We have the software that actually gives guidance to the table side team. Uh, you pick the menu, which procedure, it tells you the target anatomy, suggested course, of course surgeons will make the decision, uh, patient, uh, the table position, and placement of the cards in relation to our system. And we try to tell people, you know, uh, there's a little figuring out, but it's not very much. I think uh, it's very easy to uh, uh, place the system and dot it over 30 different types of instrument, and including cardiac. Uh, we are, I think the question always comes up about the harmonic. Uh, we have harmonic. We are also developing articulating harmonic that currently no one has. Uh, it's in the process. We file the patents. And so we are not concerned about, uh, because nobody else has it. Uh, focused on cardiac, because nobody is touching cardiac. Da Vinci pretty much has stopped supporting cardiac. They don't even make instrumentation for bypass surgery anymore. It's been four years now, and it's a huge field that must be revived because, and no disregard to other specialties, but cardiac is 99% hysteronotomy, while others can have endoscopic options. So we really are addressing that based on my own experience. I think it was a huge advantage where patients recover very, very fast. And we have developed this automated and astromatic connector. We are starting out with coronaries. And this is a very miniaturized three millimeter by 20 millimeter device that the bypass gap will get loaded. Literally with push of a button, either by the surgeon or a handheld thing by the table side nurse. It goes down, fires micro level staples, six on each side, and you are done in six seconds. Reproducible anastomosis, levels the playing field, doesn't matter what skill you have, as long as you can insert this anvil into the coronary artery. We are looking at developing all these other larger versions, and I was just looking at the ureteral anastomosis. 
So we can literally create things for kidney transplants, liver transplant, all of these things in a bigger way whereby literally it will go and you fire. And it's a mechanical firing, so it is reproducible. Um, also, we have a, uh, developed multi-fire clip appliers. So you don't have to take out the clip applier every time. And you have different sizes and different numbers. Uh, very focused on metaverse and all this mixed reality and so on. Uh, if you have a chance, uh, go stop by our booth. They have literally created our system in virtual. And it will be great for teaching training. And one of my vision is to literally virtually control the arms. Get rid of all this hardware that we use and sit down and all that thing. It's very possible. All this is possible. And then, of course, this whole holography and the 3D modeling. Uh, all these things will be tremendous help. They will make the procedure safer and faster for the surgeons because we know everything where it is. A lot of time is delayed because we are scared. Are we going to hurt something? So we are really looking at how we can make the life easy for the surgeons. We have gone through various validation exercises, animal trials, clinical trials, and uh, cadaver trials early on. And just wanted to point out the robotic surgeons, their learning curve is like 10 minutes. And I show this picture here, Dr. Amitha, junior associate of Dr. Rawal. He never came to our lab. That day when we launched the system commercially there, he just sat and played with the controls for five minutes without instruments. That day, he did half of the case. So it's very user-friendly because everything is in front of you, and you're operating based on the screen, and motions are all similar. <coughs> so where we are today, five systems have been launched, and uh, over 130 cases now have been done. No device-related issue in terms of any adverse effects. And these are different types of cases that have been done. Mostly are very radical, complex, uh, Euro-onc and gyne -onc, uh, cases. Dr. Rawal has done, I think, over 80 plus cases now. And as you all know, he does very complex operations. So uh, they've been using it. And then further procedures are also being done right now. Uh, registered with the Indian CDSCO, uh, made in India on the government portal. And we are initiating our application for the European and the US approvals. So also, we really hope to develop various other applications using the robotic system. And what I call decentralized excellence, whereby a lot of diagnostic and biopsies and certain therapies can be done long distance using 5G. Uh, and uh, uh, we are working on telesurgery and hope in six months we will do that on animals and then gradually. So the whole idea to really create a very holistic, other than the routine curriculum of training, to be able to be on, on site proctoring, have people available who can guide surgeons for difficult cases or you know, new surgeons that are coming on, because you know, we hope that this process will continue. So even though initially you have certain proctor cases, but more surgeons can be done long distance. And then telesurgery, like having an attend attending in front of you, who can finish the job if you are not able to, or use those experts for difficult cases wherever. Uh, show this picture. Uh, this is what's been really driving me uh, as a, you know, really trying to be patient-centric. I operated on this gentleman, a farmer, 80-year-old from Haryana back in 2012. Did two robotic bypasses. He went home two days, and a week later, he was back on his farm. And I think there is an opportunity to, to really this really change the direction of surgery. The cost has been biggest hurdle. We know this will be the future. More companies will come. Competition is always good. We saw the monopoly. Uh, things didn't change. The core technology remained the same. They added an arm and raised the price. So uh, young engineers, 26, 27 average age, very proud of our young Indian team that nobody thought ever could be done. Intuitive never filed a single patent in India, thinking that won't happen. We have proven them wrong. And uh, Dr. Fred Moll uh, is something I think be interesting to you. Dr. Fred Moll was the founder of Intuitive. He left Intuitive back in 2004, created a series of companies. Last one was J&J, this uh, bronchoscopy robot. He got out of that also. And he has joined us. 
Uh, he was here in November, saw Dr. Rahul do a live case, tested the system, and uh, is part of us taking Da Vinci on. And it's not, I think it is great to have options, great to have make in India, and hopefully we can inspire others to come up with the devices we don't have to import. We still do 80% import from outside. And somewhere we must, you know, the make in India and the Atman Ever vision, and that's the only way to that we must do things here, and it is possible. So with that, I want to thank you all, and Jai Hind. Dr. Sudhir Shrivastava, uh, if you have to give me a rough estimate of what percentage of components are made in India and what percentage of components are imported? 80% are manufactured in India. All the uh, metal and plastic hardware is done. Many other components are done. The only thing we import are these critical components that are not made in India. Certain motors, drives, sensors, etc. They come from Europe, US, Japan, Israel, etc. But we don't have them here. No, That's motors it. and drives and what else? I'm sorry? You said motors and drives. Yeah, motors, drives, there are certain encoders, harmonic drives. So these are all pretty sophisticated <coughs> electronic part. Uh, chip industry in India we don't have, so we still have to import these, uh, these chips, uh, and semiconductor, uh, and so Hopefully, I think there's a lot of emphasis. Pandemic has taught us a lot of lessons uh, and the geopolitical issues that I think there are efforts going on to make them in India, but these things take time. And one small question. In one of the slides, there were different controls for different movements. Uh, no. In, in, in the hand control. No, it is the uh, gimbal is same as uh, Da Vinci. Uh, the handheld part is different, that's all. Other than that, there is complete seven degrees of freedom, X, Y, Z motions, and roll, pitch, yaw, and open and close. All those functions are there within the hand control. So the roll, pitch, yaw is by different mechanisms or by? No, it's all it's all there, just like in that one. Okay. So you have the you know what you are holding. You know you can roll it there or do you know sideways or up or down motions and open close. So all everything is right there. Yeah, yeah, seven degrees of freedom is there. Mm. Um, quite an impressive venture, looking at everything. Uh, in how many countries in the world at present this system is already certified to be used? Uh, right now in India, we have received uh, or are in the process of receiving orders where they accept CDSCO. As you know also, the FDA takes time and initially our focus was India because there is a huge need in the country a uh, huge market need in the country, and the enthusiasm of people to really get onto a platform and patients who could actually get an affordable system. So focus has been right now, but we got uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Indonesia, Middle East, I just came from there, uh, Argentina, uh, Guatemala, uh, Eastern European countries. So wherever CDSCO is accepted today, and there are around 55 other countries that don't require CE or FDA. So we are really heading out there, and then we are following the process starting next month with the US FDA as well as the CE. CE has become even more difficult than FDA today. And we will do the trials in India. We've already initiated the process in terms of the, having a meeting with FDA. And hopefully, either later this year or our first half of next year, we'll have the FDA. But it, it, we don't need it here. Yes. Are you facing the challenges of patents? We have 170 that we have filed, and we have no complication with any of the patents at all, because we, firstly, every level it is different, and a lot of them are very unique to only us, and uh, there, there, there is no patent issue at all. So most of the, of course, as you know, intuitive patents have run out. Now, there are some things that uh, we may be co-licensing with people. Uh, some stapling devices may be, as you know, also Intuity brought these stapling devices relatively recently. It took them a long time. But our goal with our team in India, we will do things very, very fast. Yeah, so we'll have all the devices and more than what others actually have. Yes. Uh, so the CDSCO, the device division, gave you a 
clearance yes, with completely. data from India yes. or with data from... Uh, no, it is India because see, they don't need anything from outside. And uh, they approved us last year, then this year again, they did their audit and whatever the process is, and they recertified us. And we are registered uh, uh, not only to manufacture and sell, but we have, we have the approvals, right? And now we have the clinical experience, there has been zero mortality in relation to, and no device-related adverse effect in 130 cases almost now. And it's been a very short time. First system we sold to Rajiv Gandhi was in August. And then later, starting in November, so it's all very short history. But people are literally uh, be able to do do the cases. Yes. Dr. Shivastu, do you have the provision of tele uh, proctoring also? So like you said, you yes, absolutely. So we have you know all the initial cases, either Dr. Raval, Dr. Amitab. There are several surgeons that uh, are very kind and uh, have been available to proctor. And this is what we are doing. Any surgeon who wants to start. We do proctor them on no, site. You're talking about a teleproctoring. Like you can do the proctoring from a distant site. Like do you use any any uh, software you can do a teleproctoring from a distant site? Like tele Oh yeah, we, we have already yeah, we have done it actually. We, we figured out the platform and it's just basically what uh, the process requires is the, the leased line uh, which is absolutely secure and uh, you get it for X you know day or three hours or whatever. And then there are uh, little converters and uh, adapters on each side. And essentially, it truly it is a teleoperation. So as long as though no significant latency, uh, you are able to do it uh, pretty close to in real time these days. So it is possible. We have, have we launched it fully? No. Because again, please, yeah, very early stages. So we are, you know, we are doing all hand holding uh, at this point in time. But all these plants are going very aggressively. Uh, I think not only proctoring, but also telesurgery itself. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sudhish. Thank you. Uh, may I just say the cost-wise, I know these questions have come up of others. It's one-third at every level. Thank you so much for the lovely insight into the new robotic systems. I would request the chairpersons to please move towards the right side of the auditorium for a group photograph and mementos. Next we have a panel discussion on uh, DRBT in different scenarios like uh, uh, presence of a large tumour uh, in a bladder diverticulum near the ureteric orifice or if the tumour is at the bladder neck in the urethra or over the anterior wall and dome. For this session, uh, I would like to uh, request Dr. Bruce Savanu Nayak, Additional Professor, Department of Urology, Ames, New Delhi, Dr. Imdad Ali, Senior Consultant Urologist in Bellari, Dr. Sanjoy Sureka, Associate Professor of Urology at SGBJ Lucknow, and Dr. Prashant Nayak, Additional Professor and Head, Department of Urology at Ames, Urmeshwar, to please uh, take the stage. And I would also request Dr. Siddharth Yadav, Associate Professor, VMMC Delhi, to moderate the session. Very good afternoon. I hope we had a very lovely afternoon session. Uh, thank you, chairpersons, for being here. I am given the task to discuss panel discussion one, that is TRBT in a different scenarios. At the outset, I would like to thank the North Zone Council and Dr. Gautam uh, for this opportunity. So, the index case is a 55-year-old male who is a smoker, one pack year for past 35, one pack per day for past 35 years. He presented to us with gross, painless, total hematuria for the past one year. There are no comorbidities. His examination, both general and local, is non-contributory. His KFT was normal, cytology was positive for high-grade uh, uterine cancer, and ultrasound showed multiple masses in the bladder. So, pretty basic history. So, this is the CT scan of this uh, patient. He had multiple tumors in the bladder. The largest one was around 5 into 4 cm in size on the right lateral wall. The tumors were present on all the walls of the bladder, the anterior, the posterior, the left and the right. 
there is a single less than 1 cm uh, size node in the right obturator region. The seminal recycle and the prostate were free, the kidneys were normal and there were no signs of uh, metastasis. So, my first question uh, sir, to Dr. Nayak sir, sir, what would be the goal of TR for, uh, for you for TRBT in this particular patient? Whether you plan a complete resection or just a... Oh, I'll be able to decide only when I do a cystoscopy. You said the largest hemorrhage looks to be 5 to 4 cm. But from the CT, I do not um, see there is any 5 to 4 cm tumor. But if these are the size of the tumor, I need to see inside during cystoscopy. If it will be possible, then I do a complete resection. Otherwise, if the right lateral tumor is 4 into 5 cm, and the look wise, if it looks muscle invasive, I would actually resect that particular tumor and try to reach the base at one particular side, take the D biopsy. If it Usually it looks like muscle invasive that I am not resect the rest of the tumor. So, yes sir. So to better understand how sir has reached to this uh, conclusion, let me walk you through a couple of more scenarios uh, for of the patients with large tumor masses. This is the second scenario. This patient also has multiple tumors in the bladder and its the tumors are almost filling whole of the bladder. There is the largest mass is on the left side which is 7 into 8 centimeters in size. The seminal recycle and the rectum are free. There is mild hydro on the left side and there are no metastasis. So uh, my question to Dr. Prashant sir, sir uh, what would be your plan in this uh, particular uh, patient? So <coughs> the goal as you asked in the last question also is always to do a complete resection. So that's the goal, right? Whether you're able to achieve that goal or not, that's a question. So that I would know once I go inside the patient. If on CT scan, I see that the growth is an obviously extravesical disease, then my goal wouldn't be to, uh, because I know that that is an extravesical, obviously T3 plus. So my goal is only to get a histological, this thing, a histological IFC. And the area where it is looking like it's extravesical, if I can reach the base there, I'll take a deep muscle there. So that's my only goal in that patient. Otherwise, if I do not see, the goal is always to do a complete resection and whether I am able to do that or not, that is. So, sir, without cystoscopy, can, uh, can we just not have a rough idea, of course, it may not be 100% sure, can the CT scan give us a rough idea to plan our theta and timing that what, uh, whether we will be able to do a complete resection or not or whether we will be just doing a biopsy? In a patient like this, of course, I will say that it is, it may not be possible to do a complete resection. More but like. in, in the earlier case that you said, sir. that we have to do a cystoscopy to say exactly whether you can do it. Let's move on to the next uh, scenario. Sir, uh, this is for uh, Dr. Sureka, sir. So this patient has, this patient also has multiple uh, large tumors. The largest size is 5 into 4 centimeters. There are no nodes, there are no, the upper tracts are normal and there are no metastasis. What would be your tentative plan based on the, uh, uh, based on the CT finding? The CT findings uh, looking like uh, this is a broad-based tumor and uh, uh, and multiple large tumor, fairly large tumor. So to seeing the CT, there is a high possibility that this patient may have a muscle invasive bladder tumor. However, even in a setting when I am suspecting it is a muscle invasive bladder tumor, I would like to do a complete TORBT because you never know whether patient will be uh, ready for radical cystectomy or not, whether he will be fit for uh, muscle, uh, bladder preservation or patient is not willing for the same. And even uh, if you take a biopsy and if you can dissect this, the, the good, of, good, part of the, uh, good part for the patient is that if you are giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, during that period of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the patient will be free of hematuria. That's a very uh, important point from the patients. In a patient with large blood tumor, if you're suspecting muscle invasive and you just took a biopsy and giving neoadjuvant, patient keep on doing him, having hematuria, uh, low hemoglobin, patient will be poorly preserved when you will do a radical cystectomy. So, the, my Goal is concept would be this. Always complete section. The last uh, scenario for uh, Dr. Imdad Ali, sir. This is a tumor. Uh, this is a patient with a 4 into 3 centimeter uh, right posterior lateral wall. Upper tracts are normal, no nodes. Again, sir, what do you think? It says is a muscle invasive disease or uh, it's not as per the CT scan? And what will be your plan for uh, TRBT? Mm. See, the goal should be uh, complete resection first. Uh, before that, I would like to do bimanual examination. As a, as a conventional in this one, that might give and uh, post resection after a bimanual examination also will be helpful. 
the thing is in CT scan, if there is a perivesical fat involvement, etc., so that might suggest this one. And uh, based on that uh, inside cystoscopy findings, whether it is the papillary structure or solid mass, etc., that also will give an idea. Hydronephrosis definitely, if, since it is not there, it might not be there. I would like to completely reject this. After that, based on the histology, we can decide whether to go for uh, further this one or. Uh, so let's come back to the index case. So we have come to two, two things that one is the size of the tumor and the preoperative CT findings that help us to decide what should be the goal. So the question to uh, Naik sir, sir what is the size criteria you follow, you think uh, you follow that the tumor can be completely resected while planning for the surgery? What, how big tumors can you think? There is no specific size criteria which you can say this can be resected. All this can be actually you can decide only when you do a cystoscopy and see whether you will be able to completely check the tumor or not. I think I agree to a certain extent to Sanjay. Um, if even if it looks like muscle invasive, at least the visible gross tumor, if you are able to resect, you should resect all visibly gross tumor inside and then just take biopsy from one particular area and then calculation. That is, should be the, your goal for your meeting. Actually, what happened? What appears very large on a CT scan may have a very small stock inside. So it may be a pre-top kind of thing. So as uh, Dr. Busso said, you have to get inside and then see and then only decide. And Dr. Naik sir, what are the imaging findings that will suggest that a tumor is muscle invasive likely to be muscle invasive? So to, to say the CT the tumor is muscle invasive, not first you should see the, what is the quality of the CT. The bladder should be properly distended to comment about the blood muscle invasive disease. If the bladder is not properly distended, even if a small tumor, you will not be able to find that uh, particular finding that you want to see in a CT scan. In a properly distended bladder, the typical finding will be that particular wall will not be distended unlike the other part. It will be asymmetrical. There will be some focal perivesical fat stranding and also some small soft tissue nodularity you can see. And if the, uh, there will be also unilateral hydronephrosis if the tumor is on the right lateral wall. And if you see the changes of hydronephrosis on that side and all these findings, in a properly done CT scan, that actually points to in favor of a muscle invasive disease. Sir, so uh, Dr. Uh, Nayak sir, is there a better imaging option available than the CT scan to suggest that the disease is muscle invasive or not? Recently, recently uh, there has been studies like a multi-parametric MRI with varied squaring, which is a recently evolving imaging modalities, which are very, uh, though it is not been very commonly practiced in most of the centers, unlike the pirate scoring in prostate cancer, but that is an evolving technique which is supposed to be better than CT scan in deciding if the patient is has a muscle invasive disease or not. So, sir, I just want to uh, add one point regarding the pirate. The difficulty and the problem with pirate is uh, the reporting. So, you have to have a dedicated, you know, radiologist for reporting a good pirate and which you can rely upon day on, day out. If you don't have a good hero radiologist, then if somebody is uh, reporting virus once in a while and he is not doing follow up what happened with that reporting, clinical correlation, then it is very difficult to have a good virus reporting. So that is very important, though it is uh, maybe 25 percent more accurate than the CT scan. So even with, uh, sir, uh, the MRI is as you told that sir, it has a very high accuracy. So would you get an MRI in this particular scenario once the CT scan is done? Just to if in the CT scan, if it looks like a muscle invasive, the MRI will not give you any extra additional benefit. Okay. Actually, the whole idea of getting an investigation is whether it is changing your management plan or not. So, is, a, is an MPMRI sensitive and specific enough that it will prevent me from doing a deep muscle biopsy? Will it prevent me from going ahead and doing something? No. In this patient, anyway, whatever be the finding, I need to get in, I need to resect it, I need to do a deep muscle biopsy. So, that is not going to change. I don't think there is no need to add MPMRI. So this patient will be uh, is now posted uh, for surgery. So, so uh, Dr. Sureka, sir, what was your anesthesia, uh, preferred anesthesia of choice and why? In this multiple tumor and tumor on the lateral wall, so my preferred anesthesia would be always uh, uh, general anesthesia. I'm more comfortable doing a general anesthesia than operator block and all. And that too, I'm more comfortable with block in with a succinyl choline. That give me is sometimes in a patient who is not very fit for general anesthesia. So we start doing with a spinal anesthesia. And when I'm going to the deep part on the lateral wall tumor, like this tumor. 
So he asked the patient to give succinyl choline for it. The effect is 10 to 15 minutes. So during that period, you can just put a uh, LMA and you can dissect that tumor, which is high risk for doing a job. So this is how we do usually. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Indadiri, sir, what, what will be your choice of energy source and why? It will be more comfortable with uh, bipolar TRPT, bipolar T uh, and TRP. Because uh, it has uh, less uh, side effects, I can do for more. If it is even a bigger growth, I can extend my resection a little more than conventional uh, monopolar TRP. And uh, I want to add one thing. Uh, I give that uh, optator block myself, either using ultrasound guided, if it is in our institute, college, medical college, or in our hospital. Uh, we use that uh, peripheral uh, PNS stimulator. So that gives a accurate this one, and this will uh, avoid the uh, need for uh, GA. So even sometimes, no, uh, that uh, PNS blocks only one branch. Sir. Whereas uh, that uh, ultrasound, we can use uh, both the branch, okay. anterior and posterior. That is really more better if you give ultrasound. Mr. Uh, I prefer bi uh, bipolar. Because it is, uh, I am more comfortable. Uh, although the hemostasis and cutting is much more better with monopolar, but uh, takes a little more time with bipolar. But still, we can extend our description. Sir, any any risk of uh, TVR syndrome in patients undergoing TRBT with uh, monopolar? Mm, till now, I have not uh, got any. Sir, any role do you think of lasers using laser uh, resection in this particular Yeah, scenario? we don't have lasers, but after seeing that uh, demonstration of N block resection by Dr. Vati, uh, these are good things. So, over a period of time, this will be refined and there will be much things will be easier to follow. With experienced people, might get better results and better uh, that might become a method of choice. And what about uh, that clinic muscle? Uh, that I'd like to comment on this uh, laser technique. You know, the laser is a new evolving energy source to the orbitals. There has to be some specific indications where you should do a laser TRBT, not in all cases. As was discussed in the morning, if the tumor should be less than 3 cm and it should be mostly posteriorly located, maybe laterally, not very close to the erotic orifice. And it is very difficult to do in the anterior location. The tumor has to be solitary or less than 3 cm. And the literature has shown there is absolutely no difference that people are talking about. Most of the randomized trials, even randomized trials and meta-analysis have shown there is no difference in the quality of the specimen mm, you find from glucose. It looks like you can get better tissue and better histopathology from laser TRBT, but the randomized trial and meta-analysis has shown there is absolutely no difference in the quality of histopathology specimen between the two. And laser technique is not always feasible to do all the scenarios. Very specific scenarios and small team was and uh, like posterior wall and lateral wall, it's okay, difficult in the anterior wall. I think we are uh, almost uh, off the times, 45 minutes. So I just uh, last ask the last, uh, probably the question for to uh, Dr. Abhishevai and I, sir, again. So it's the goal of, uh, if your, your goal was complete resection, which tumor would you resect first, then which second, and then how do you go about it? <laughs> there are multiple tumors, sir. So, see that again, this has to be done. Once you do a cystoscope, you will have an idea which you can, you can easily resect. So, you should start from there. So, and... there has to be some principle that... So, when you resect, so when when there are multiple tumors, uh, earlier there was an adage that you should resect the ones that are closer to the neck first and then you should go inside the bladder. Because if you resect inside plus and it, if it continues to ooze, that will hamper the, the resection that you are going to do from hysterically, right? That is one. But the other thing is also the easier ones you resected earlier and the ones where you're anticipating that it is going to be close to the wall or there is chance of having a, a ladder wall operation that you should keep it for last. So that you can in the same sitting resect as much as, as you can. If I can, uh, if I can answer Perhaps. the question. Uh, you see, uh, the ones in the dome, they are the most difficult to resect. And dome is the most mobile part. They should be resected the first because that's the time when your vision must be absolutely clear. As you keep on progressing, your vision will keep on becoming murkier and murkier. So the most difficult ones you should do first and the most difficult ones are the dome because they keep on moving up and down. And dome is the thinnest part of the bladder, most easy to perforate and therefore they should be done first. 
and then after that you can uh, go to the lateral wall then posterior wall and then finally the bladder neck the encircling ones because the encircling ones they will keep on falling on you and even after you have completed all of them you will still keep on uh, finding them and you will find them easy to resect even towards the end because you know when i was young at that time it was very common to find these cases and we went ahead and did 22 rbts also in one patient and that was the norm because we would avoid radical cystectomy to the maximum possible extent whereas these days we are going ahead with radical cystectomy much more comfortably so i have done a lot of these cases and this is what my this is the method that i have been following and this is what i would guide and obviously every person is free to choose what one feels comfortable with I think our time is up. So thank you, thank you for the. Uh, thank you, Sridhar. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the interesting discussion. I would request all the chairpersons and the moderator to move towards the right side of the auditorium for a group photograph and to collect their mementos. The next topic for discussion is management of complications in TURBT. I request Dr. Puneet Aluwalia, sir, Director and Head of Urooncology and Robotic Surgery, Medanta Gurgaon, to kindly come up on stage and introduce his panelists. everyone uh, thank you so much uh, jodhpur team for inviting us here and giving me this opportunity uh, for the panel discussion so uh, the topic for the panel discussion is management of complications in turbt and i have uh, some esteemed panelists in this panel discussion so i would like to invite first dr h s patyal who is director uh, blk max super specialty hospital delhi uh, dr anil elens who is a very senior chief urologist at uh, dhanvantri hospital meerut dr anil washne who is director of uh, institute of maximum uh, minimal uh, invasive urology at max hospital delhi uh, dr sanjay gar who is a senior uh, consultant urologist from gaziabad dr uh, navin kumar who is uh, assistant professor urology at aims patna so uh, welcome everyone on the panel discussion so uh, as we all know the trbt is one of the most common procedures uh, which are being done and uh, the first step in the management of bladder cancer is uh, the invasive step is trbt bt itself it can be a fairly simple procedure in a small uh, tumor but it can uh, at the same time be a very daunting one and very challenging one and sometimes it can uh, give you nightmares and your job job actually may be a more difficult one rather than a radical cystectomy especially in cases of multiple tumors larger tumors tumors in diverticulum so my first question to you patel sir is uh, how often do you encounter the complications in uh, trbt uh, the hemorrhage usually would occur in a uh, patient where the resection is in, is incomplete if you and this would inherently imply that's a muscle invasive tumor where you've gone and done a resection you can't you can resect only to a particular level the base is still friable the blood vessels don't collapse on their own and they continue to ooze. so they those are the patients who continue to bleed but uh, for a nm ibc patient which has been resected the as dr patel just said the incidental bleeding and other complications would be far lesser so the extent of the tumor would be the deciding exactly. factor on causing the exactly so it's uh, relatively uh, 
uh, relatively old uh, paper around uh, 8 to 10 years back and the incidence of transfusion was around 6% uh, in the on the day of surgery and 7% uh, uh, after uh, a couple of days and the incidence of uh, transfusion was actually more if there was uh, perforation as compared to uh, there was uh, as compared to no no perforation yeah, because that would indicate either incomplete resection or an abandonment of the procedure and uh, from the wall itself where the perforation would occur the vision would have been bad so hemostasis would not have been achieved exactly. so, yeah. So risk factors, we can divide it into tumor-related, technique-related, and patient-related. And uh, out of these, the most important thing is the large tumor. The most, most commonly, the bleeding, uh, bleeding is seen in patients with large tumors. Also technique-related, uh, sometimes you have an obturator drug and which can uh, actually lead to bladder perforation. That is also imp important. And uh, uh, patient factors, uh, especially in patients with uh, who are on antiplatelets or anticoagulants and having comorbidities. Even a large prostate or high bladder neck at times. Uh, Absolutely, that is also that is also. you in getting to the tumor, and as you mentioned, a very large bladder where you have to then probably resect it with partially distended and use suprabiotic pressure to get the tumor into reach of the instrument. Right. And of course, a tumor with the diverticulum is again where you could easily miss it. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Anil Vashnesa, so as you saw in the last slide, uh, patients on antiplatelet are uh, supposedly are at higher risk of bleeding during surgery. You have been doing uh, this procedure for many years now. Do you think uh, patients who are on antiplatelets, uh, they have a more tendency to have a transfusion uh, during or after the surgery in the like, next couple of days? Do you think that? Yeah, I think it in the current scenario, this is a very important question. The reason being that most of the majority of our patients are elderly and today in the era where you have stenting and all, they are majority of them are on antiplatelets, anticoagulants and mainly the arms, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, the, uh, this thing. So now the question is that uh, how do you deal with them and uh, I think the whole audience has witnessed that if you use laser, there is absolutely zero bleeding. The other problem was obturator jerk, which can initiate the perforations and leading to uh, bleeding. So these are two areas which can be definitely minimized and made zero with uh, the lasers. However, when you are doing monopolar TURP or bipolar TURP, uh, in principle, if the operator and the surgeon, as you have rightly said in the previous slide, has the experience, he looks into factors which can make the bleeding less. And those factors, I think the one which has been highlighted already, one of them is the quality and adequacy of resection and giving if you uh, keep all the other factors equal, if, if the uh, surgeon experience is good, if, if the resection is complete, if all the things are there, the only factor variable is plate, antiplatelets continuing and no antiplatelets continuing. Then do you think the bleeding is more? Or if the perfect uh, this thing has been done, resection has been done, there is nothing to worry about it. Only problem which has been observed is the incidence of clot retentions in post-operative periods. Yes. The reason for that is that there is little bit of uh, capillary ooze which persists for a long time and therefore one has to be alert in post-operative period because it could be prolonged bleeding for times. So, uh, yes, so the uh, transfusion rates are not different. Even in the, this paper has shown that patients who have continued uh, antiplatelets, whether it is a single uh, antiplatelet or a dual uh, antiplatelet combination, the transfusion rates were not different. However, the clot retention was more common in the patients who continued uh, antiplatelets. So, uh, next question to you, Lisa Vashnesa. Uh, for your cases, do you prefer uh, general anesthesia or a nerve block to prevent obturator jerk? And second you, thing, do you use monopolar or, or uh, you are equally comfortable with monopolar? My preference always is a general anesthesia for bladder tumors and especially the request to the anesthetist that we need a deep paralysis. The reason is that we don't want obturator jerk if we are using monopolar or even bipolar for that matter because it is claimed that bipolar is better than monopolar but the jerks are possible. So the question is that if it is possible 
then uh, you do not know in which case it will happen. So therefore, precaution should be taken whether you are doing monopolar or bipolar. So, uh, some studies do show that uh, the bipolar is better, but some of these studies they show that they are equivocal. Okay. So uh, as you rightly said, uh, so the, there are mixed results uh, regarding bipolar versus monopolar. Even with bipolar, oscillator jerk is seen. And uh, some papers say that uh, bipolar TRBT is better to prevent obturator jerk. Before yesterday only I was doing a case with uh, a patient totally under general anesthesia, not a very big tumor, but on the lateral wall. The cautery current, the cutting current was on to, I was using a bipolar, it had huge bipolar jerk. I was not able to even touch the Only thing which I could do was uh, just reduce the current to one and then I was able to do it. So even with bipolar, you can have uh, a big obturator jerks, and even patient in general anesthesia, and uh, which may lead to perforation. So there's something called transrecycle obturator nerve block. Also, this paper has shown that uh, it randomized 30, uh, uh, randomly assigned 30 patients in each group, in which uh, 10 ml of 1% lignocaine was given uh, uh, at the area of obturator nerve, which was identified with a nerve stimulator. And it was seen that uh, after this, the obturator jerk was reduced to 3% as compared to 16.5% uh, in patients in which nerve block was not given. So uh, once you have obturator jerk, uh, Dr. Sanjay, so you think uh, how common is perforation? Yeah, definitely uh, obturator jerk is one of the main factors that can cause bladder perforation. So there are many other factors <coughs> during uh, operations when we are uh, working on a site in, especially in dome or a large tumor is there uh, but obturator there definitely leads to can lead to better perforation how commonly do you think uh, is there the um, uh, perforation see uh, basically it can reach uh, like from vary from 0.5 percent to 7 to 8 percent uh, so it is actually uh, very underestimated and underreported in a uh, lot of literature yeah, many uh, small but professions are always underreported yeah so uh, if literature says that it is five percent to seven percent uh, Dr. Naveen, uh, what do you think is the most most important risk factor for bladder perforation? Most of the perforations are identified intraoperatively only. And so we should identify all the risk factors which may lead to bladder perforation. Like if the tumor is in lateral wall and it may lead to obturator nerve reflex leading to perforation. Or sir, if we are in an over distended bladder, even if we are not in lateral wall and we are doing deep resection, if the tumor is at the dome or it is in diverticulum, Yes, sir. And sir, if there is very large tumor, which is almost completely filling the bladder, and it may lead to bleeding, which when we may not see the bladder wall, and we may go beyond. Okay, right. Thank you. So uh, this was again a paper uh, from Oliver Traxer, and uh, in this paper it was uh, written that uh, if you are using a laser, although you may not have a perforation, but still you may have a bowel injury. The depth of uh, penetration is low, but still you may have a bowel injury in this case. And uh, as you uh, rightly said, these are the risk factors for bladder uh, perforation. And uh, one more order is reduced visibility and bleeding, which is the most common thing which happens. And when you are cutting without seeing, then definitely you can go wrong. So uh, on table, how are you going to identify uh, whether you have uh, if you injured the bladder? Yeah. So this can be diagnosed both ways, one by the surgeon himself or from the other side of the table, like from the NHS side. So when a surgeon, he sees that uh, the outflow is not coming, bladder is not getting distended and uh, he can either himself visualize the uh, perforation or sometimes there is a, uh, you can say the dark hole seen, sometimes he can visualize the fat, fat or some, uh, the bowel may also visible. So can you uh, uh, identify reasonably, surely that uh, it's an extra peritoneal versus intra peritoneal? So versus initially, versus initially uh, when the patient is uh, if under a spinal anesthesia, then patient might also complain of pain there can be distension of the blood, uh, abdomen so that can uh, we can say it, it can be intraperitoneal tachycardia can be there but uh, this is normally not seen in extraperitoneal when if it is intraperitoneal uh, distension of the blood, uh, abdomen and tachycardia can increase right uh, i think you have covered the points well there uh, so these are actually the technical considerations uh, which one should undertake to prevent any sort of intraoperative complications like uh, uh, doing surgery under GA for larger and uh, lateral tumors. Uh, use of continuous flow resectors have uh, changed the game in the last few years. Earlier, in the earlier era, when that was not there, then uh, it was uh, a problem because uh, this helps us in clearing the bleeding. Use of bipolar or laser, uh, as we know, uh, may help. 
avoiding over distension and keep keeping the partially uh, uh, blood partially distended also especially in the tumors which are on the dome and using a low current or uh, tapping current and systematic resection especially for the larger tumors starting from one edge and one pane at a time and following the curve of the bladder and conf confirming uh, hemostasis. Now I know uh, Dr. Amresa said that to uh, do the dome tumors first but uh, actually it depends upon experience but uh, literature says uh, that you, you, you should do the dome uh, and anterior tumors in the end because they are more prone to complication than perfor perforation and then if you have that then you are in a hurry to abandon the procedure. So uh, Ellen sir, you have done all that with these points. Still you are having significant bleeding, you have not uh, completed the tumor resection. What are you going to do? First of all, try to improve the vision as much as you can by doing a bladder wash and evacuating clots, if any. Then try to make sure that you have resected the tumor. If the resection is incomplete, it will continue to bleed. So make sure that the resection is complete. If the resection is complete, then we can do a systemic survey from one edge of the resected area to the other. Go slowly over the bed, close with your scope close to the resected floor. So that, and we are looking at arterial spurters. If they are there, we take care of them. Venous users obviously would be taken care of only subsequently when the bladder collapses and there is a catheter. If the resected floor is not is not the source of bleeding, then look around. We might have missed some tumor somewhere else in a diverticulum, anterior wall, anywhere else. If the systemic examination of the resected area doesn't work, then do a check of the entire bladder. If that all is not working or there is an obvious perforation or the bleeding is not and of course, at this time, you would have also checked with your anesthetist that your pressures are fine, the patient is not straining. If all that is not working, then probably if he's not hemodynamically too unstable, then probably just putting in a catheter, giving a bladder walk, uh, and letting an irrigation. Because as the bladder collapses, the penis and the capillary oozers will collapse over a period of time. So in some minutes or half an hour or so, they do carry off. The other option we could use, a lot of things have been used to be put inside the bladder or intravenously, epsilon, caproic acid, prerasmic acid, these have been used, they're all antifibrinolytic agents, so they might be helpful. How helpful they are, not sure, but in a situation where you are facing ongoing bleeding, there is no harm in using them. Another thing which was used, uh, Traditionally, uh, not available commercially is using a 1% alum uh, solution which is easy to make and uh, that does work and we could use it over a period of time. So I think uh, these are uh, the last two things like uh, glues and alums are more of uh, theoretical rather than... Uh, yeah, yeah, they are used practice. in radiation but yeah, in, so even in any, a resection... Any, any uh, experience with... Uh, requirement of angioembolization or laparotomy or radical surgery. Yeah, if those things don't work and the patient is not very stable, then we'll have no choice but to probably do an uh, ileic artery uh, ligation. So, but, uh, uh, me, those things would only be required probably uh, in very large tumors in under desperate conditions. Yeah. You call that salvage procedures to save the life of the patient. Absolutely. Only when the when the patient is, is very unstable, very unstable, because it. otherwise you might end up with more problem in just trying to open and trying to do an eyelid ligation. There. Absolutely. So uh, these are the two poll questions which I had floated in a WhatsApp group yesterday. Uh, only in this uh, conference uh, WhatsApp group, and there were uh, actually I saw there were around one more than one fifty members, and I got uh, eighty nine responses uh, in yesterday. And uh, out of 89, 15 urologists uh, uh, have actually encountered a situation where they have uh, where they had a need to do a radical cystectomy because of a serious complication of PRBT. So, and also uh, 12 out of 89 urologists have had an experience of having a mortality, which is 30 day post operative uh, mortality in this situation. So, five urologists have experience both. Now there may be separate uh, causes of that but five and they, they may not be uh, in the same patient but five urologists uh, uh, experience both. So in the literature the mortality rate is around one percent. So uh, which means out of 100 cases you have uh, you would see one patient dying because, just because of complication of your ability. So I think uh, there is this is not a very straightforward uh, procedure to be taken lightly. Uh, 
So, what's this? So, so one thing I would like to add in the last yeah. slide. Yeah. I have seen one emergency radical cystectomy due to TRBT because the patient was already having hematuria and his hemoglobin was low, and we took him for TRBT and we did only biopsy. But his hemoglobin means he kept on bleeding, so we had to take him for radical cystectomy. That, that, yeah, that is a cause for it. So whether this counts as a complication of TRBT or not, that I was not sure. If the patient is continuously bleeding and you have done an operative procedure and then you have, you, even um, for whatever reason you have done that, that is a complication of your. And in fact, the mortality also, if you are having a mortality within 30 days after a surgery, whether it is because of the uh, surgical procedure, anesthesia complication, patient comorbidities, it is counted as a uh, post-operative complication for that. So, uh, Dr. Vashne sir, uh, how do you manage uh, a bladder rupture? Uh, what, what do you do for uh, that? Uh, yes, please complete. Yeah, so, how, how, how do you uh, manage? Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, so that just continuation of the previous discussion. I recently had a patient who had a stenting cardiac stenting on antiplatelets and on seventh post-operative day he was having clot retentions, profuse hematuria and uh, clot evacuation was done by uh, one of the uh, people in the, this thing and then we scoped him, he had a tumor and then the tumor was resected, uh, it was in a site that uh, we avoided using laser and we resected it. After that he bled, he had clot retention once again then uh, again bladder wash was given and this was a patient ultimately we had to do bilateral internal iliac angioembolization. Then he said, this was just to say that this is a recent case. Now coming to management of rupture, we have uh, two kinds of ruptures. Primarily in, uh, they are detected on the table. It could be extraperitoneal rupture or it could be intraperitoneal and as uh, Sajja was telling, that the signs and symptoms of intraperitoneal rupture are totally different. But while you are doing, it is the surgeon who can find out if he sees fat or some uh, small rupture, it, mostly it is extraperitoneal. And the small ruptures, they are best managed by prolonged catheterization because there it will settle down. However, if you have signs and symptoms which are suspicious or you have detected a black hole, during your uh, surgery or if the tumor is anteriorly located on the dome where there is a high chance of intraperitoneal rupture and then contrast studies can differentiate. So you can put a histogram and find out whether it is a uh, extraperitoneal or intraperitoneal. And in intraperitoneal obviously one has to go ahead and do a laparotomy, do a double layer bladder closer, do a lavage and uh, uh, see to it that uh, there is no, but the, the question of needling and all, so that is a debate which you have already discussed, that whether one goes for emergency radical cystectomy or not, yeah. I'm sure that uh, the house may be divided on that. So I'll, I'll come to that, uh, that, that yeah. part is uh, coming. So, uh, but yeah, sir, uh, you have done a surgery, you didn't expect uh, you uh, a perforation, patient is not doing very well in the post-operative period. Uh, what signs and symptoms in the patient would made you think that it's a, it could be a uh, perforation which had missed and uh, how do you manage at that time? Would you wait uh, for the patient to improve? Would you take him for uh, uh, exploration? How, how would you uh, manage it? Everything, uh, everything depends uh, on uh, the presentation of the patient. First of all, the clinical examination is very important. The perforation has already been missed and uh, the patient uh, starts complaining of pain abdomen distension of the abdomen, uh, becomes restless. At that time, you think there is something gone wrong with the patient. So you start investigating in that particular manner. Or if you have waited for maybe two days or so, he may go into uh, septic problems, you know, running high fever, very severe pain, distension, <coughs> pieces of paralytic ileus. Now, the moment you suspect this thing, first of all, you must do an ultrasound, right. okay? and see if there is any collection in the uh, abdomen, whether it is retroperitoneal or it is uh, intraperitoneal. If suppose you don't get any help from that, then of course we have the CT scans could be, uh, you know, contrast CT, this thing, in that you can do a CT cystogram. Or you can do a uh, normal, you don't have the facilities, you can do a cystogram and you may see a leakage of uh, contrast with the abdomen. 
if it's a very small uh, perforation, a prolonged uh, catheterization, antibiotic cover might uh, look after the patient. However, if it is a significant perforation, you will have to look after that thing. If it is right in the immediate post op period, you don't have to open up the patient these days. You have, if it is intraperitoneal, you have laparoscope with you. You can always go and uh, suture, put in the drainage tube and all. Or else you open up, uh, do a laparotomy, do the lavage, drainage and everything, and uh, close the perforation, put in a drain. That's what is required. Of, on good antibiotic cover. Right, right. Thank you, sir. So the most uh, important thing in all this would be if you're compromising the oncological outcomes of the patient. So, uh, out, oncological outcomes of the patient uh, in a uh, in a patient who has uh, uh, had a bladder perforation uh, theoretically seems that it, it might be compromised. So, Dr. Sanjay, uh, what do you think are the extravesical recurrence rates or the metastatic rates in these patients? Do you think having had a perforation uh, may compromise their uh, or upstage their disease? Uh, it's a debatable uh, question or issue, and uh, many studies have shown different uh, outcomes. But uh, uh, majority, if we see that uh, if the it's a low-grade tumor, uh, then the, there is no change in the incidence of extravesical uh, extension or metastasis. But if it's a high-grade tumor, then definitely few cases have been reported that there is an increase in the metastasis outside the bladder. Right. So uh, exactly. So for uh, the patient who has had perforation, the literature says that. Uh, there is no evidence um, uh, to say that uh, the extra vesicle recurrence rates are more or the metastatic uh, rates are more. Uh, this is a series in which uh, only the last se uh, case series by Skolo Gary Kaus, uh, they showed that uh, they only provided the evidence that open surgical repair of the bladder following uh, TURBT invariably culminates in extra vesicle recurrence. So open surgical, <coughs> I have one more question. Any one of you can answer that question. Uh, if you are doing an open exploration of the patient who has had a perforation and there is a residual tumor uh, recurrence, so uh, are you going to resect that part of the bladder during the open uh, surgical uh, repair also? Or uh, if it is very close, I think if it is very close to the perforation area, then you should uh, resect that part of the bladder. If it is uh, far away, then obviously you will, you will not. So uh, do you agree with that, sir? Well, the role of uh, resection is very limited. However, if you are pretty sure that there was only one tumor in the area of the bladder which is resectable, that portion which can be removed, you know, every portion of bladder may you will not be possible for you to remove. If it's in the dome of the bladder, a little uh, uh, away from that, you can resect it. It is always good to resect it. However, uh, partial cystectomy, uh, planned partial cystectomy, I have my own experience. I follow up the two patients for the last for five years, but that's a different issue. Here it is an emergency situation, okay? So in these cases, uh, well, it can be resected. The role of intraperitoneal mitomycin, okay. that is a debatable question. Okay. There are some series where people have advised this thing. There are others who do not advocate that. So I think like uh, Ellen sir said initially that uh, lavage and uh, proper thorough uh, lavage. Yeah, uh, that is uh, good. So, Dr. Naveen, uh, what do you think are the risk factors if you are uh, going to have a metastatic uh, disease? Uh, what do you think may predispose, predispose to uh, the uh, so metastasis? Means it has uh, gone into the peritoneum or outside. So, I have not seen any patient who became metastatic after uh, perforation. I have seen three, four patients of with bladder perforation during TRBT. But after repair and all, and they completed their treatment according to the stage and they had not become metastatic. So, means my experience is not there in the, to so much in this case, but uh, only if the, there is intraperitoneal rupture or if the patient has been surgically repaired as sir said, or if there is residual tumor, then there are chances of, if there is very large tumor, which is residual, or if there is high grade or high stage of tumor, yes. which may be muscle invasive, Initially so only. These, these patients can have, like Dr. Sanjay also said, like, uh, low grade tumors uh, do not actually metastasize. And what literature says is that uh, high grade uh, tumors or intraperitoneal uh, perforations may actually be predisposing. The last thing is intraoperative blast. Nowadays uh, we saw, uh, see it much uh, lesser because uh, of the improvements in techniques. But still, sometimes we encounter uh, uh, a loud sound while doing a TRBT. 
uh, that is actually because of the production of gases and entry of uh, oxygen into the bladder while uh, doing a TRBT and when the cautery current comes uh, uh, in contact with that there is a large sound. So uh, any experience with the uh, intraoperative blast, anyone uh, having a uh, large sound or uh, having actually a bladder rupture in that. So I have had uh, a couple of times when I have heard a lo loud sound but the bladder was fortunately okay. So, Same thing, uh, yeah. A couple of times we have heard this uh, sound, not very... Uh, very so anyone in the audience if uh, they uh -huh. have uh, experience of uh, perforation or bladder rupture because of the blast, so uh, can uh, share. Yeah. Uh, sound we heard many times, so uh, just a, a complicated pretty scary word. sound, but no rupture. We have seen uh, Professor S.K. Saramat, which is one of the best resectionists and one of the best endoscopic surgeons. He was doing in 2004, achanak boom, awaj kyaam, and bladder awaj kyaam. Even once I was doing, <coughs> while I was coagulating anterior, dissecting and after coagulating anterior tumor, here bladder bubbles generate, and bubble usually settle at the door. And when you are taking any spark, all within the we can gather, the petroleum gas, gas start boom. So bladder the is, is, very, is not yeah. That's what yes. they say, so. that if you have bubbles in the dome of the bladder, never go very close to that. Yeah. It is uh, the oxygen plus the hydrogen uh, combined together, which gives rise to blast. I think the two cases were presented in one of the conferences where they had a rupture of the bladder. Yes, I have seen two cases. One about three, four months back, and about uh, one case was about 20, 30 years back. And there was a click sound and then there was a rupture of the bladder and gut was if you go for the scopy it was at the dome both time it was in the dome first case i have repeated resection of the bladder tumor filled with the tumor and it was thin out so probably it is because of thin bladder it was and second is the it is a virgin case so i have uh, have the experience of two cases so the main idea is to prevent of this thing that you don't let the outside air go inside. Yeah. Be very careful and always keep the bladder empty and don't go very close to the bubbles. So the idea is to uh, keep Good the air out. There's the a well-defined technique for that and the management is like a uh, uh, preparation. So I uh, thank uh, all my panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Puneet, I congratulate you for collecting such a data in such a short time. It was just overnight that he collected the data of uh, this uh, emergency cystectomy as well as uh, the other thing was mortality. Mor mortality. I really congratulate you. I, we should congratulate the, uh, all the audience sir, because 89 responses was not, not a small thing and actually everyone participated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Puneet and thank you everybody. Thank you so much, sir, for the lovely discussion. Uh, please, uh, I would request you to move towards the right side of the auditorium to take the mementos and for a group photograph. For the next panel discussion, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ankur Mittal, uh, additional professor and head department of urology, names Rishikesh. Uh, the discussion would be on intravesical agents for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, uh, availability of different agents, alternate options, protocols, complications, failures, and dose optimization of intravesical BC. I think after a power pack session of uh, in live operative sessions and wonderful sessions by Starburst since morning, so we are now ending probably towards the end with some. Uh, so I would like to uh, at the outset I would like to thank the organizing committee for the, giving this opportunity, and now I would like to invite our esteemed panelists, Dr. S. S. Yadav, the president of Rajasthan Urology Society, chief urologist in uh, Nirmala Hospital and Research Center, Jaipur, Dr. Major General S. Uh, Srinath, senior consultant urologist at Apollo Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Raghav Talwar, Professor in Urology at Armed Forces Medical College, Pune. Dr. Rupesh Shah, Chief Urology, CIMS Ahmedabad. And Dr. Vikas Pawar, Associate Professor Urology, Ames Rishikesh. Welcome, sir, please.
so the mandate which was given uh, by the organizing team was about non muscle beta carcinoma we have already learned about trbts now we need to move ahead so a uh, brief case fails to uh, my esteemed panelist he is a 62 year male chronic smoker intermittent gross hematuria passage of clots no significant past history examination normal we are just uh, skipping the staging work up negative trbt was done bore into 4.5 cm solitary papillary pedunculated tumor histopathology t1 high grade urothelial carcinoma and uh, it is a lamina proper invasion present a deep muscle absent rest is done again no evidence of malignancy so uh, i would start with uh, dr rupesh shah so uh, so what next how do you plan your further management now i think he is 62 year gentleman otherwise fit and having high grade t1 with more than 3 cm tumor is large so definitely it will come in high risk category and i'll explain to the patient that he'll having high risk category so chance of recurrence as well as progressions are high in these situations and uh, probably t of progression would be around 30 to 40% at 5 years so i will definitely counsel for aggressive surgical management if he is willing because he is only 62 right now and possibility for cure so okay i think the risk risk assessment is a important yeah, point yeah. here so we risk stratify our patient based on various risk scores which we have based on aua ua nccn and as we as uh, dr shah said he was a case of even high grade right and uh, exactly fitting the patient in high risk category so uh, my question to dr vikas uh, after this risk assessment you know what were the further options which are coming in our mind right now for this patient so since this patient is in the high risk group so there if we go according to the guidelines then early cystectomy and intravesical therapy are the viable options although we say uh, that the patient should be counseled for early cystectomy but as a urologist we ourselves know that how many of these patient usually turn into early cystectomy most of these patient are offered intravesical uh, bcg therapy or uh, intravesical chemotherapy as uh, being done nowadays like gem dosi and other agents okay so i think uh, we all agree with this so we have multiple options so let us go one by one so uh, yeah is there a point from uh, no i just sit up for one minute yes so in the your choice for cystectomy you would be actually on a stronger ground if he was in the very high risk in the high risk category how aggressively do you counsel for a cystectomy is dr shah uh, you like to yeah, yeah. only uh, i will explain to the patient but uh, that point is only it is not having multifocal tumor suppose this patient is having small multifocal tumor even in this uh, their probability of progressions are still high and recurrence are still high they are in high risk category so very high risk definitely early cystectomy is the option but even in high risk uh, my preference would be at the age of 62 yes i will explain intravesical therapy it is there but ultimately this patient after couple of years he might have a progression of disease and he might have a cystectomy okay i think uh, with this we will we will come to this discussion a bit later on uh, my question to dr uh, s s yadav sir said uh, uh, let us uh, you know uh, this patient goes for intravesical bcg as a option so what do we foresee and how do we counsel this patient that okay what is the progression recurrence of these uh, treatment modality for him in future i think this patient uh, must go for uh, induction and maintenance bcg therapy because it definitely in decrease the incidence of recurrence as well as progression which is not available with other uh, chemotherapy which is available the reduction is about 30 35% and definitely this is a single tumor which is uh, t1 and uh, it is low grade so it is have the high possibility we will be able to check the recurrence as well as the progress in species right sir so uh can we come uh, so okay so now the patient is uh, asking about the doses and the duration of this therapy so my question to uh, doc, uh, dr dr uh, raghav talwar so so what will be the duration optimum duration and doses of this intravesical therapy for this patient 
Yeah. So when we were doing our urology, the dose we used to give was very high. It used to be under 20 in young people and 80 maybe in older people. But over time, that is over the last two decades, it's come down. Now we come down to a dose of 60 milligram, 60, which is given to most people and very elderly people, we go down to even 41. So that is the dose we give and the duration would be uh, uh, modified lamps is what we practice. That is uh, induction followed by maintenance at three months and six months and then six monthly for three years. That is three weekly. So I think if these two questions, if we address and we ask, there can be difference in opinion in the house. But as, let us see what guideline says. Guideline still goes in favor of full dose, which is 120 milligram. The duration may vary for one to three years. But I, I agree that in uh, the difference in opinion can be there about 80 milligram to start with, whether 120 full dose or not. But yes, as per guidelines, what we see is one to three years as per EAU and AUA three years for these high risk patients and full dose therapy. So, and definitely there are some articles about uh, these full dose versus one third dose uses and uh, they were uh, basically say that they are being well tolerated but as in practical experience we have uh, the BC toxicity cases quite often which are under reported probably in the literature that we face. Okay, now coming back uh, to again uh, these, uh, you know, uh, BCG full dose, one year, three year, so basically what, what exactly uh, is the difference between progression and recurrence? Uh, what do you uh, sir, suggest about this one year, three year uh, on the progression and recurrence of disease? Hello. First of all, dosage is one should important thing is around 15 uh, uh, million calorie forming units should be there. But unfortunately, the uh, actual number of calorie forming units is 1 to 19.1 uh, 10 to the power of 8 calorie forming units in the present Anko BCG which we are using. So, uh, it is very difficult to say what dose you are giving that may be having only one or it may be having 18. So, it is, there is a lot of difference between what we give and that's why around uh, almost uh, consensus is there around 80, 80 milligram is the one which we are giving most often in this. And uh, definitely the best results have been when you are given it for the full uh, three years protocol that is the best results both for decreasing recrescence and also recurrence and progression. That is the best which has been shown in the three year. Right, sir. So basically, uh, my question is, Rubin Shah, we have different regimes for maintenance therapy. Induction, we, we you all use weekly. The maintenance therapy can, some, some uses monthly therapy and some uses, so what is your take over these two therapies about the efficacy and, and again, the progression and recurrence of this disease using these two regimes? Whatever the protocol we follow in the maintenance therapy, but at least one year of the maintenance should be there, either every monthly or either three, six and 12 months, that uh, two out of three, that adequate BCG has to be given, that should be there, what I, uh, what I feel. So yes, I think uh, there are studies, with, although there is a limitation literature about these regime of ma monthly maintenance or three monthly swap regime, but I think whatever literature we have, they are based on all swap, they are less on monthly regime, but I think we agree to you that there are literature that both are same safety and efficacy, both monthly as well as the three monthly regime for maintenance. Yes, so, way, there is one missing when you after an induction course, when you give the maintenance therapy, the maximum increase in the immunological activity is at three weeks, then it comes down. So, it stands to reason that uh, giving three doses is definitely better than giving one dose. So I think now the point comes here that we are definitely discussing BCG, but what next? We should be knowing alternatives, why alternatives are required? So uh, the question is to Dr. Vikas, what do we understand like BCG intolerance? So uh, the word BCG intolerance says that if the patient is not able to tolerate at least one induction cycle, then we label it because of the toxicity or any other reason, then it is labeled as BCG intolerance. That is different from uh, BCG yeah, I, failures. yeah, I think uh, we all agree with this that this is basically tolerated one full induction course, not just a one therapy. So I think this and this is how that uh, we should understand that where comes the other option of intravascular therapy is. My question to uh, another question to Dr. S. Yadav sir that if a pa this patient comes is on BCG therapy and comes to the clinic with a history of fever, you know, low grade fever or maybe less than 24 hour duration. So what will your next take of action in this case regarding the intravascular therapy? If the patient have low grade uh, fever and it is being treated by paracetamol or something else and uh, then there is no need of changing the protocol. 
if there is fever which is lasting for a better long time, 48 to 72 hours, then we have to go for some antibiotic, we have to suspend it for some time, symptom is all, then we can go for the, the uh, same course of PCG. Right. So as suggested, I think grade 1, grade 2, grade 3 toxicity, we all understand. Grade 1 doesn't require cessation as sir suggested. Grade 2, grade 3 and grade 4 requires and grade 4 definitely the severe systemic infection, which we all, and this is the most important point here today is uh, the suddenly sometimes in the doctor, uh, Dr. Uh, Talwar, so suddenly you find that there is, you know, a sudden shortage of BCG and now patient is on. What other alternatives do you think that this patient uh, could have been continued now? You don't have BCG available. Uh, so BCG shortage is a real thing being faced around the world. So if that happens, maybe you can ration the dose of BCG, give lower doses to more number of people. That is one option. Second option is you go to chemotherapy, intravesical chemotherapy with or without hyperthermia. These are the two options. Uh, or third is, the, which I don't have much experience, that is the interferon therapy, intravesical, interferon, interleukin. Okay, so, uh, you, uh, so uh, would you suggest something on the same thing? BCG naive patient not yet started. Patient need to be started with intravesical therapy, but yes, there is no BCG available right now in the market for some time. Uh, AUA in that situation in 20 said to give uh, for the intermediate risk, since the risk is low, why not give chemotherapy? They said give chemotherapy to them. That is in the form of MMC post uh, this thing. And the, only for uh, high risk and very high risk, give the uh, BCG, whatever is available. Otherwise, of course, uh, the uh, MMC, that is the uh, uh, chemotherapy, or hyperthermia with chemotherapy, or combination chemotherapy, or sequential, that is gemcitabine and docetaxel and various uh, these kind of theories. And there is also new th therapies in the form of viral vaccines, vectors, which will give to gen genetic material is given to the bladder cells to produce interference within the cells. That is also in making. I think in this point of time, uh, we have already discussed, see, we have options of adjuvant therapy of mitomycin with high vac. There are studies over it as an adjuvant, as a new adjuvant both. As an adjuvant sitting, the study uh, which has been published in European Neurology says a two-year recurrency survival for high vac is 82%, which is better than BCG, what we understand as of now. New adjuvant high vac is also there, although not uh, to that extent as adjuvant. So if we talk about other options like gemcitabine combination as uh, right now suggested by our panelist, we have, uh, you know, gemcitabine versus BCG for high risk patients. The, there is a randomized prospective study which has been shown that solo, solitary gemcitabine alone is inferior for BCG naive patients as compared to BCG in non beta carcinoma but BCG naive patients. But when we talk about gemcitabine docetaxel combination in BCG9 patients, they are coming up with a better, uh, you know, uh, progression uh, free and returns free as compared to BCG. Although we are away from uh, level one evidence till now, but these are the options and chemo radiation. One second, it, it, all things have no chemotherapy has shown decrease in progression. It has only shown decrease in recurrence. Only BCG has shown decrease in progression. Right, sir. That is an important point we should not miss. Point well taken, sir. So, now, the uh, Dr. Shah, so our, apart from this, what we understand right now, uh, are we aware, like, whatever the upcoming intravascular therapies in BC9 patient, because this shortage problem somehow is coming up now, we don't know whether we will sometime land up with a complete shortage of BCG. I think what, sir, said some vaccines are available, like TAR 200 and some but uh, still it is in the clinical trial base. We do not have any personal experience of that. So I think just to cover up for the uh, recent sake, there are some trials going on of these the slow release gemcitabine and there are trials going on on, you know, gemcitabine and satilimab. There are trials on gemdosi as a primary head-to-head -head comparison with uh, BCG in BCG naive patients and trial on 2 gram dose of gemcitabine versus uh, BCG gemdosi. So there are multiple trials which are already on in this BCG9 patient. The results are almost awaited in 24-25. So I think now if we, uh, the point here is that if we compare all these things in one go for BCG9 patients, as we have already discussed, that we know about BCG is around 70% we have a reference free. As we have told, it doesn't, we talk, don't talk about progression. But when we talk about um, uh, high vac, it is 82. GEM alone is 54. GEM dosi is 84. So overall, 
somewhere what we understand right now is that in such BCG 9 patient, if we don't have BCG, if other option need to be selected as per current literature, gem dossi still is there as an option if there is a busy shortage. I think this is just a club what we have done apart from the other things. Okay, now coming back to the case, uh, uh, we start Dr. Vikas. So now patient was on BCG and then uh, again he received a monthly for three months. Checks, cystoscopy was done. There is a recurrence 2 cm papillary pedagnated tumor. Underwent URPG. Again, T1 high grade deep muscle free. What next? Uh, Same patient. Just go back to the slide. I could, <laughs> we could not follow. Yeah. So he was, he received BCG induction okay, weekly. The, the patient is having recurrence two months after starting the induction uh, maintenance therapy. Yes. So if it is within the six months interval of maintenance therapy, then the patient can be classified as BCG unresponsive tumor. Okay. So uh, again, I think it's a very important point here that as Dr. Vikas suggested, so once we have such cases where we find some sort of a recurrence, then Basically, we need to understand about these some terminology which were a bit confusing initially, but now I think things are more clear when this we understand this BCG unresponsiveness. So this BCG failure is more clear about it. We all know intolerance, we have discussed. We all know toxicity, we all know relapse early and late. BCG refractive was a term. Now basically all these cases where they have clubbed BCG refract early refractory and BCG early relapse as BCG unresponsive. But the condition is that the patient should receive an adequate BCG exposure. Sir, uh, can we just discuss about what the, what does adequate BCG uh, dose is, Dr. Yadav? Basically, if you are following the uh, course of 80 milligram or 120 milligram, then it should be given for a regular interval of or weekly for six weeks, and then we have to go for the maintenance. If there is patient is proper in dosing and even then he has recurrence or there is residual disease there, then it means patient is not responsive. Uh, so, may, uh, may yeah. I, uh, Dr. Vikas. So, uh, originally it was proposed by LAM that uh, altogether six cycles, six induction cycles are not necessary. After a finite dose of cycles, there is plateau of IL-1 IL TS2 response. So, he proposed four out of six, but the recent literature says at least five out of the six induction doses has been received by the patient and at least two of the three maintenance doses according to the SOG regime has been received by the patient then it can be classified as adequate doses. Yeah and the dose uh, they have taken to 120 mg. Yeah. So I think the message is the dose what, whatever recommendation guidelines we have they are all on 120 mg they are not on 80. So minimum out of you know five out of six and two out of you know uh, maintenance if the patient has covered so okay. Uh, one point here to be noted that we do have gap in data regarding uh, the patient who are on monthly intravesical therapy. So the adequate BCG doses for those uh, group of patients is just to be accepted. Dr. Talwar, uh, so what will be the next option for this patient? Patient is now BCG responsive as we have discussed. So if this patient 62 years, no comorbidities, he is unlikely to do well. So maybe I would offer him early cystectomy. That is one option. opinion. Uh, the next if, he, if he refuses, then we have to go for uh, uh, some of the chemotherapy. And the best one, which uh, at the current this thing is gem, gem, for, gem and uh, docetaxel uh, sequential therapy. Okay. So I think uh, as per guideline, but in this case, when you deal with BCR responsive, that's the first line treatment, which need to be all options need to be given to the patient. And as we have discussed that. Radical cystectomy in this patient is an option, definitely. And after that, if the patient doesn't agree, the other options are also there. It's not that it ends at radical cystectomy. So I think uh, this patient is not willing for radical cystectomy, has been counseled. So uh, what are the other options, uh, Dr. Shah, how we'll proceed now? But patient needs treatment, but he's not willing for cystectomy. He's a BCG unresponsive patient. BCG unresponsive and not willing. So only now options are probably HIVEC or CT chemo radiation therapy or either gemcitabine uh, gem and cisplex. That dosigem, uh, dosigem plus gemcitabine. This is either of this option I will discuss with patient. And if they are willing for intravesical therapy, and uh, then gem dosigem would be better because HIVEC uh, whatever center I am, HIVEC is not available. So I think dosigem is better. 
I think again all those options which we have discussed in BCG naive patients, they still holds true in BCG failure cases once the patient has not given a consent for hysterectomy. But yes, what we should understand, there are uh, level 1 evidence about adjuvant high back therapy. So they said there is no uh, difference in the survival between these two arms when we compare with BCG as a second cycle BCG apart from either you give a second cycle BCG as we have discussed. So again, when we talk about gemcitabine alone, so we have a Cochrane review on gemcitabine, you know, intravascular for this and definitely in this setting of BCG and responsiveness for BCG refractory case, it is superior to another course of BCG and MMC as with HIVAC. So this is something with the, which is just, uh, you know, against the point which we were talking about BCG naive patients, where gem dossi was coming up over gemcitabine. So, uh, Again, there are studies on docetaxel, gem dossi, right? I will be covering it short because uh, in the uh, in interest of time. And this is the most important thing, I think, which we have discussed when we see all the literature in totality for PCG failure. Here, the gem cetabin is coming up over gem dossi as of now. Although whatever literature and evidence we have as of now, although trials are already running, we don't know what will be. But and the dose. So what dose, Dr. Uh, Yadav? What dose of uh, gemcitabine? If the patient has already disagreed for uh, RC and uh, second cycle BCG, we are not considering. If if gemcitabine, what dose and what how will one gram twenty mg should be given? Right. So the take home message, I think, uh, with this, uh, with our panelists, they already discussed all these options, all, all these points that when we deal with BCG naive patients. The gold standard is BC as of now, single agent. We have uh, HIVAC as adjuvant therapy combination. We have gem dosi. In BCG failure, we have gemcitabine over gem dosi as a better agent. So, and the upcoming intravascular therapies, uh, definitely there are a lot of trials going on. We will not discuss it today that, but there are definitely coming up a lot of trials on this non muscle beta carcinoma. And I think we will have some good results in future. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think, and with this, uh, I would take this opportunity to invite all the delegates and esteemed faculty members here for the Urooncology first annual meeting of Urooncology section under USI, and uh, it is it will uh, on 9th and 10th of June in uh, Rishikesh Ames, and I uh, invite you all on behalf of organizing committee as well as uh, USI for this. So we will uh, looking forward to welcome you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for an enlightening session. I request all the panelists and the speaker to proceed to the right of the auditorium for the mementos and a group photograph. Moving on towards the last academic session of the day, I call upon stage Dr. Samit Chaturvedi, Senior Consultant Neurologist from Saket, to moderate this session. Today's discussion would be incomplete without uh, without a session on the role of artificial intelligence in urology. I welcome on stage Dr. Kamaljeet Singh sir, senior consultant urologist from Amritsar to talk about new age AI tools for bladder cancer. Okay sir. For this talk I call upon stage Dr. Lalit Shah sir, who is the president elect USI. Uh, if you aren't thorough with this topic, it can land you in a big bowl of medical legal soup. So I call upon stage Lalitsha sir to give his talk on medical legal aspects in managing bladder carcinoma. Thank you Good evening everyone, <clears throat> after a wonderful day of super academic session, I would try to relax you a little bit, dance you a little bit, shake you up and wake you up and take you into the different world. My topic is medical legal aspects in managing bladder cancer. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that on my searching day about the cases against the urologists for management of CA bladder in medical negligence. I could not find too many. 
But the bad news is that we come to know about the cases only after 10 to 15 years when they occur because to the final destination it takes about 10 to 15 years. So whatever we are not knowing, there may be so many cases which are running at this stage, we will not come to know, number one. Number two, internet is such a vast thing that our ability to search and get the cases is not 100%. <clears throat> So this is one case, Gupta versus IV Hospital. Problem was there, radical cystectomy was done. Ultimately, over a period of time it was detected, there was an osmotic leak. And uh, as per the judgment, it was, in their assessment, it was taken that there was a delay in resurgery for opening the anosmotic things. Because on second day there was an ascites and a lot of things in the abdomen and they postponed it for another 3-4 days as a compensation of 50 lakhs. But here, again, it was not by urologist. So this is a waking up point that this surgery was done by a surgical oncologist. In this particular case, 3-4 procedures were done and as per the documents, there was no valid informed consent. Uh, in many places, the patient signature is not there. We all know of by now for sure that in non-emergency case, we need to have the patient's himself or herself signature. In many of the consent, it was the columns were three, patient, attendant, and witness. In one of the consents, there was no signature of the patient. Son had signed as an attendant, and son himself has signed as a witness. So the court has made a note, how can you be the witness to your own signatures? And then there was an expert opinion from a premier institute, but it was just like that, that there was no medical negligence. So the court has all the rights to ignore that and they rejected the expert opinion. One of the sentences which was written was no obvious medical negligence. So court interpreted it in a different way. It means that there is a medical negligence but it was not obvious to the expert committee. So you can understand the attitude of the people sitting on the judgment chair and deep is what we all need to be awake about. This was one of the another case. The seizure was left inside the body during the surgery and the urologist was fined 7.5 lakhs. The urologist and cancer hospital had to pay. Consumer court says the treating doctor had allegedly left one seizure of 7 to 10 inches inside. The doctor while carrying out life-saving operations such as surgery to remove cancer from the part of the body, the doctor is supposed to exercise extreme care, caution and due diligence. Even the slightest of error or mistake can play havoc with the life of the patient. These are the words in the judgment. Leaving an object like Caesar inside the body while carrying out surgery is out and out an act of negligence on the part of opposite party three, which is a urologist, who had at that time was working with OP1, that is the hospital, as an employee. So one and three were punished. In short, March 12, patient had some urinary complaint, workup was done, bladder cancer was detected, suggested an immediate surgery, surgery was performed. They said that the, the patient is cured and the chemotherapy has to follow. Patient followed for the chemotherapy. After three months in May, patient complained of pain and assurance was given, some medical treatment was given and told that after big surgery, these things like this happened. After three months more, August 12, again patient had pain and went somewhere else. But there, the x-ray was done and the scissors was found. So the patient was referred to higher center, patient went to PGI and the surgery was removed, the seizures were removed. The case was filed against the hospital oncologist under whom the patient was admitted and the urologist. So the opposite party one, two and three, an ultimate judgment, it was opposite party one and three who had been penalized. In this one of the sentences which has been mentioned is, it can be safely inferred and held that a foreign body was rejected in the abdomen of the complainant there is absolutely no evidence or any possibility that in between after the surgery and before the seizures was detected, the complainant went another surgery because this is the gap which we, when, whenever we are suggesting the people for the defense, how to protect your defense. Because if there is a gap, we can always say, and we have been successful in two of the cases where we produce a oita of doubt that the patient might have gone to somewhere else and had gone under surgery. So this complication is because of that surgery and not because of the previous surgery. And with some certain documents, we were able to prove and save those patients. 
Now in this particular case, even otherwise, it seems highly probable that a patient who reports complete faith in the doctor who performs surgery to save him from the serious cancer disease would level false allegation or manipulation or would twist fact to raise an accusing finger against the doctors. So that is the attitude of thinking about this judgment. So as a result, then of course the penalization was done. Another thing that was very, very important is when there are three opposite parties, there should be a reasonable understanding and a teamwork. Here, opposite party one and two gave the statement which was not matching with the statement of party three. Party one and two said that in the May when he had come, he had come to the opposite party three and we are not aware whether he had pain, he had come or whatever happened, we don't know anything. Another thing was in the defense which, which I could found on the retrospect, in general, in uh, what we see in the movies, the cross-examination. There is no cross-examination in general in consumer court. If you want to cross anything, you have to give a questionnaire, that is an interrogatory, they say, and then the interrogatories will be answered by the, the expert evidence people. Then you again have a chance to deny or contradict that. But in this particular case, whatever was written by the expert opinion, the opposite party three did not contradict. So what it happens, the law is very clear. If I say that Kamalji slapped me, and unless until Kamalji says, no, I did not slap him, it will be taken for granted that Kamalji slapped me. Oh, don't do that, huh? Uh, this is another case. Uh, Howla resident brings allegation of medical negligence against Apollo Hospital. He registered a complaint of medical negligence in the Bengal Clinical Establishment Commission. He alleged the hospital had provided an erroneous biopsy report of the father for which the hospital insisted for a second surgery. And he also claimed that the report was submitted to some other hospital, two other hospitals, cancer hospitals, and they, con they said, no, there is nothing like that. Operation was carried out in May 14. The sample of tumor in the deep tissue of the biopsy bladder was sent for biopsy. Estimated cost was told to be 1.5 lakh, but ultimate bill was 2.13 lakhs. This also is one of the tender points which precipitates the case against the doctors and the hospitals. The histopathology report and the doctor confirmed that it was a high-grade papillary urothelial tumor with deep muscle invasion. And that's why the radical cystectomy was advised and cost around 6 to 7 lakhs. But later on when he went to another two hospitals, they said that it is a high-grade tumor, all right, but there is no muscle invasion. So it was like that at a far major surgery creating and taking lots and lots of money for the second surgery, a RNS biopsy had been intentionally provided. That is the allegation. So what is very, very important, number one is the counseling in general and our medical record should match with everything. And the most and the single most document which is very, very important is a valid informed consent. Of course, time will not allow me to go for this discussion of that, but in short, nature of treatment, its alternative, risk, benefit are the part of the informed consent and there should be an opportunity of the Christian. Another thing is that there has to be given a cooling period where patient can think it over about all the things that you have told him and if he wants to retract his consent. Thank you very much. Everybody, uh, this is the last talk for the day. Uh, I deliberately to shifted it to the last one is because I wanted that we must know what is happening around us and what all is the AI tools which are available to us. I will be finishing off in a very short time. Don't worry, the slides may be 30, but I'm going to speak. The more of the AI pa paradigms which are available are on the diagnostic fronts. Now the AI is generating uh, is evolving over the last couple of years and it has really come up. Our artificial intelligence or the knowledge of the computer is only limited to what we call as the Google uncle. But trust me, Google will be in history that it is a, just a search engine, it is nothing more than that. We only go to the computers to find out and answers to the questions what we have in our mind. 
Today I will show you some examples of it, how we can use an AI tool is. Any postgraduate students can find answers to their questions, whatever they get in the exams in a matter of few seconds. So the drawbacks for the Google uncle is it's a biased privacy concern. There's a limited transparency. You get a 1.1 crore data or results and you have to really search through it. And it's actually spam and misinformation has also become part of it. Many questions, whatever we may put in Google, it may not come up with any kind of an answer. So what we look towards in artificial intelligence is we wanted a kind of a platform where which we ask, we have any kind of a query and we can do it. Now trust me, what Dr. Lalit Shah said will be a kind of a uh, thing which this is a kind of a double-edged sword. We are going to fight it in the, both the ways but it is going to be a big helping tool for us. So this is the most happening thing which is the chat GPT. This is the first, uh, second generation of the artificial intelligence which has been launched. There is already the third version which has come but only the free version which is available to us is known as chat GPT. Rest all is the paid versions we are having. Now I'm going to show you how we can use this. I'm not going to do the diagnostic part. There were many knowledgeable people out here. I don't find that I can even stand in front of them is. But I will tell you how you use this app which is freely available on Google too and how you can get yourself benefited from it. You ask it any question and it will have an answer for you. So it is just like I am talking to my own computer and my laptop. So how it analyzes, I am not, I'm not going to go into the detail, it's pick up the chat watch, it has a paradigm, it has a messaging apps and this literature, what is it available and it will it actually takes out where you belong to, what, what fraternity you belong to, and then it will start answering it that way. So this whole exercise is whatever next 10 to 15 slides is how you actually see the results on Google and how it, the chat GPT gives it to you. So it is artificial science versus the data science, which is uh, Google. Now my first question to it was, what is the NCCN staging for carcinoma bladder risk? I got somewhere over 345, if I'm the reading is correct, 3.45 lakhs, the results. Practically, it's not humanly possible to do it. And when I pasted in chat GPT the same question, in a matter of 5 seconds, I get whatever I wanted. What is the treatment for locally advanced prostate can uh, bladder cancer? So you get, again, 2.28 lakhs or maybe 2.28 crores results which are coming, it comes in it, not practically possible and this is how it gives it in chat GPT whatever the options are available to it. These are a few examples and we will go it. Is robotic radical cystectomy better than laparoscopic radical cystectomy? It is a controversial question. The robotic surgeons will pitch for it while the laparoscopic will pitch for it. And it, it says that there is an ongoing debate between both the procedures. What is the cost factor which comes here? This is the kind of an answer you are looking at if you have to write a paragraph for anybody who is a postgraduate in a kind of an examination, they are asked it. So they can just quote kind of a thing, a, a good vernacular and just devise it and just pick it up. What is the adjuvant chemotherapy for bladder cancer? The same kind of results we are going to have it, it is going to tell you. Now remembering the doses of chemotherapy is in Herculean task and then is to calculate as knowing the weight and this thing is calculating the body surface area. These are all is on your finger tip. Now comes the one of the best part is what Dr. Lalit Shah has been speaking for years now is what is the informed consent in the case of a radical cystic me. If you try to find it out on, on Google you get again millions of results. We have a Norzone consent form also coming into it. This is the consent form, the radical cystectomy which will come on the on chat GPT to you. Now the problem is, the, Dr. Laleksha always says it, it should be in the vernacular what the patient understands. So here comes it, I type it, just put this consent in Hindi. It gives me like this. Now somebody like in my state of Punjab, Hindi may not be this thing, yes. So if I want it in Punjabi. So it gives me in Punjabi also. Debate forms, like debate forms a major point between the stalwarts in any conference. We have a lot of debates. Now we have a debate on laparoscopic radical cystectomy in comparison to robotic assisted 
this may be a good point of debate is now how you have to debate it so here are the points anybody can use to debate also so it's like a kunji or a handbook to everybody which is here now if i want to calculate the doses of this pattern in a chemotherapy now i have to remember it is 30 mg per meter square so i only know the height and the weight so you have to go on to that normogram then calculate it it is going to tell me i just put in the weight and the height it will give me the body surface area and then just tell me what is the doses i want to deliver wait i'm not finished yet now we get a legal notice as per what dr lalit shah said it you get a legal notice and now i want to re reply to it you write a letter as reply to the legal notice regarding the patient who had filed a complaint against me following the death in a consumer court it will give you a reply to it you can modify according to your language to make it a little more powerful now you want what is the percentage of the death that occurs in radical cystectomy it will come out with a concrete answer 0.5 to 5 percent depending on what are the morbid conditions which are going to be there what are the risk factors you can it again will give you an answer so this is these are the kind of kind of answers you are looking at in times of crisis now you want that i want to formulate a legal reply back so it will do it for you only you have to just go and call, copy paste and add a couple of lines for in your replies so this is the example of whatever you are having it to express grief also but you reply to all the the points of the legal notices there has been always a gap between the human and the computers what we wanted from the computers they did were not going to give it chat gpt is the first step in this regard where you are almost shaking hands with your computer and trying to get an information remember it this is a two edge the double edge sword for you it can be used against you also so be very careful in your clinical practice it doesn't take away all the kind of the safety factors we are we have to take during the clinical treatment of the patient this is actually it gives an access to the medical information it's a time saving thing for us you can educate your patients you can put in any consent forms you can say patient knowledge uh, documents can be done and for remote consultation it can be also used can chat gpt be a urology assistant this is the question i ask chat gpt again it can serve as a clinical assistant to an urologist in some ways it can provide quick and accurate answers to some of the queries but it is an ai language model which cannot replicate or cannot replace the human intelligence and analysis it can be only an help to you any responses a chat gpt gives you must analyze this critically and don't just copy and paste everything whatever is available this is an era of artificial intelligence there are only two sectors because i'm little good in finance the, the green energy and artificial intelligence are going to be the next things for the upcoming 10 years our brain functions with every part of the brain has a different kind of a function soon we will also have an artificial intelligence which can function in a various aspects and give us a very good kind of a response to any query we are going to raise us thank you everybody for a patient hearing and here comes the disclaimer i did use chat gpt to make this powerpoint presentation and it helped me how to devise it thank you we will be starting with our inaugural function in 10 minutes time from now we will uh, take a short tea break we will request everybody to please kindly stay back it's an important function uh, the day thank you
Distinguished guests, respected speakers, esteemed faculty, and dear delegates, good evening. On behalf of the Department of Urology, Ames Jodhpur, and Jodhpur Urological Forum, it gives me immense pleasure to invite you all to the North Zone Midterm CUE being organized at Ames Jodhpur from 18th to 19th March 2023 under the aegis of the North Zone Urological Society of India. There have been demonstrations of live state-of-the-art surgeries, didactic lectures, and panel discussions by eminent faculty. Important and controversial topics have been discussed among eminent urologists, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists in a multimodal fashion. You must have already attended many of these events this morning, and there is much more to be looked forward to for tomorrow as well. I would like to begin the inaugural ceremony by calling on the stage our esteemed guest of honor, Professor Arvind Mathur, former principal and controller and head of department of medicine, SN Medical College, Jodhpur. The chief guest for this function, Professor Madhav Nankar, executive director, Ames Jodhpur, is unable to attend due to prior commitment. Next, I welcome Dr. M.K. Chhabra, Senior Professor Urology at SN Medical College, Jodhpur. Dr. Lalit Shah, President-Elect, Urological Society of India. Dr. Vijay Bora, President, North Zone Urological Society of India. Dr. Kamaljeet Singh, Secretary, North Zone Urological Society of India. Professor A.S. Sandhu, Organizing Chairperson. And Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary, Organizing Secretary. request Professor A.S. Sandhu to present a bouquet and safa to the guest of honor, Professor Arvind Mathur. I request Professor A.S. Sandhu to present a bouquet and safa to Dr. M.K. Chhabra, Senior Professor Urology at SN Medical College, Jodhpur. Thank 
Next, I request Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary to kindly present a bouquet and sapa to Dr. Lalit Shah, the President-elect USI. I request Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary to present a bouquet and sapa to Dr. Vijay Bora, the president, NZU side. I request Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary to present a bouquet and sapa to Dr. Kamaljeet Singh, the secretary, NZUSI. I now call upon Professor A.S. Santhu, Organizing Chairperson, North Zone Midterm CUE, to present the welcome address. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome all our esteemed guests to Jodhpur and express my sincere gratitude to each one of you for gracing this event with your presence. It is my pleasant duty to introduce the following dignitaries. The guest of honor, Professor Arvind Mathur, former principal and head of Department of Medicine at Dr. SNMC and MDM Hospital, Jodhpur. The chief guest for this inaugural function, Professor Madhava Nanda Kar, Executive Director, Ames, Jodhpur. Co-patron of this CUE, Dr. M.K. Chabla, Senior Professor of Urology at Dr. SN Medical College. The President-elect of USI, Dr. Lalit Shah. President of North Zone USI, Dr. Vijay Bora. Secretary North Zone USI, Dr. Kamaljeet Singh, Treasurer North Zone USI, Dr. Shailendra Goel, all my esteemed teachers, seniors, faculty and delegates. The famous historian Will Durant once said, and I quote, knowledge is the eye of desire and can become the pilot of the soul. On this note, I hope that this CUE and operative workshop will enhance our knowledge and understanding and ultimately translate to better patient care. The theme for the conference is Urothelial Carcinoma A to Z and over a period of one and a half days, we have endeavored to cover the entire spectrum from basic sciences to live operative sessions and palliative and hospice care. I hope the proceedings will be beneficial to all, especially my junior colleagues and residents. I take this opportunity to sincerely thank everyone in the organizing team for working tirelessly to make this program a reality. I would also like to th thank the representatives of trade for their wholehearted support for this event. The organizing team has put in all efforts to make your stay comfortable and I am sure you will enjoy the hospitality of our wonderful blue city. Thank you. May I request Dr. M.K. Chabla, co-patron, to say a few words. Thank you very much. I 
I call upon all the dignitaries on the stage. Kindly proceed. Respected Dr. Arvind Mathur sir and respected dais, esteemed present members who has come all the way from different places to attend this COE. I think the topic of the COE, the A to Z for urothelial carcinoma had been very challenging one and Dr. Gautam and <coughs> Dr. Sandhu, they have made everything clear about this topic and they have tried their best to make this CMA a very successful event. Uh, I, I would just try to tell you that Dr. Arvind Mathur Saab had been recently nominated as the uh, advisor to WHO for different protocols and I I thank them to come as uh, uh, chief guest and the person of the honor. And I am thankful to all the persons who have come all the way from different places to join this workshop and COE. Thank you. Thank you very much. dignitaries on the stage to kindly proceed towards lighting of the inaugural lamp. I now call upon Dr. Kamaljeet Singh, Secretary, NZUSI, to present the welcome address and introduce the theme of the workshop. Respected dignitaries in the dais, um, they are all big names, the respected eminent faculty members in the August gathering, and my dear friends. I bring greetings from City of Golden Temple to for all of you. This is the hat trick of events of the North Zone in the state of Rajasthan and AIMS Jodhpur, or what I will be calling the Team Jodhpur uh, in my incoming words, should be taken uh, for the Department of the Urology at AIMS Jodhpur. Jodhpur is popularly known as the Blue City or the Sun City in, this, in the state of Rajasthan. It is famous for its Mahangar Fort and for the spices. This is the third event under the banner, under the aegis of the North Zone Urological Society, 
We started in the September month in Goregon when we had a midterm CV on a genital urinary reconstruction at uh, SMS College, Jaipur. Then we had an annual meet of North Zone Urological Society at Bikanir. And this, uh, the third is the event which almost starts the academic activity for the year 2022 and 23. And Jodhpur was a perfect start for it. The enthusiasm of the team Jodhpur is, is really worth praising is and Dr. and the team Jodhpur has really uh, done a wonderful work. The theme of this workshop is the urothelial carcinoma A to Z. It is a 1.5 days event. On the day one, we started with the basic science uh, session early in the morning followed by an operative uh, session which was we see uh, the eminent faculty who had traveled across uh, the parts of the country to come and show their surgical skills. The deliberations done by the esteemed chairperson during the sessions were really knowledgeable and I'm dead sure that everybody must have learned a lot of things uh, during this uh, today's sessions and their knowledge must have been enriched. We also take this opportunity to invite all the members for our upcoming scientific meets uh, to be held under the edges uh, of, of the North Zone. Tomorrow will be the second part of the session. We will be discussing on the, the other aspects of the um, on the urothelial carcinoma, that is the muscle invasive and the rear, the prostatic urothelial carcinoma. And we will be culminating, the session will be finishing at around 12.30 and we will be starting with our belly decree function. Tomorrow also, uh, sorry, uh, I also take this opportunity to invite the trade uh, delegates for this meet. Uh, the, they have been the real, the financial powerhouse because of which these scientific meets are uh, possible for us because the, they help us to meet the logistics. In the end, I must welcome everybody, everybody who have left their clinical practices, taken leaves to come to all the way to, uh, to Jodhpur to attend this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now call upon Dr. Lalit Shah, President-Elect, NZUSI, to kindly say a few words. Very good evening, everyone. Respected teachers on the dais and off the dais, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to address you as a representative of Urology Society of India, our main society. And it's a matter of great pleasure and honor. And coming to Jodhpur is always a pleasure. Seeing the today's deliberations, today's activities, infrastructure, audiovisuals, the great teamwork, super personal hospitality, I personally feel that this center would do justice to much bigger conferences and wish them all the best for them. I wish you all of everyone a warm welcome and, and pleasant stay and great learning and sharing experience here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I now call upon Dr. Vijay Bora, President, NZUSI, to address the audience. Good evening, everyone. Uh, respected dignitaries of the dais, chief guest and guest of honor, uh, Dr. Arvind Mathur, Dr. Chawra, President-elect of USI, Dr. Lalit Shah, Dr. Kamalji, Secretary of North Zone, Dr. Sandhu, and Dr. Gautam. So, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate Dr. Gautam and his team for organizing our first midterm in, uh, <clears throat> of North Zone USI. And, and I'm happy to share that almost more than 200 delegates are registered with us and all topics of urothelial cancers are very really well covered by the eminent faculties, which is in fact very informative to our younger colleagues and residents. 
Nevertheless, the untiring and enthusiastic effort of Dr. Kamalji, our Dynamics North Zone Secretary, which made the event a successful one. And I am thankful to uh, all the faculty and the delegates who came all the way from different part of country and made this event even bigger what we expected. We should not uh, forget the backbone of uh, any CME or any conference in form of audiovisual, in form of trade participation and residents working day and night and many more things. I am also thankful to them. Lastly, I finish uh, by saying for Dr. Gautam and his team, Jati jajba raha to mushkilon ka hal bhi niklega, jabhi banjar hui vahi se jal niklega, na mayus na ghavra adhiron se mere saathi, इन्हीं रातों के दामन से सुनहरा कल निकलेगा। Thank you very much. Thank you. Long live India, USA, and long live USA. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now call upon Dr. Arvind Mathur, Professor and Head, Department of Medicine, SNMC Jodhpur, to kindly address the audience. It's indeed my privilege and pleasure to be with all the eminent urologists in this important midterm workshop. Dr. Lalit Shah, President USI, Dr. Vijay Bora, President North June USI, Dr. Kamaljit Singh, Secretary, and Dr. Chabra and Professor Sandhu and Dr. Gautam and distinguished guests, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. I am probably the uh, non-neurologist amongst you all today and I am the beneficiary of whatever you all do, basically. I have been practicing medicine and particularly the we look after the older adults in geriatrics and we find that the support of urologists has a very important component for all of, our, all of the care which we provide to the older people. The way this workshop has been carried out and which has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Sandhu and Dr. Kamaljeet, and this has brought a new height to this place itself, I would say. I've seen the growth of urology in Jodhpur starting in the 80s when we started as in a, a uh, urology as in a component of surgery department over here which grew up gradually at SN Medical College to offer postdoctoral courses. And with the addition of Ames Jodhpur, it is, appears a drum, dream come true for us. We could never imagine that we have, will have a state-of-art establishment of urological setup, particularly all advanced surgery being undertaken at Jodhpur. And I congratulate the team of urology and, of course, thank the Ames Jodhpur for having arranged all this. Such meetings, they are always uh, it's, it's, uh, they give us an opportunity to interact and learn and I'm happy that with the sessions which have been undertaken since morning, everybody has found them quite useful. I wish all the success to the workshop and thank the organizing team, the organizing chairman, Dr. Sandhu, organizing secretary, Dr. Gautam, and all the North Zone USI bearers for having this event over here. I wish all the best to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Our chief guest for this function, Professor Madhav Nandkar, Executive Director, Ames Jokpur, is unable to attend today's function in person. However, he shall be joining us live to deliver his message.
I request sir to unmute from his side. Yeah, am, I, am I visible and audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Professor Mathur, Arvind Mathur. First, I congratulate you for the nomination for the WHO. Professor Chabra, they my co patron. Dr. Lalit Shah, President USI. Dr. Kamal Deet Singh, Honorary Secretary, North General Neurological Society of India. Dr. Vijay Bora, President of North General Neurological Society of India. Dr. Arjun Singh Sandhu, our head of the department neurology, AMC Jodhpur, and Dr. Gautam Chaudhuri, the organizing secretary. But I am I am sorry I am, that I could not stay there because of my prior commitments. But as a young person, I was always interested to attend such type of oncosurgical workshops related to either urology or any organ of the body. Yes, I feel fortunate that still I can communicate with technological advancement by uh, online method. I welcome all and I congratulate Dr. Sando to organize such a conference or workshop with the department and with the urological forum of Jodhpur. I heard that a lot of deliberate already been done, but when you come to the urothelial malignancy in to J, means that is that will cover everything and implement everyone. That is like any oncological thing, multimodal approach with a multi-dimensional approach involving multi-professional means multi-department like medical oncology, radiation oncology, urologist. Yes, I'm very happy that definitely all the controversies what you discussed are the new developments and how we can envision future malignancy in the urinary bladder treatment. Like any oncology, when any forum I told that that is the future for research like oncology. Because this is so fast and with the whole body, like the same way urology and urothelial like urinary bladders, such a controversial issue, still people register to do radical cystectomy. And yes, that is also need of the hour when such developments are going on, like extensive surgical approach means bigger the incision, bigger the result as era come to minimal invasive surgery. Simultaneously, basic science development, how we will start targeting the treatment, depending on after genomic project and coming the molecular diagnostics and therapeutic, molecular therapeutics, like a target therapies and most recently, that is the precision therapy. All these things, if you will not update time to time, we are outdated. And this type of institute, this type of forums, and what Dr. Mathur also told, regularly we have to do, and this effort by Dr. Sandhu and Dr. Gautam, and by that Jodhpur Urological Forum, and supported by this North Zona Urological Society of India, help everyone. And I think that panel discussion, keeping the controversies, these are things which the most important thing in oncology to discuss. Involving the particular medicine, another part, like hardly talking every oncological forum, time is coming, that all the, uh, like that is periodical tables, all materials will be used in future, if you see it, like static now, but we are thinking in curable bone metastasis. Now this is necromancy polonium, though initially it is expensive, Initially, she started with distonsium, now they are using polonium, now coming into newer therapies. All this will be utilized as nuclear medicine, what it was unknown for us in our MBPS days, now in a major branch for in the therapeutics. That's why this type of workshop is much needed to update everyone and also is 
address the controversies and also update uh, ourselves also. I congratulate Dr. Sandhu and Dr. Gautam and all the best for the next meetings and already it started and all the best and welcome you all to Jodhpur, already Gautam, Dr. Sabra, everyone addressed. My best wishes with this conference and Dr. Sandhu and Dr. Gautam, all the best and congratulations everyone to carry out this conference. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your words of encouragement. I now request Professor A.S. Sandhu to present a memento with a guest of honor, Professor Arvind Mathur, as a token of our appreciation. Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary to present a memento to Professor M.K. Chhabra as a token of our appreciation. Professor A.S. Sandhu to present a memento to Dr. Lalit Shah, the President-elect, USI, as a token of our appreciation. <laughs> I request Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary to present a memento to Dr. Vijay Bora, President, NZUSI, as a token of our appreciation. I request Professor A.S. Sandhu to present a memento to Dr. Kamaljeet Singh, Secretary, NZUSI, as a token of our appreciation. To conclude the ceremony, I now call upon Dr. Gautam Ram Chaudhary, Organizing Secretary, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening everyone. Thank you for the attending of first day. It was houseful and nice surgeries were demonstrated. For that involvement of all urologists coming across the country and other than the urologist, pathologist, nuclear medicine physician, radio diagnosis colleague and medical oncologist and radiation oncologist. So it was full, you know, whole uh, set of the doctors who involved in the urothelial carcinoma. So thank you once again, everyone. And for that force behind who was working was our team from the Ashen Medical College, from AIMS and those who are practicing in Jodhpur. And the resident team's effort and their contribution was immense that make the day successful. I know the day was long but and tidy, but I feel it was enriching. Uh, and updated your knowledge and skills and that will be helpful in delivering good clinical care to our patients. The best is yet to come. I would like to request the pleasure of your company for the banquet dinner at Hotel Lake View, Kailana Road, 8 p.m. onward. That is, uh, location has been shared in the WhatsApp group. And I want to uh, request two, you know, reminder for guests. One is 
hotel, uh, buses and the cars are available at the both hotels. So please, uh, you know, uh, follow that. And second is the academic program for the day two will start sub 8 a.m. here in auditorium. And those guests who are uh, having flights in the morning and in afternoon, please check out hotels in morning and uh, bring their luggage here. We have club room facility for the safe keeping your luggage. Uh, thanks once again and I invite you all for joining the banquet dinner. Thank you everyone. Thank you uh, our director sir for coming online. Uh, you know I can understand that we would love to have you here, uh, here physically but uh, you could make it possible like physical. Thanks again. Thank you very much sir. Okay. Thank you. Let me conclude. I now request everyone to kindly stand up for the national anthem.